Chapter One of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To volunteer or for more information, contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Rollins in Augusta, Georgia. Chapter One Into the Infinite Long Ago. Jefferson Worth's outfit of four mules and a big wagon pulled out of San Felipe at daybreak, headed for Rubio City. From the swinging red tassels on the bridles of the leaders to the galvanized iron water bucket dangling from the tail of the reach back of the rear angle, the outfit wore an unmistakable air of prosperity. The wagon was loaded only with a well-stocked grub box, the few necessary camp cooking utensils, blankets, and canvas tarpaulin, with rolled barley and bales of hay for the team, and two water barrels, empty. Hanging by its canvas strap from the spring of the driver's seat was a large, cloth-covered canteen. Behind the driver there was another seat of the same wide, comfortable type, but the man who held the reins was apparently alone. Jefferson Worth was not with his outfit. By sending the heavy wagon on ahead and following later with a faster team and a light buckboard, Mr. Worth could join his outfit in camp that night, saving thus at least another half day for business in San Felipe. Jefferson Worth, as he himself would have put it, figured on the value of time. Indeed, Jefferson Worth figured on the value of nearly everything. Now, San Felipe, you must know, is where the big ships come in and the air tingles with the electricity of commerce as men from all lands, driven by the master passion of humankind, good business, seek each his own. But Rubio City, though born of that same master passion of the race, is where the thin edge of civilization is thinnest, on the Colorado River, miles beyond the Coast Range Mountains, on the farther side of that dreadful land where the thirsty atmosphere is charged with the awful silence of uncounted ages. Between these two scenes of man's activity, so different and yet so like, and crossing thus the land of my story, there was only a rude trail, two hundred and more hard and lonely miles of it, the only mark of man in all that desolate waste, and itself marked every mile by the graves of men and by the bleached bones of their cattle. All that forenoon, on every side of the outfit, the beautiful life of the coast country throbbed and exalted. It called from the heaving ocean with its many gleaming sails and dark drifting steamer smoke under the wide sky. It sang from the harbor where the laden ships meet the long trains that come and go on their continental errands. It cried loudly from the busy streets of village and town and laughed out from field and orchard. But always the road led toward those mountains that lifted their oak-clad shoulders and pine-fringed ridges across the way, as though in dark and solemn warning to any who should dare to set their faces toward the dreadful land of want and death that lay on their other side. In the afternoon every mile brought scenes more lonely until in the foothills that creeping bit of life on the hard old trail was forgotten by the busy world behind, even as it seemed to forget that there was anywhere any life other than its creeping self. As the sweating mules pulled strongly up the heavy grades, the man on the high seat of the wagon repaid the indifference of his surroundings with a like indifference. Unmoved by the unbidding grimness of the mountains, unthoughtful of their solemn warning, he took his place as much a part of the lonely scene 
as the hills themselves. Slouching easily in his seat, he gave heed only to his team and to the road ahead. When he spoke to the mules, his voice was a soft, good-natured drawl, as though he spoke from out a pleasing reverie, and though his words were often hard words, they were carried to the animals on an undercurrent of fellowship and understanding. The long whip with coiled lash was in its socket at the end of the seat. The stops were frequent. Wise in the wisdom of the unfenced country, and knowing the land ahead, this driver would conserve every ounce of his team's strength against a possible time of great need. They were creeping across a flank of the hill, when the off-leader sprang to the left so violently that nothing but the instinctive bracing of his trace-mate held them from going over the grade. The same instant, the wheel-team repeated the maneuver, but not so quickly, as the slouching figure on the seat sprang into action. A quick, strong pull on the reins, a sharp yell, You buck! Molly! and a rattling volley of strong talk swung the four back into the narrow road before the front wheels were out of the track. With a crash, the heavy brake was set. The team stopped. As the driver half rose and turned to look back, he slipped the reins to his left hand, and his right dropped to his hip. With a motion too quick for the eye to follow, the free arm straightened and the mountain echoed wildly to the loud report of a forty-five. By the side of the road in the rear of the wagon, a rattlesnake uncoiled its length and writhed slowly in the dust. Before the echoes of the shot had died away, a mad, inarticulate roar came from the depths of the wagon box. The roar was followed by a thick stream of oaths in an unmistakably Irish voice. The driver, who was slipping a fresh cartridge into the cylinder, looked up to see a man grasping the back of the rear seat for support while rising unsteadily to his feet. The Irishman, as he stood glaring fiercely at the man who had so rudely awakened him, was without hat or coat and with bits of hay clinging to a soiled shirt that was unbuttoned at the hairy throat, presented a remarkable figure. His heavy body was fitted with legs like posts. His wide shoulders and deep chest with arms to match his legs were so huge as to appear almost grotesque. His round head, with its tumbled thatch of sandy hair, was set on a thick bull neck while all over the big bones of him the hard muscles lay in visible knots and bunches. The unsteady poise, the red, unshaven, sweating face, and the angry, bloodshot eyes reveal the reason for his sleep under such uncomfortable circumstances. The silent driver gazed at his fearsome passenger with calm eyes that seemed to hold in their dark depths the mystery of many a still night under the still stars. In a voice that rumbled up from his hairy chest, a husky, menacing growl, the Irishman demanded, What the hell do you mean, disturbing the peace with your clamor? For less than a supper weather, I'd go over you with me two hands. Calmly, the other dropped his gun into its holster. Pointing to the canteen that hung over the side of the wagon, Fastened by its canvas strap to the seat spring, he drawled softly, There's the water. Help yourself, stranger. The gladiator, without a word, reached for the canteen, and with huge hairy paws lifted it to his lips. After a draft of prodigious length, he heaved a long sigh and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Then he turned his fierce eyes again on the driver, as if to inquire what manner of person he might be who had so unceremoniously challenged his threat. The Irishman saw a man tall and spare, 
but of a stringy, tough, and supple leanness that gave him the look of being fashioned by the out-of-doors. He, too, was coatless, but wore a vest unbuttoned over a loose, coarse shirt. A red bandana was knotted easily about his throat. With his wide, high-crowned hat, rough trousers tucked in long boots, laced leather wrist guards and the loosely buckled cartridge belt with its long forty-five his very dress expressed the easy freedom of the wild lands while the dark thin face accented by jet black hair and a long straight moustache had the look of the wide sunburned plains with a grunt that might have expressed either approval or contempt the Irishman turned and, groping about in the wagon, found a sorry wreck of a hat. Again he stooped, and this time, from between the bales of hay, lifted a coat, fit companion to the hat. Carefully he felt through pocket after pocket. His search was rewarded by a short-stemmed clay pipe and the half of a match, nothing more. With an effort he explored the pockets of his trousers. Then again he searched the coat, muttering to himself broken sentences, not the less expressive because incomplete. Where the devil? Now don't that beat? Well, I'll be. With a temper not improved by his loss, he threw down the garment in disgust and looked up angrily. The silent driver was holding toward him a sack of tobacco. The Irishman, with another grunt, crawled under the empty seat and, climbing heavily over the back of the seat in front, planted himself solidly by the driver's side. Filling his pipe with care and deliberation, he returned the sack to its owner and struck the half-match along one post-like leg. Shielding the tiny flame with his hands before applying the light, he remarked thoughtfully, a darn ruthless fool to be so disturbing me on his sleep by explodin' that cannon you carry. Tis on me mind to discipline ye for such outrageous conduct. The last word was followed by loud smacking puffs as he started the fire in the pipe bowl under his nose. While the Irishman was again uttering his threat, the driver, with a skillful twist, rolled a cigarette and, leaning forward just in the nick of time, he deliberately shared the half-match with his blustering companion. In that instant the blue eyes above the pipe looked straight into the black eyes above the cigarette, and a faint twinkle of approval met a serious glance of understanding. Gathering up his reins and sorting them carefully, the driver spoke to his team. You, Buck, Molly, Jack, Pete. The mules heaved ahead. Again the silence of the world-old hills was shattered by the rattling rumble of the heavy-tired wagon and the ring and clatter of iron-shod hoofs. Stolidly the Irishman pulled at the short-stemmed pipe, the wagon seat sagging heavily with his weight at every jolt of the wheels, while under his tattered hat-rim his fierce eyes looked out upon the wild landscape with occasional side-glances at his silent indifferent companion. Again the team was halted for rest on the heavy grade. Long and carefully the Irishman looked about him, and then, turning suddenly upon the still silent driver, he gazed at him for a full minute before saying with elaborate mock formality, It may be, sir, that being you're such a hell of a conversationalist, it wouldn't tax your vocal powers beyond their strength, if I should be so bold as to ask you, what the devil place is this? The soft, slow drawl of the other answered, Sure, that there is no man's mountains ahead. No man's, is it? And it looks that same. Where did you say you was trying to go? We're headed for Rubio City. This year's the old San Felipe Trail. Uh-huh. So we're going to Rubio City, are we? For all I know, that may as well be nowhere at all. Well, well, it's news of interest to me. We're going to Rubio City, 
and maybe that you would explain, sir, how I come to be here at all. Sure, Mike, you came in this year wagon from San Felipe. At the drawling answer the hot blood flamed in the face of the short-tempered Irishman, and the veins in his thick neck stood out as if they would burst. "'Me name's not Mike at all, but Patrick Mooney,' he roared. "'I've got two good eyes in me head that can see a dang old wagon for meself, and for what's more I've got two good hands that can break ye in bits for the impudent dried herring that ye are. Now thinking you can take me anywhere at all, be abducting me without me consent.' For a supper, whether I'd go to ye. He turned quickly to look behind him, for the driver was calmly pointing toward the end of the seat. What's there? he demanded. The water, drawled the dark-faced man. I don't reckon you drunk it all the other time. Again the big man lifted the canteen and drank long and deep. When he had wiped his mouth with the back of his hairy hand and had returned the canteen to its place, he faced his companion, his blue eyes twinkling with positive approval. Scratching his head meditatively, he said, "'And all because of me wanting to enjoy the blessings and advantages of civilization again after three long months in that dang graden camp, as is the right of every healthy man with his pay in his pocket.' The teamster laughed softly. You were sure enjoying of it a plenty. The other looked at him with quickened interest. Ye was there? he asked. Some, was the laconic reply. The Irishman scratched his head again with a puzzled air. I disremember entire. Was there some trouble, maybe? The other grinned. Things was moving a few. Patrick Mooney nodded his head. Uh-huh. Mostly they do under them circumstances. Of course there'll be a policeman, or maybe two. Five, said the man with the lines gently. Five? Holy mother! I did myself proud. And did they have the wagon? Sure they would. Five policemen never walked. When I'm them right, and I'm was handy-like, but five? Never. Tell me, man, who else was in the party? No, hold on a minute, he interrupted himself. Them cops stimulated my memory a bit. Was there not a bunch of sailormen from one of them big ships? The driver nodded. The other, pleased with the success of his mental effort, continued. Uh-huh, and I was having a peaceful drink with them. Oh, when someone made impudent remarks touching me appearance, or ancestors, I disremember which. But where was you? Well, you see, explained the driver in his slow way, it was like this, that their saloon were plumb full of sailor men all excepting you and me. I was a heap admiring of the way you handled that big hombre what opened the meeting, and also his two partners who aimed to back his play. It was sure pretty work. The rest of the crowd sort of bunched in one end of the room, and when you began addressing the congregation, so to speak, on the habits, character, customs, and breeding of sailor men in general, and the present company in particular, I see right there you was a biting off more than you could chow. It wasn't no way reasonable that any human could handle that whole outfit with only just his bare hands. So I edged over your way, plumb edified by your remarks, and when the rush for the mourner's bench come, I unlimbered and headed the stampede pronto. Then I made my little proposition. I told him, being the only individual on the premises, not a sailor man, nor an Irishman, I felt it my duty to referee the obsquisies, so to speak, and that odds of twenty to one, not to mention knives, was strictly again my convictions. Moreover, being the sole and only uninterested audience, I had rights. Then I offers to bet my pile even money that you could handle the whole bunch, taking em two at a throw. I knowed it were some odds, but I noticed that them three what opened the meeting was still under the influence. 
Also, I undertook to see that specifications was faithfully fulfilled. Mither a God, what a sociable, broke in the Irishman. And me too drunk to remember rightly. Did they take you a bit, ye sunburned lip of the devil? Did they take it? They sure did, drawled the driver. I had my gun on them all the time. Hello, and did I do it? Tell me quick, did I do it? Sure I could answer if nothing happened. You laid your first pair on the top of the three, then the police called the game and the bets were off. They pinched the house? They took you and me. Sure, of course they would take us too. Tis them San Felipe police knows their duty. But how could they do it? I forget details right here, being temporarily incapacitated by one of them hitting me with a club from behind. I woke up in a cell with you. The Irishman rubbed the back of his head. Come to think of it, I have a bit of a bump on me own noodle, and tis like helps to explain the cell. But what in the devil's name brings us here in this godforsaken nobody's place? Pass me another pipe full and tell me if you can. The driver passed over the tobacco sack and, stopping his team for another rest, rolled a cigarette for himself. That's easy, he said. This year is Jefferson Worth's outfit. He wanted me to start home this morning, so he got me off. I don't know how he done it. Mostly nobody knows how Jefferson Worth does things. There was a man with him who knowed you, and as I was some disinclined to leave you under the circumstances, Mr. Worth fixed it up for you, too. Then we all just throwed in and fetched you along. Mr. Worth with the other man and his kid are coming on in a buckboard. They'll catch up with us where we camp tonight. I don't mind saying that I pum admired your spirit and action, sizing up that police bunch. I could see your talents would sure be wasted in that San Felipe country for some time to come. There'll be plenty of room in Rubio City for you, leastwise till you draw your pay again. If you don't like the accommodations you're getting, I reckon you'd better make good your talk back there, and we'll see whether you takes this outfit back to San Felipe or I takes her on to Rubio City. The Irishman spat emphatically over the wheel. And tis a gentleman with proper instincts you are, though as a rule I hold it impolite to carry a gun. But after all, tis a matter of opinion, and I'm free to admit that there are occasions. Anyhow, you handle it with grace and intelligence. And fists and sticks and knives and guns, that's the thing that marks a man. Tis not Patrick Mooney that'll fault a gentleman for ways he can't help, owing to his improper bringing up. And if you don't mind, will you tell me what they call you? I'll not be so indelicate as to ask your name. For what do they call you'll be enough. The other laughed. My name is Joe Brannan. They call me Texas Joe. Tex for short. Good me boy, Tex. You look the devil a lot like a red herring, but that's not such a bad fish. And you have the right flavor. How could ye help it? Brandon and Texas is handles to pull a man through hell with. But tell me this. Who is this man that says he knows me? Texas Joe shook his head and, picking out his lines, called to his team. When they were underway again, he said, I didn't hear his name, but I judge from the talk that he's one of them civil engineers and that he's heading for Rubio City to build a railroad that's going through to the coast. Mr. Worth told me that there would be another man and a kid to go back with us, but I know that Mr. Worth had not never seen them before himself. Pat shifted his heavy bulk to face the driver and, removing his pipe from his mouth, asked with deliberation, And do you mean to tell me that this place we're going to is on the new line of the Southwestern and Continental? Sure, they're building into Rubio City from the east now. The Irishman became excited. And this man that knows me, this engineer... Is he a fine, big, upstanding man with brown eyes and the look of a king? I ain't never seen no kings, drawled Tex. 
but the rest of it sure fits him. Well, what do you think of that? Tis the seer himself, or I'm not the son of me own mother. I was hearing in Frisco, where I went the last time I drawed me pay, that he was like to be on the S and C extension. Twas that took me to San Felipe, being wishful to get a job with him again. Well, well, and to think of the seer himself. What's that you call him? The seer. I disremember his other name, but he's got one all straight and proper. He's that kind. They call him the seer because of his talk and the great things that we'll be doing in this country and have no rain at all when ignorant savages like yourself learn how to use the water that's in the rivers for irrigation. I heard him say so myself, that hundreds and thousands of acres in these big deserts will be turned into farms, and all that will be what he calls reclamation. Twas for that some dang yellow-legged surveyor give him the name, and it stuck. But most of the engineers, real engineers, do you mind, is with him, though they do be joking him the devil a lot about what they calls his visions. He didn't look like he was locoed, said Texas Joe thoughtfully, but he's sure some off on that there desert proposition, as you'll see before we lands in Rubio. I don't know, I've seen some queer things in me time in the way of big jobs that nobody thought could be done at all. But have you go. Tis not the likes of you and me that's qualified to give judgment on such geniuses as the seer, who I heard tell has the right to put more big name in letters after his name than you have teeth in your head. All the same, it ain't the brand on a horse that makes him travel. A man'll sure need something more hefty than letters after his name when he goes up against the desert. Well, have you go at that. Well, you know him. But for what this you telling me about a kid? The seer has no family at all but himself and his job. Texas grinned. Maybe not, pard, but he's sure got together part of a family this trip. Is it a girl or a boy? Boy? About a ten-year-old, I'd say. The Irishman shook his head doubtfully. I don't know. Tis a queer thing for the seer. If it was me or you now, but the seer, it's dang queer. But tell me, for what this man's your boss? Tis a good healthy pull he must have to be separating us for them San Felipe police. Texas Joe deliberated so long before answering this that Pat glanced at him uneasily several times. At last the driver drawled, You're right there. Jefferson Worth sure has some pull. Pat grunted. But for what does he do? Do? Tex spun his team around a spur of the mountain where the trail leads along the side of a canyon to its head. Far below they heard the tumbling roar of a stream in its rocky course. Sure, the man must do something. As near as I can make out, Jefferson Worth does everybody. Oh, ho, so that's it. I've no care for the cards myself, but if a man's professional and you're off there, partner, Jefferson Worth ain't that kind. He's one of these here financiering sports, and so far as anybody that I've ever seen goes, he's got a dead cinch. You mean he's a banker? Sure, a pioneer in Rubio City. He started the game in the early days and has been a-rolling it up ever since. It's plumb curious about this year, financier in business, continued Tex in his slow, meditative way. It looks to me mostly just plain, common hold-up, only they do it with money instead of a gun. In the old days, you used to get the drop on your man with your six, all regular, and take what he happened to have in his clothes. Then the posse would get after you and maybe string you up, which was all right, being part of the game. Now these fellows, like Jefferson Worth, they get your name on some writing, and when you ain't looking, they slips up and gets away with all your worldly possessions. And the sheriff, he just laughs and says it's good business. This year Worth man is just about the coolest, smoothest, hardest proposition in the game. 
he fair makes my back hair rise. The common run of people ain't got no more show stacking up against Jefferson Worth than two bits worth of ice has in the hill. According to my notion, it's this year's same fin at Surin game that's a ruin in the West. The cattle range is about all gone now. If they keeps it up, we won't be no better off here than some of them places I've heard about back east. "'Tis a dang ignorant savage yard, like the rest of your tribe. Would you talk a run in the West? For what would this country be without money? "'Tis them same financiers that have brung ye the railroads and the cities and the schools and the churches and all the other blessings and joys of civilization that you've got to take, whether you likes it or not. Look at the seer now. For what could a man like him, an engineer, mind you, for what would the seer do without the men with money to back him? The Irishman's words were answered by a cheerful whoa and a crash of the brakes as Texas Joe brought the team to a stand near the spring at the head of the canyon. We camp here, he announced. This is the last water we strike until we make it over the pass to Mountain Springs on the desert side. Jefferson Worth will be along with the seer and his kid most any time now. A little before dusk, the banker, with his two companions, arrived. Hello, Pat, the man who leaped from the buckboard and strode toward the waiting Irishman, was tall and broad, with the head and chin of a soldier and the brown eyes of a dreamer. He was dressed in rough corduroys, blue flannel shirt, laced boots and Stetson, and he greeted the burly Irishman as a fellow laborer. A joyful grin swept over the battered features of the gladiator as he grasped the seer's outstretched hand. Well, dang me, but I'm glad to see you, sir, in this devil's own land. I had me natural doubts, of course, when I woke up in the wagon, but it's all right. Tis proud I am to be abducted by you, sir. <laughs> abducted? The engineer's laugh awoke the echoes in the canyon. It was a rescue, man. Well, well, let go at that. But tell me, sir, he lowered his voice in a confidential rumble. For what's this I hear that you have your boy with you? Sure, I never knew that ye was a man of family. He looked toward the slender lad who, with the readiness of a grown man, was helping the driver of the buckboard to unhitch his team of four Broncos. "'Tis a good lad he is, or I'm a Dutchman." "'You're right, Pat. Abe is a good boy,' the seer answered gravely. "'I picked him up in a mining camp on the edge of the Mojave Desert when I was running a line of preliminary surveys through that country for the S and C last year. He was born in the camp, and his mother died when he was a baby. God knows how he pulled through. You know what these mining places are. His father, Frank Lee, was killed in a drunken row while I was there. And Abe showed so much cool nerve and downright manliness that I offered him a place with my party. He has been with me ever since. Pat's voice was husky as he said, I ask your pardon, sir, for me blundering impotence about you being a man of family. I'm a danged old roughneck with no education but me two fists and no manners at all. The engineer's reply was prevented by the approach of Jefferson Worth, who had been talking with Texas Joe. The banker's head came but little above the seer's shoulders, and in comparison with the Irishman's heavy bulk, he appeared almost insignificant, while his plain business suit of gray seemed almost out of place in the wild surroundings. His smooth-shaven face was an expressionless gray mask, and his deep-set gray eyes turned from the Irishman to the engineer without a hint of emotion. The two men felt that somewhere behind that gray mask they were being carefully estimated, measured, valued, as possible factors in some far-reaching plan. He spoke to the seer, and his voice was without a suggestion of color. I see that your friend has recovered. It was as though he had stated a fact that he had just verified. 
Laughing at the memory of the Irishman's San Felipe experience, the engineer said, Mr. Worth, permit me to introduce Mr. Patrick Mooney, whom I've known for years as the best boss of a grading gang in the West. Pat, this is Mr. Jefferson Worth, president of the Pioneer Bank in Rubio City. The Irishman clutched at his tattered hat brim in embarrassed acknowledgment of the seer's formality. Jefferson Worth, from behind his gray mask, said in his exact colorless voice, he looks as though he ought to handle men. As the banker passed on toward the big wagon, the Irishman drew close to the seer and whispered hoarsely, Now for what the hell kind of a man is that? Tis the truth, sir, that when he looked at me out of that graveyard face, I could bear keep from crossing myself. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Two Jefferson Worth's Offering. When day broke over the topmost ridges of No Man's Mountains, Jefferson Worth's outfit was ready to move. The driver of the lighter rig with its four broncos set out for San Felipe. On the front seat of the big wagon, Texas Joe picked up his reins, sorted them carefully, and glanced over his shoulder at his employer. All set? Go ahead. You, Buck, Molly, the lead mules straightened their traces. Jack, Pete! As the brake was released with a clash and rattle of iron rods, the wheelers threw their weight into their collars, and the wagon moved ahead. Grim, tireless, world-old sentinels, no man's mountains stood guard between the fertile land on their seaward side and the desolate, forgotten waste of the east. They said to the country of green life, of progress and growth and civilization that marched to their line on the west, halt, and it stopped. To the land of lean want, of gray death, of gaunt hunger and torturing thirst that crept to their feet on the other side, stop, and it came no farther. With no land to till, no mineral to dig, their very poverty was their protection. With an air of grim finality, they declared strongly that as they had always been, they would always remain. And at the beginning of my story, save for that one slender man-made trail, their hoary boast had remained unchallenged. Steadily, but with frequent rests on the grades, Jefferson Worth's outfit climbed toward the summit, and a little before noon, gained the pass. The loud, rattling rumble of the wagon as the tires bumped and ground over the stony, rock-floored way, with the sharp ring and clatter of the iron-shod hoofs of the team, echoed, echoed, and echoed again. Loudly, wildly, the rude sounds assaulted the stillness until the quiet seemed hopelessly shattered by the din. Softly, tamely, the sounds drifted away in the clear distance. Through groves of live oak, thickets of greasewood, juniper, manzanita, and sage, into canyon and wash, from bluff and ledge, along slope and spur and shoulder, over ridge and saddle and peak, fainting, dying, the impotent sounds of man's passing sank into the stillness and were lost. When the team halted for a brief rest, it was in a moment as if the silence had never been broken. Grim, awful, the hills gave no signs of man's presence, gave that creeping bit of life no heed. 
At Melton Spring, a lovely little pool on the desert side of the huge wall, they stopped for dinner. When the meal was over, Texas Joe, with the assistance of Pat, filled the water barrels, while the boy busied himself with the canteen, and the seer and Jefferson Worth looked on. "'Tis a dry country ahead, I'm thinking," remarked the Irishman inquiringly as he lifted another dripping bucket. "'Some,' returned Tex. "'There are three water holes between here and the river where there's water sometimes. Mostly, though, when you need it worst, there ain't none there, and I reckon a dry water hole's about the most discouraging proposition there is. They'll all be dry this trip. There wasn't nothing but mud at Wolf Wells when we came through last week. Again, the barren rocks and the grim forbidding hills echoed the loud sound of wheel and hoof. Down the steep flank of the mountain, with screaming, grinding brakes, they thundered and clattered into the narrow hallway of Devil's Canyon with its sheer walls and shadowy gloom. The little stream that trickled down from the tiny spot of green at the spring tried bravely to follow, but soon sank exhausted into the dry waste. A cool wind, like a draft through a tunnel, was in their faces. After perhaps two hours of this, the way widened out. The sides of the canyon grew lower, with now and then gaps and breaks. Then the walls gave way to low, rounded hills, through which the winding trail lay, a bed of sand and gravel, and here and there appeared clumps of greasewood and cacti of several varieties. At length they passed out from between the last of the foothills, and suddenly, as though a mighty curtain were lifted, they faced the desert. At their feet, the mesa lay in a blaze of white sunlight, and beyond and below the edge of the bench the vast King's Basin country. At the edge of the mesa, Texas halted his team, and the little party looked out and away over those awful reaches of desolate solitude. The seer and Pat uttered involuntary exclamations. Jefferson Worth Texas and Abe were silent, but the boy's thin features were aglow with eager enthusiasm, and the face of the driver revealed an interest in the scene that years of familiarity could not entirely deaden, but the gray mask of the banker betrayed no emotion. In that view of such magnitude that miles meant nothing, there was not a sign of man save the one slender thread of road that was so soon lost in the distance. From horizon to horizon, so far that the eye ached in the effort to comprehend it, there was no cloud to cast a shadow, and the deep sky poured its resistless flood of light upon the vast dun plain with savage fury, as if to beat into helplessness any living creature that might chance to be caught thereon. And the desert, receiving that flood from the wide, hot sky, mysteriously wove with it soft scarfs of lilac, misty veils of purple and filmy curtains of rose and pearl and gold, strangely formed with it wide lakes of blue, rimmed with phantom hills of red and violet, constantly changing, shifting, scene on scene, as dream pictures shift and change. Only the strange, silent life that through long years the desert had taught to endure its hardships was there. The lizard, horned toad, lean jackrabbit, gaunt coyote, and their kind. Only the hard growth that the ages had evolved dotted the floors of the basin in the near distance the salt bush and greasewood, with here and there clumps of mesquite. And over it all, over the strange hard life, the weird constantly shifting scenes, the wondrous ever-changing colors, 
was the dominant, insistent, compelling spirit of the land, a brooding, dreadful silence, a waiting, 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 a mystic call that was at once a threat and a promise, a still drawing of the line across which no man might go and live save those master men who should win the right. After a while, the engineer, pointing, said, The line of the southwestern and continental must follow the base of those hills away over there. Is that right, Texas? It'll be about it, the driver answered. I hear you're going through San Antonio Pass, and that's to the north. Rubio City lies about here, he pointed a little south of east our road runs through them sand hills that you can see shining like gold way over there dry river crossing is just beyond you can see lone mountain off here to the south it'll sure be some warm down there look at them dust devils dancing and over there where you see that yellow mist like is a big sandstorm we ain't likely to get a long one this time of the year but you can't tell what this old desert'll do. She's sure some uncertain. La Palma de la Mano de Dios, the engines call it. And I always thought that, all things considered, the name fits mighty close. You can see it's just a great big basin. The hollow of God's hand, repeated the seer in a low tone. He lifted his hat with an unconscious gesture of reverence. The Irishman, as the engineer translated, crossed himself. The only mutter, for what's a name? Jefferson Worth spoke. Drive on, Texas. And so, with the yellow dust devils dancing along their road, and that yellow cloud in the distance, they moved down the slope, down into the King's Basin, into La Palma de la Mano de Dios. THE HOLLOW OF GOD'S HAND. "'Is that true, sir?' asked Abe of the seer. "'Is what true, son?' "'What Texas said about the ocean.' "'Yes, it's true. "'The lowest point of this basin is nearly three hundred feet below sea level. "'The railroad we're going to build follows right around the rim on the other side over there. "'This slope that we're going down now is the ancient beach. Then, while they pushed on into the silence and the heat of that dreadful land, the engineer told the boy and his companions how the ages had wrought with river and wave and sun and wind to make the King's Basin desert. Wolf Wells, they found dry as Texas had anticipated. Phantom Lake also was dry. Occasionally they crossed dry, ancient watercourses made by the river when the land was being formed. Sometimes there were glassy, hard, bare alkali flats. Again the trail led through jungle-like patches of desert growth or twisted and wound between high hummocks. Always there was the wide, hot sky the glaring flood of light unbroken by shadow masses to relieve the eye and reflected hotly from the sandy floor of the old seabed. That evening, when they made camp, a heavy mass of clouds hung over the top of no man's mountains and the long coast range that walled in the basin. Texas Joe, watching these clouds, said nothing. But when Pat threw on the ground the water left in his cup after drinking, the plainsman opened up upon him with language that startled them all. The next day, noon found them in the first of the sand hills. There was no sign of vegetation here, for the huge mounds and ridges of white sand, piled like drifts of snow, were never quite still. Always they moved eastward before the prevailing winds from the west. Through the greater part of the year they advanced very slowly, but when the fierce gales swept down from the mountains they rolled forward so swiftly that any object in their path is quickly buried 
in their smothering depths. In the middle of the afternoon, Texas climbed to the top of a huge drift to look over the land. The others saw him stand a moment against the sky, gazing to the northwest, then he turned and slid down the steep side of the mound to the waiting wagon. "'She's coming,' he remarked, laconically. "'And she's a big one. I reckon we may as well get as far as we can.' A few minutes later they saw the sky behind them filling as with a golden mist. The atmosphere, dry and hot, seemed charged with mysterious, terrible power. The very mules tossed their heads uneasily and tugged at the reins as if they felt themselves pursued by some fearful thing. Straight and hard with terrific velocity, the wind was coming down through the mountain passes and sweeping across the wide miles of desert, gathering the sand as it came. Swiftly the golden mist extended over their heads a thick yellow fog, through which the sun shone dully with a weird, unnatural light. Then the stinging, blinding, choking blast was upon them with pitiless, savage fury. In a moment, all signs of the trail were obliterated. Over the high edges of the drift, the sand curled and streamed like blizzard snow. About the outfit, it whirled and eddied cutting the faces of the men and forcing them with closed eyes to gasp for breath. Of their own accord, the mule stopped, and Texas shouted to Mr. Worth, It ain't no use for us to try to go on, sir. There ain't no trail now, and we'd just drift around. As far from the lee of a drift as possible, all hands, under the desert man's direction, worked to rig a tarpaulin on the windward side of the wagon. Then, with the mules unhitched and securely tied to the vehicle, the men crouched under their rude shelter. The Irishman was choking, coughing, sputtering, and cursing. The engineer laughed good-naturedly at their predicament, and Abe Lee grinned in sympathy, while Texas Joe accepted the situation grimly with the forbearance of long experience. But Jefferson Worth's face was the same expressionless gray mask. He gave no hint of impatience at the delay, no uneasiness at the situation, no annoyance at the discomfort. It was as though he had foreseen the situation and had prepared himself to meet it. How long do you figure this will last, Tex? he asked in his colorless voice. Not more than three days, returned the driver. It may be over in three hours. The morning of the second day, they crawled from their blankets beneath the wagon to find the sky clear and the air free from dust. Eagerly, they prepared to move. Against their shelter, the sand had drifted nearly to the top of the wheels, and the wagon box itself was more than half filled. The hair, eyebrows, beer, and clothing of the men were thickly coated with powdery dust, while every sign of the trail was gone, and the wheels sank heavily into the soft sand. Three times Texas halted the laboring team, and climbing to the summit of a drift, determined his course by marks unknown to those who waited below. Again they stopped for the plainsman to take an observation, and this time the four in the wagon, watching the figure of the driver against the sky, saw him turn abruptly and come down to them with long plunging strides. Instinctively they knew that something unusual had come under his eye. The seer and Jefferson Worth spoke together. What is it, Tex? A stray horse about a mile ahead. For the first time, Texas Joe uncoiled the long lash of his whip, and his call, You, Buck, Molly, was punctuated by pistol-like cracks that sounded strangely in the death-like silence of the sandy waste. As they came within sight of the strange horse, the poor beast staggered wearily to meet the wagon, the broken strap of his halter swinging loosely from his low-hanging head. Look at the poor beast, said Pat. Tis near dead he is with thirst. 
he leaped to the ground and started toward the water barrel in the rear of the wagon hold on pat said the colorless voice of jefferson worth and his words were followed by the report of texas joe's forty-five the irishman turned to see the strange horse lying dead on the sand for what the hell he demanded hotly but texas was eyeing him coolly and something checked the anger of the irishman you don't seem to savvy drawled the man of the desert replacing the empty shell in his gun there ain't hardly enough water to carry us through now and we may have to pick up this other outfit no one spoke as pat climbed heavily back to his seat for two miles the tracks of the strange horse were visible then they were blotted out by the sand that had filled them he made that much since the blow was texas's slow comment how far we are from where he started is all guess as they pushed on all eyes searched the country eagerly and before long they found the spot for which they looked a light spring wagon with a piece of halter strap tied to one of the wheels was more than half buried by the sand in the lee of a high drift there was a small water keg empty with its seams already beginning to open in the fierce heat of the sun a grub box some bedding and part of a bale of hay nothing more jefferson worth pat and the boy attempted to dig in the steep side of the drift that rose above the half-buried outfit but at their every movement tons of the dry sand came sliding down upon them it ain't no use mr worth said texas as the banker straightened up baffled in his effort you will never know what's buried in there until god almighty uncovers it then the man of the desert and plains read the story of the tragedy as though he had been an eyewitness. They were traveling light and counted on making good time. They must have counted, too, on finding water in the hole. He kicked the empty keg. Their supply gave out, and then that sandstorm caught them and the horses broke loose. Of course, they would go to hunt their stock, not daring to be left afoot and without water and it's a thousand to one they never got back to the outfit we're taking too many chances ourselves to lose much time and i don't reckon there's any use but we'd better look around maybe he directed the little party to scatter and to keep on the high ground so that they would not lose sight of each other until well on in the afternoon they searched the vicinity but with no reward while the hot sun the dry burning waste and the glaring sands of the desert warned them that every hour's delay might mean their own death when they returned at last to the wagon called in by texas no one spoke as they went on their way each was busy with his own thoughts of the grim evidence of the desert's power another hour passed suddenly texas halted the mules and with an exclamation leaped to the ground the others saw that he was bending over a dim track in the sand my god men he shouted it's a woman for a short way he followed the footprints then running back to the wagon and springing to his seat swung his long whip and urged the team ahead it's a woman he repeated when the others went away and didn't come back, she started ahead in the storm alone. She had got this far when the blow quit, leaving her tracks to show. We may, he urged his mules to greater effort. The prints of the woman's shoe could be plainly seen now. Look, said Tex, pointing. She's staggering. Now she's stopped. Whoa! Throwing his weight on the lines, he leaned over from his seat. Look, men, look there, he cried as he pointed. She's carrying a kid. See, there's where she set it down for a rest. It was all too clear. Beside the woman's track were the prints of two baby shoes. The seer, with a long breath, drew his hand across his sand-begrimmed face. 
Hurry, Tex, for God's sake, hurry. The Irishman was cursing fiercely in impotent rage, clenching and unclenching his huge, hairy fists. The boy cowered in his seat. But not a change came over the mask-like features of Jefferson Worth. Only the delicate, pointed fingers of his nervous hands caressed constantly his unshaven chin, fingered his clothing, or gripped the edge of the wagon seat as he leaned forward in his place. Texas, grim, cool, alert, his lean figure instinct now with action and his dark eyes alight, swung his long whip and handled his reins with a master's skill, calling upon every atom of his team's strength while reading those tracts in the sand as one would scan a printed page. It was all written there, that story of mother love, where she staggered with fatigue, where she was forced to rest, where the baby walked a little way, and once or twice where the little one stumbled and fell as the sand proved too heavy for the little feet. And all the while the desert, dragging with dead weight at the wheels, seemed to fight against them. It was as though the dreadful land knew that only time was needed to complete its work. Then the hot sun dropped beyond the purple wall of mountain, and the mystery of the long twilight began. Dry River Crossing is just ahead, said Tex, and soon the outfit pitched down the steep bank of a deep wash that had been made in some forgotten age by an overflow of the great river. Occasionally, after the infrequent rains of winter, some water was to be found here in a hole under the high bank a short way from the trail. With a crash of brakes, the team stopped at the bottom. The men, springing from the wagon and leaving the panting mules to stand with drooping heads, started to search the wash. But in a moment, Texas shouted and the others quickly joined him. Near the dry water hole lay the body of a woman. By her side was a small canteen. The engineer bent to examine the still form for some sign of life. It ain't no use, sir, said Texas. She's gone. He had lifted the canteen and was holding it upside down. With his finger, he touched the mouth of the vessel and held out his hand. The finger was wet. You see, he said, when her men folk didn't come back, she started with the kid and what water she had. But she wouldn't drink none herself, and the hard trip in the heat and sand carrying the baby and finding the water hole dry was too much for her. If only we had known and come on, instead of hunting back there where it wasn't no use, we'd have been in time. As the little party, speechless at the words of Texas, stood in the twilight looking down upon the lifeless form, a chorus of wild, snarling, barking yowls with long-drawn, shrill howls broke on the still air. It was the coyote's evening call. To the silent men, the weird sound seemed the triumphant cry of the desert itself, and they started in horror. Then from the dusky shadow of the high bank, farther up the wash, came another cry that broke the spell that was upon them and drew an answering shout from their lips as they ran forward. Mama, Mama, Baba wants drink. Please bring drink, Mama. Baba's afraid. Jefferson Worth reached her first, close under the bank where she had wandered after Mama lay down to sleep and evidently just awakened from a tired nap by the coyote's cry, set a little girl of not more than four years. Her brown hair was all tumbled and tossed, and her big brown eyes were wide with wondering fear at the four strange men and the boy who stood over her. Mama, Mama, she whimpered. Baba wants Mama. Jefferson Worth knelt before her, holding out his hands, and his voice as he spoke to the baby 
made his companions look at him in wonder. It was so full of tenderness. The little girl fixed her big eyes questioningly upon the kneeling man. The others waited breathless. Then suddenly, as if at something she saw in the gray face of the financier, the little one drew back with fear upon her baby features and in her baby voice. Go away! Go away! she cried. Then again, Mama! Barbara wants Mama! Jefferson Worth turned sadly away, his head bowed as though with disappointment or shame. The others now, in turn, tried to win her confidence. The plainsman and the Irishman she regarded gravely, as she had looked at the banker, but without fear. The boy won a little smile, but she still held back, hesitating, reluctant. Then, with a pitiful little gesture of confidence and trust, she stretched forth her arms to the big brown-eyed engineer. "'Barbara wants drink,' she said, and the seer took her in his arms. At the wagon it was Jefferson Worth who offered her a tin cup of water, but again she shrank from him, throwing her arms around the neck of the seer. The engineer, taking the cup from the banker's hands, gave her a drink. While Mr. Worth and the boy prepared a hasty meal, Texas fed his team, and the Irishman, going back a short distance, made still another grave beside the road already marked by so many. The child, still in the engineer's arms, ate hungrily, and when the meal was over he took her to the wagon, while the others, with a lantern, returned to the still form by the dry water hole. At the banker's suggestion, a thorough examination of the woman's clothing was made for some clue to her identity, but no mark was found. With careful hands, they reverently wrapped the body in a blanket and laid it away in its rude, sandy bed. When the grave was filled and protected as best it could be, a short consultation was held. Mr. Worth wished to return to the half-buried outfit to make another effort to learn the identity of the desert's victim, but Texas refused. "'Tain't that I ain't willing to do what's right,' he said. "'But you see how that sand acted. Why, Mr. Worth, you couldn't move that there drift in a year, and you know it. I just gave the mules the last water they'll get, and we're going to have all we can do to make it through as it is. If we wait to go back there, ain't one chance in a hundred that we all will ever see Rubio City again. It ain't sense to risk killing the kid when we've got a chance to save her, just on a slim chance of finding out who she is. Returning to the outfit, they very quietly so as not to awaken the sleeping child, hitched the team to the wagon and took their places. As the mules started, the baby stirred uneasily in the seer's arms and murmured sleepily, Mama! But the low, soothing tones of the big man calmed her, and she slept. Hour after hour of the long night dragged by, they had left the sand hills behind three miles before they reached Dry River, and now the wide, level reaches of the thinly covered plain, forbidding and ghostly under the stars, seemed to stretch away on every side into infinite space. Involuntarily, all the members of the little party, except Texas Joe, strained their eyes, looking into the blank, silent distance for lights, and, as they looked, they turned their heads constantly to listen for some sound of human life. But in all that vast expanse there was no light save the light of the stars. In all that silent waste there was no sound save the occasional call of the coyote the plaintive quivering note of the ground owls, the muffled fall of the mule's feet in the soft earth, and the dull cluck, creak, and rumble of the wagon with the clink of trace chains 
and the squeak of straining harness leather. And always it was as though that dreadful land clung to them with heavy hands, matching its strength against the strength of these who braved its silent threat, seeking to hold them as it held so many others. The men spoke rarely, and then in low tones. The baby in the seer's arms slept. Only Texas, and perhaps his team, knew how they kept the dimly marked trail that led to life. Perhaps Texas himself did not know. At daybreak they halted for a brief rest and for breakfast. The child ate with the others, but still clung to the engineer, and while asking often for Mama, seemed to trust her big protector fully. From the shelter of his arm, she even smiled at the efforts of Texas Pat and the boy to amuse and keep her attention from her loss. From Jefferson Worth, she still shrank in fear, and the others wondered at the pain of that gray face as all his efforts to win a smile or a kind look from the baby were steadily repulsed. It was Texas who, when they halted, poured the last of the water from the barrel into the canteen and carefully measured out to each a small portion. It was Texas now who gave the word to start again on their journey, and when the desert man placed the canteen with their meager supply of water in the corner of the wagon box under his own feet, the others understood and made no comment. At noon, when each was given his carefully measured portion from the canteen, Jefferson Worth, before they could check him, wet his handkerchief with his share of the water and gave it to the seer to wipe the dust from the hot little face of the child. The eyes of the big engineer filled, and Texas, with an oath that was more reverent than profane, poured another measure and forced the banker to drink. As the long, hot, thirsty hours of that afternoon dragged slowly past, the faces of the men grew worn and haggard. The two days and nights in the trying storm, the exertion of their search among the sand hills, the excitement of finding the woman's body, and the discovery of the child, followed by the long, sleepless night, and now the hard, hot, dreary hours of the struggle with the desert that seemed to gather all its dreadful strength against them were beginning to tell. Texas Joe, forced to give constant attention to his team and hardened by years of experience, showed the strain least, while Pat, unfitted for such a trial by his protracted spree in San Felipe, undoubtedly suffered most. After dinner, the Irishman sat motionless in his place with downcast face, lifting his head only at long intervals to gaze with fierce hot eyes upon the barren landscape, while muttering to himself in a growling undertone. Later, he seemed to sink into a stupor and appeared to be scarcely conscious of his companions. Suddenly he roused himself and, bending forward with a quick motion, reached the canteen from under the driver's seat. In the act of unscrewing the cap, he was halted by the calm voice of Texas. Put that back. Go to hell with you. I'm no sun-dried heron. The cap came loose, but as he raised the canteen and lifted his face with open parched lips, he looked straight into the muzzle of the big forty-five and back of the gun into the steady eyes of the plainsman. I'm sorry, pard, but you can't do it. For an instant, the Irishman sat as if suddenly turned to stone. The water was within reach of his lips, but over the canteen certain death looked at him, for there was no mistaking the expression on the face of that man with the gun. Beside himself with thirst, forgetting everything but the water, and utterly reckless, he growled, Shoot and be damned, you murdering savage! and again started to lift the cloth-covered vessel. At that instant, the baby, catching sight of the canteen, called from the rear seat, Baba won't drink. 
Barbara, thirsty, too. As though Texas had pulled the trigger, the Irishman dropped his hand. Slowly he looked from face to face of his companions, a dazed expression on his own countenance, as though he were awakening from a dream. The child, clinging to the seer with one hand and pointing with the other, said again, Barbara, thirsty, please give Barbara drink. A look of horror and shame came over the face of the Irishman. His form shook like a leaf, and his trembling hands could scarcely hold the canteen. My God, boys, he cried, for what's this I was doing? Then he burst suddenly upon Tex with, Why the hell don't you shoot, damn you? A base like me is fit for nothing but to rot in this godforsaken land. The fierce rage of the man at his own act was pitiful. Texas dropped his gun into the holster and turned his face away. Jefferson Worth held out a cup. Give the little one some water, Pat, he said in his cold, exact way. With shaking hands, the Irishman poured a little into the cup, and, screwing the cap back on the canteen, he returned it to its place. Then, with a groan, he bowed his head in his great hairy hands. Just before sundown, they climbed up the ancient beach line to the rim of the basin in the mesa on the east. Halting here for a brief rest and for supper, they looked back over the low, wide land through which they had come. All along the western sky and far to the southward, the wall-like mountains lifted their purple heights from the dun plain, a seemingly impassable barrier, shutting in the land of death, shutting out the life that came to their feet on the other side. To the north, the hills that rimmed the basin caught the slanting rays of the setting sun and glowed rose color and pink and salmon with deep purple shadows where canyons opened, all rising out of drifts of silvery light. To the northwest, two distant gleaming snow-capped peaks of the coast range marked San Antonio Pass. To the west, Lone Mountain showed dark blue against the purple of the hills beyond. Down in the desert basin, drifting above and woven through the ever-shifting masses of color, shimmering phantom lakes, and dull dusky patches of green and brown, long streamers, Bars and threads of dust shone like gleaming gold. Texas Joe, when he had poured for each his portion of water, shook the canteen carefully, and a smile spread slowly over his sun-blackened features. "'What's left belongs to the kid,' he said. "'But we'll make it. We'll just about make it. The Irishman lifted his cup toward the desert, saying solemnly, Here's to you, damn you! You ain't got us yet! May you burn and blister and scorch and bake till your dang heart shrivels up and blows away. Then he fell to amusing the child with loving fun talk and queer antics, until she laughed aloud and permitted him to catch her up in his big hairy hands and to toss her high in the air. Texas and Abe, joining in the frolic, shared with Pat the little lady's favor, while the seer looked smilingly on. But when Jefferson Worth approached, with an offering of pretty stones and shells which he had gathered on the old beach, she ran up to the engineer's arms. Still coaxing, the banker held out his offering. The others were silent, watching. Timidly, at last, the child put forth her little hands and accepted the gift, shrinking back quickly with her treasures to the shelter of the big man's arms. It was just afternoon the next day when the men at the wagon yard on the edge of Rubio City looked up to see Jefferson Worth's outfit approaching. The dust-covered, nearly exhausted team staggered weakly through the gate. On the driver's seat sat a haggard, begrimmed figure holding the reins in his right hand, and in his lap, supported by his free arm, 
a little girl lay fast asleep. Then, as one of the mules lay down, the men ran forward on the run. Texas stared at them dully for a moment. Then, as he dropped the reins, his parched, cracked lips parted in what was meant for a smile, and he said in a thick, choking whisper, We made it, boys. We just made it. Somebody take the kid. Eager hands relieved him of his burden, and he slid heavily to the ground to stand dizzily holding to a wheel for support. One of the men said sharply, But where's Mr. Worth, Tex? What have you done with Jefferson Worth? And what you doing with the kid? Texas Joe gazed at the questioner steadily, as if summoning all his strength of will in an effort to think. Hello, Jack. Why, damned if I know. You was with me a little while ago. The engineer, the banker, the Irishman, and the boy were lying unconscious on the bottom of the wagon. End of chapter two. Chapter Three of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Three Miss Barbara Worth. Mrs. Worth, sitting on the wide veranda of her home after a lonely supper, lifted her eyes frequently from the work in her lap to look down the street. Perhaps it was unusual for a banker's wife to be darning her husband's socks. It may be, even, that bankers do not usually wear socks that have been darned. But Mrs. Worth was not sensible that her task was at all strange. A group of dust-covered cowboys coming into town for an evening's pleasure jogged past with loud laughter and soft clinking spurs and bridle chains. "'There's Jefferson Worth's place,' said one. "'Do you reckon he'll make good corralling all the money there is in the world?' Now and then a carriage, filled with well-to-do citizens out for an evening ride, drove slowly by. The people in the carriages always saluted Mrs. Worth, and she returned their salutations with a prim little bow. But no one stopped to chat or to offer her a seat. In this, also, there was nothing strange to the woman on the porch of the big, empty house. Sometimes the people in the carriages, entertaining visiting friends, pointed to Jefferson Worth's house with proper explanations, as they also called attention to the Pioneer Bank, Jefferson Worth's bank. When dusk came and she could no longer see, Mrs. Worth laid aside her work and sat with folded hands, her face turned down the street. Inside the house, the lights were not yet on. There was no need for them, and she liked to sit in the dark. The Indian servant woman came softly to the door. Does the senora wish anything? No, thank you, Inez. Come and sit down. Noiselessly, the woman seated herself on the top step. It has been warm today, Inez. Si, senora. It is nearly three weeks since Mr. Worth left with Texas Joe for San Felipe, Inez. Si, senora. Do you know how far it is across the desert to San Felipe? Si. I think three, four days, maybe five, senora. It will be very hot. Si, senora. Last year, my sister's man, Jose, go for San Felipe. No much water. He no come back. Yes, I remember. What is it your people call the King's Basin Desert? The hollow of God's hand, isn't it? Si, senora. La palma de la mano de Dios. I wish they would come. He come pretty quick, I think. Maybe he no start when he think. Maybe so what you call 
Bees nests, not let him come, said the Indian woman soothingly. But Mr. Worth expected to be back two days ago, and he's always on time, you know, Inez. Si, senora, but maybe this one time different. I do wish they would. Look, Inez, there's someone stopping. A carriage was turning in toward the house. It is Senor Worth, said the Indian woman. Someone is with him, Inez. They have a child. As Jefferson Worth and the seer came up the walk, the engineer carrying the little girl, Mrs. Worth rose unsteadily to her feet. Run quick, Inez, quick! The lights! That night, when the seer, with everything possible done for his comfort, had retired, and the baby, bathed and fed, was sound asleep in a child's bed that Inez had brought from an unused room in the banker's big house and placed in Mrs. Worth's own chamber, Jefferson Worth and his wife crept softly to the little girl's bedside. Silently they looked at the baby form under the snow-white coverlet and at the round baby face with the tumbled brown hair on the pillow. Mrs. Worth clasped her hands in eager longing as she whispered, Oh, Jeff, can we keep her? Can we? Jefferson Worth answered in his careful manner. Did you look for marks on her clothing? There was nothing, not a letter even, and all that she can tell of her name is Barba. I'm sure she means Barbara. As she answered, Mrs. Worth searched her husband's face anxiously. Then she exclaimed, Oh, you do want her. You do, and added wistfully, Of course, we must try to find her, folks, but do you think it very wrong, Jeff, to wish? To wish that we never do? I feel as though she were sent to take the place of our own little girl. We need her so, Jeff. I need her so, and you. You will need her when... There was a day coming that the banker and his wife did not talk about. Since the birth and death of their one child, Mrs. Worth had been a hopeless invalid. Several weeks passed, and every effort to find little Barbara's people was fruitless. Inquiry into Rubio City and San Felipe and through the newspapers on the coast brought no returns. The land in those days was a land of strangers where people came and went with little notice and were lost quickly in the ever restless tide. It was not at all strange that no one could identify an outfit of which it was possible to tell only of a woman and a child and one bay horse. There were many outfits with a woman and a child in the party, and many that had among the two, four, six, or more animals one bay horse. In the meantime, little Barbara and her new home was growing gradually away from all that had gone before her long ride in the big wagon with the men. Already she was beginning to talk of her other mama and papa. Mrs. Worth slipped into the other woman's place in the childish heart, even as little Barbara filled the empty mother heart of the woman. Toward Mr. Worth, though she no longer shrank from him in fear, the little girl maintained an attitude of questioning regard. With Texas or Pat or the boy Abe, who often went together to see her, she laughed and chattered like a good little comrade and playfellow. But when the seer came, as he did whenever his duties and his presence in town would permit, she flew to him with eager love, climbing on his knee or snuggling under his arm with entire confidence and understanding. Public interest in Rubio City, keen at first, died out quickly. Rubio City, in those days of railroad building, had too many other things of interest to retain any one thing long. Still, because it was Jefferson Worth, Rubio City could not altogether drop the matter. So it was one evening in the Gold Bar Saloon where Pat, 
coming into town for a quiet evening from the grading camp on the new road, and Texas Joe, who was just back from another trip across the desert, were having a friendly glass in a quiet corner. Is there anything doing in the San Felipe I don't know? was Pat's natural question. Things is that slow in this dang town. I'm getting all dead on me insides. Texas grinned in his slow way. There'll be another payday before long. Yes, and tis ye they'll be around again to keep me from proper enjoyment of the blessings in civilization. Would you talk of the gold that's to be found in them mountains that nobody but ye knows where they are? Tis a fool I am to be listening to your crazy dreams. Just keep your shirt on a little longer, pard, returned the other soothingly. We've most enough for grub steak now. When we're little might better fixed, we'll pull out of this sinful land a temptation, and when we come back, he drew a long breath, we'll do the thing up proper. Pat dropped his glass with a thump. We will, he said. We will that, and it's to San Felipe we'll go. Tell me, did you see no one there inquiring after me good health this last trip? I kept away from Sailor Mike's place, not wishing to deprive you of your share of the sport, but I met a big policeman who said, Tell that red-headed Irish bum that it'll be better for his health to stay away from San Felipe. He did, did he? He told you that, the big slob. He knows it would be better for him. For what did you tell him? I said you had decided to locate here permanent. Pat gasped for breath. You told him that? You did? You're a dang sun-baked heron of a man with no proper spirit at all. For what the hell did you mean to be so slattering me reputation and two or three hundred miles of desert between me and him? For supper weather, I'd go to ye with me two hands. Texas Joe laughed outright. Let's have another drink instead, he said. In the silence occasioned by the refilling of their glasses, the two friends caught the name of Jefferson Worth. Instantly their attention was attracted to a well-dressed, smart-looking stranger who stood at the bar talking loudly to a man known to Rubio City as a promoter of somewhat doubtful mining schemes. Pat and Texas listened with amused interest while the two in concert cursed Jefferson Worth with careful and exhaustive attention to details. Go to it, gentlemen, put in the barkeeper as he returned to his place from the table in the corner. We all sure endorses your opinions. Have one on the house. He graciously helped them to more liquor. Brother Worth sure stands high with this here congregation, drawled Texas Joe to his companion. Sss, whispered Pat. They're asking after the kid. The casual, amused interest of the two friends became intense. They sure tried everything to find her folks, the saloon man was saying. But there ain't nothing doing so far. They say if nobody shows up with a claim, Jefferson Worth is going to adopt her and bring her up like his own. This statement of Jefferson Worth's intentions called forth from the stranger an exhaustive opinion as to the banker's fitness to have the child and her probable chances for right training and happiness in the financier's hands. His remarks being cordially commended by the promoter and the man in the white apron, the speaker was encouraged to strengthen his position in reference to the future of this poor, helpless orphan, and to point out freely the duties of Rubio City in the matter. He was interrupted by a light hand on his shoulder. Turning with a start that spilled the liquor in his glass, he looked into the lean face of Texas Joe. Behind the plainsman stood the heavy form of the Irishman, a look pleased anticipation on his battle-scarred features. There was a sudden sympathetic hush in the room. Every face was turned toward the group. "'Excuse me, stranger,' said Texas in his softest tones. 
but I sure am moved to testify in this year meeting. The man would have made some angry, blustering reply, but a warning look from the promoter and a slight cough from the bartender checked him. Tex proceeded. That you all has rights to your opinion regarding Mr. Jefferson Worth's character, I ain't denying, and there's plenty in Rubio City that'll agree with you. Maybe you has reasons for feeling grieved. I don't savvy this your business game no how. Maybe you stacked the deck and he caught you at it. You sure impresses me that a way, for I've noticed that it ain't the sport who plays fair or loses fair that squeals loudest when the cards are again him. But when you touches on said Jefferson Worth and the future of that little kid, with free remarks on the duties of Rubio City regarding the same, you're sure getting around where I live. Me and this gent here, he waved his hand toward Pat with elaborate formality, to the huge delight of his audience. Me and this here gent is first uncles to that kid, and any pop-eyed, lop-eared, greasy-fingered cross between a coyote and a jackrabbit that comes a-pouncing out of the wilds of civilization to jump our claim by making insinuations that we ain't competent to see that the aforementioned kid has proper bringing up and that Brother Worth ain't a proper daddy for her, had best come loaded for trouble. For trouble will sure camp on his trail till he's reformed or been safely planted. In the significant pause that followed, no one moved. Texas stood easily, looking into the eyes of the stranger. Pat shot fierce, watchful glances around the room from face to face. I trust you gets the force of my remarks, concluded Texas suggestively. The stranger moved uneasily and looked hurriedly about for signs of sympathy or assistance. Every face was a blank. Texas waited. I suppose I was hasty, said the stranger, sullenly. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Consider the meeting dismissed, gentlemen said Texas easily. Me and my partner trust that the congregation will treasure our remarks in the future. Now, you bartender, everybody drinks on us to the health and happiness of our respected niece, Miss Barbara Worth. On the street a few minutes later, Pat growled his disappointment. The devil take a man with no bowels. Ignoring his friend's complaint, Texas returned meditatively. Do you think, Pat, that there might be anything in what that there gent said? In spite of what we seen of him on that trip, Jefferson Worth is sure a cold proposition. Give it to me straight. What will he do for the little one? And it's just for what we'd see on that trip that makes me think it's a question of what the little girl will do to him, answered Pat thereby sustaining the reputation of his race. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 4 you had better make it ninety. Fifteen years of a changing age left few marks on Rubio City. Luxurious overland trains filled with tourists now stopped at the depot where, under the pepper trees, sadly civilized Indians sold Kansas City and New Jersey-made curios. Stopped and went on again along the rim of King's Basin, through San Antonio Pass to the great cities on the western edge of the continent. But the town on the banks of the Colorado, in an almost rainless land, had little to build upon. Still on the street mingled the old-timers from desert, mountain, and plain. From prospecting trip, mine or ranch, the adventurer, the promoter, the Indian, the Mexican, the frontier businessman, and the tourist. 
but there were few of the citizens of rubio city now who knew the story of the baby girl whom jefferson worth and his party had found in la palma de la mano de dios for though rubio city was changed but little since that day when texas joe brought the outfit with the child safely out of the desert the people came and went always as is the manner of their moving kind the few old-timers who remained had long ceased to tell the story no one thought of the young woman who rode down the street that afternoon save only as the daughter of jefferson worth as she passed the people turned to follow her with their eyes the old-timers with smiles of recognition and picturesque words of admiring comment the townspeople with cheerful greetings a wave of the hand or a nod when they caught her eye the strangers from the east with curious interest and ready kodaks here the visitors told themselves was the real west how interesting gasped a tailor-made woman tourist to her escort look george she's wearing a divided skirt and riding a man's saddle and look quick where's your camera she has a revolver that revolver a dainty but effective pearl-handled weapon was a gift to barbara from her uncles texas and pat and though ornamental was not for ornament the girl often went alone as she was going today for a long ride out on the mesa and the country still harbored many wild and lawless characters but the tailored woman tourist did not need to urge george to look there was something about the girl on the quick-stepping spirited horse that challenged attention the khaki-clad figure was so richly alive there was such a wealth of vitality such an abundance of young woman's strength such a glow of red blood expressed in every curved line and revealed in every graceful movement that the attention was irresistible to look at barbara worth was a pleasure to be near her was a delight at the pioneer bank the girl checked her horse and swinging lightly to the ground threw the reins over the animal's head thus tying him in western fashion as she stood now on the sidewalk laughing and chatting with a group of friends who had paused in passing to greet her her beautiful figure lost none of the compelling charm that made her on horseback so good to look at every movement and gesture expressed perfect health the firm flesh of her rounded cheeks and full throat was warmly browned and glowing with the abundance of red blood in her veins though framed in a mass of waving brown hair under a wide sombrero her features were not pretty the mouth was perhaps a bit too large though it was a good mouth and as she laughed with her companions revealed teeth that were faultless but something looked out of her brown eyes and made itself felt in every poise and movement that forced one to forget to be critical it was the wholesome challenging lure of an unmarred womanhood oh barbara how could you how could you miss last thursday's afternoon at miss colson's we had a perfectly lovely time cried a vivacious member of the little group yes indeed young lady explanations are in order added another miss colson didn't like it a bit she had an exquisite luncheon and you know how people depend upon your appreciation of good things to eat well you see answered barbara turning to pat her horse's neck as the animal edging closer to her side rubbed its soft muzzle coaxingly against her shoulder pilot and i were out on the mesa and he said he didn't want to come back pilot doesn't care at all for afternoon parties do you old boy with another pat so what could i do i didn't like to hurt miss colson's feelings of course but i didn't like to hurt pilot's feelings either and the day was so perfect and pilot was feeling so good and we were having such fun together i guess it was a case of 
a bird in the hand, or possession being nine points, you know, or something like that. Only for pity's sake, girls, don't tell Miss Colson I said that. They all laughed understandingly, and the vivacious one said, I guess it was possession, all right. Could anything on earth induce you to give up your horse and your desert, Barbara? Inside the bank, Jefferson Worth, with his customary careful, exact manner, was explaining to a small rancher that it was impossible to extend the loan secured by a mortgage on the farmer's property. Personally, Mr. Worth would be glad to accommodate him. But the loan had already been extended three times, and there were good reasons why the bank must call it in. The farmer must remember that a bank's duty to its stockholders and depositors was sacred. It was not a question of the farmer's honesty. It was altogether a question of good business. The farmer was agitated and presented his case desperately. Mr. Worth knew the situation, the unforeseen circumstances that made it impossible for him to pay then. Only two months more were needed until his new crop matured. He could not blame Mr. Worth, of course. He understood that it was business, but still... The farmer searched that cold, mask-like face for a ray of hope, as a man might hold out his hands for pity to a machine. He was made to feel somehow that the banker was not a man with human blood, but a mechanical something, governed and run by a mighty irresistible power with which it had nothing to do save to obey as a locomotive obeys its steam. Jefferson Worth began explaining again in exact, precise tones that the loan, wholly for business reasons, was impossible when Barbara entered the bank. As the girl greeted the teller in front, her voice full and rich with the same unconscious power that looked out of her eyes and spoke in every movement of her body, came through the bronze grating at the window and carried down the room. Jefferson Worth paused. With the farmer, he faced the open door of his apartment. Every man in the place looked up. The desk-weary clerk smilingly answered her greeting and turned back to their books with renewed energy. The cashier straightened up from his papers and, leaning back in his chair, exchanged a jest with her as she passed. Oh, excuse me, Father. I thought you were alone. How do you do, Mr. Wheeler? And how is Mrs. Wheeler and that dear little baby? The man's face lighted, his form straightened, his voice rang out heartily. Fine, Miss Barbara, fine, thank you. All we need in the world now is for your father to give me time enough on that blamed note to make a crop. Barbara Worth was just tall enough to look straight into her father's eyes. As she looked at him now, the banker felt a little as he had felt that night in the desert when the baby, whose dead mother lay beside the dry water hole, shrank back from him in fear. Oh, I'm sure father would be glad to do that, the girl said eagerly. Won't you, father? You know how hard Mr. Wheeler works and what trouble he has had. And I want some money, too, she added. That's what I came in for. The farmer laughed loudly. Jefferson Worth smiled. But I don't want it for myself, Barbara went on quickly, smiling at them both. I want it for that poor Mexican family down by the wagon yard, the Garcias. Pablo's leg was broken in the mines, you know, and there's no one to look after his mother and the children. Someone must care for them. They were interrupted by a clerk who handed a paper to the banker. This is ready for your signature, sir. Jefferson Worth's face was again a cold, gray mask. Methodically, he affixed his name to the document. Then to the clerk, you may give Miss Worth whatever money she wants. The employee smiled as he answered, Yes, sir 
and withdrew. Barbara turned to follow. Goodbye, Mr. Wheeler. Tell Mrs. Wheeler I'm going to ride out to see her soon. I haven't forgotten that good buttermilk, you see. Goodbye, Miss Barbara. Goodbye. I'll tell the wife. We're always glad to see you. The farmer could not have said that Jefferson Worth's face changed or that his voice altered a shade in tone as they turned again to the business in hand. I guess we can fix you out this time, Wheeler. Sixty days, you say? You had better make it ninety, so you will not be crowded in marketing your crop. Quickly, the black horse carrying Barbara passed through the streets to the outskirts of the city, where the adobe houses of the earlier days, with tents and shacks of every description, were scattered in careless disorder to the very edge of the barren mesa. Beyond the wagon yard, Barbara turned pilot toward a whitewashed house that stood by itself on the extreme outskirts. Her approach was announced by the loud barking of a lean dog and the joyful shouts of three half-naked Mexican children, and as the horse stopped, a woman appeared in the low doorway. "'Buenos dias, senorita,' she called." Then, still in her native tongue, Manuel, take the lady's horse. You, Juanita, drive that dog away. This is not the manner to receive a lady. Come in, come in, senorita. May God bless you for a good friend to the poor. Come in. Everything about the place, although showing unmistakable signs of poverty, was clean and orderly while the manner of the woman, though quietly respectful and warmly grateful, showed a dignified self-respect. In one corner of the room on a rude bed lay a young man. The girl returned the woman's greeting kindly in Spanish and, going to the bedside, spoke, still in the soft musical tongue of the South, to the man. "'How are you today, Pablo?' Is the leg getting better all right? Si, senorita, thank you, he replied, his dark face beaming with gladness and gratitude, and his eyes looking up at her with an expression of dumb devotion. Yes, I think it gets better right along, but it is slow and it is hard to lie here doing nothing for the mother and the children. God knows what would become of us if it were not for your goodness. La Senorita is an angel of mercy we can never repay. The people were of the better class of industrious poor Mexicans. The father was dead, and Pablo, the eldest son, who was the little family's sole support, had been hurt in the mine some two weeks before. Barbara visited them every few days, caring for their wants, as indeed she helped many of Rubio City's worthy poor. For this work, Jefferson Worth gave her without question all the money that she asked and often expressed his interest in his own cold way, even telling her of certain cases that came to his notice from time to time. So the banker's daughter was hailed as an angel of mercy and greatly loved by the same class that feared and cursed her father. For a little while, the girl talked to Pablo and his mother cheerfully and encouragingly, with understanding, asking after their needs. Then, placing a gold piece in the woman's hand and promising to come again, she bade them, Adios. For a short distance, Barbara now followed the old San Felipe trail along which, as a baby, she had been brought by her friends to Jefferson Worth's home. But where the old road crosses the railroad tracks and leads northwest into King's Basin, the girl turned to the right toward the end of that range of low hills that rims the desert. As her horse traveled up the long, gradual slope in the easy, swinging lope of western saddle stock, the view grew wider and wider. The sun poured in its flood of white light down upon the broad mesa, and away in the distance the ever-widening King's Basin lay, a magic, 
constantly changing ocean of soft colors. Nearer ahead were the hills, brown and tawny, with blue shadows in the canyons, shading to rose and lilac and purple, as they stretched their long lengths away toward the lofty, snow-capped sentinels of the pass. Free from the city with its many odors, the dry air was invigorating like wine, and came to her rich with the smell of sunburned, wind-swept plains. The girl breathed deeply. Her cheeks glowed, her eyes shone. Even her horse, seeming to catch her spirit, arched its neck, and in sheer joy of living, pretended to be frightened now and then at something that was really nothing at all. At the foot of the first low rounded hill, Barbara faced Pilot to the northwest and bade him stand still. Motionless now, the girl sat in her saddle, looking away over La Palma de la Mano de Dios. It was to this point that Barbara so often came, and as she looked over the miles and miles of that silent, dreadful land, her face grew sad and wistful and in her eyes there was an expression that the seer sometimes said made him think of the desert. Gentle Mrs. Worth had lived just long enough to have an indelible impression of her simple genuineness upon the life of the child, who had come to take in her heart the place left vacant by the death of her own baby girl. Since the loss of her second mother, the girl had lived with no woman companion save the Indian woman Inez, and it was the seer rather than Jefferson Worth to whom she turned in fullest confidence and trust. The childish instinct that had led the baby to the big engineer's arms that night on the desert had never wavered through the years when she was growing into womanhood, and the seer whose work after the completion of the s and c called him to many parts of the west managed every few months a visit to the girl he loved as his own to mr worth who as far as it was possible for him to be was in all things a father to her barbara gave in return a daughter's love but she had never been able to enter into the life of the banker as she entered into the life of the engineer so it was the seer who became, after Mrs. Worth, the dominant influence in forming the character of the motherless girl. His dreams of reclamation, his plans and efforts to lead the world to recognize the value of that great work with his failures and disappointments, she shared at an early age with peculiar sympathy for she had not been kept in ignorance of the tragic part the desert had played in her own life. Particularly did the King's Basin Desert interest her. She felt that, in a way, it belonged to her, that she belonged to it. It was her desert. Its desolation she shared, its waiting she understood. Something of its mystery colored her life. Something within her answered to its call. It was her desert. She feared it, hated it, loved it. Often as Barbara sat looking over that great basin, her heart cried out to know the secret it held. Who was she? Who were her people? What was the name to which she had been born? What was the life from which the desert had taken her? but no answer to her cry had ever come from the awful hollow of God's hand. Before Barbara had left her home that afternoon, a man, walking with long, easy stride, followed the San Felipe Trail out of the city on to the mesa. He was a tall man, and of so angular and lean a figure that his body seemed made up mostly of bone, somewhat loosely fastened together with sinews almost as hard as the framework. His face, thin and rugged, was burned to the color of saddle leather. 
He was dressed in corduroy trousers, belted and tucked in high-laced boots, a soft gray shirt and slouch hat, and over his square shoulders was the strap of a small canteen. His long legs carried him over the ground at an astonishing rate, so that before Barbara had left the Mexicans, the pedestrian had gained the foot of the low hill at the mouth of the canyon. With remarkable ease, the man ascended the rough, steep side of the hill where, selecting a convenient rock, he seated himself and gave his attention to the wonderful scene that from his feet stretched away miles and miles to the purple mountain wall on the west. So still was he and so intent in his study of the landscape that a horned toad, which had dodged under the edge of the rock at his approach, crept forth again, venturing quite to the edge of his boot heel, and a lizard scaling the rock at his back almost touched his shoulder. When Barbara had left the San Felipe Trail and was riding toward the hills, the man's eyes were attracted by the moving spot on the mesa, and he stirred to take from the pocket of his coat a field glass, while at his movement the horned toad and the lizard scurried to cover. Adjusting his glass, he easily made out the figure of the girl on horseback who was coming in his direction. He turned again to his study of the landscape, but later, when the horse and rider had drawn nearer, lifted his glass for another look. This time he did not turn away. Rapidly, as Barbara drew nearer and nearer, the details of her dress and equipment became more distinct until the man with the glass could even make out the fringe of her gauntlets, the contour of her face, and the color of her hair. When she stopped and turned to look over the desert below, he forgot the scene that had so interested him and continued to gaze at her, until, as the girl turned her face in his direction and apparently looked straight at him, he dropped the glass in embarrassed confusion, forgetting for the instant that at that distance, with his gray and yellow clothing so matching the ground and rock, he would not be noticed. With a low chuckle at his absurd situation, he recovered himself, and again, lifting the glass, turned it upon Barbara who was now riding swiftly toward the mouth of the little canyon that opened behind the hill where he sat. Suddenly, with an exclamation, the young man sprang to his feet. The running horse had stumbled and fallen. After a few struggling efforts to rise, the animal lay still. The girl did not move. With long, leaping strides, the man plunged down the rough, steep side of the hill. When Barbara slowly opened her eyes, she was lying in the shadow of the canyon wall some distance from the spot where her horse had stumbled. Still dazed with the shock of her fall, she looked slowly around, striving to collect her scattered senses. She knew the place, but could not remember how she came there. And where was her horse, Pilot? And how came that canteen on the ground by her side? At this she sat up and looked around just in time to see a tall, gaunt, roughly dressed figure coming toward her from the direction of the canyon mouth. Instantly the girl reached for her gun. The holster was empty. The man, quite close now, seeing the suggestive gesture, halted, then coming nearer, silently held out her own pearl-handled revolver. Still confused and acting upon the impulse of the moment before, Barbara caught the weapon from the outstretched hand and in a flash covered the silent stranger. Very deliberately, the fellow drew back a few paces and stretched both hands high above his head. "'Who are you?' asked the girl sharply. "'A white man,' he answered whimsically, adding as if it were an afterthought, and a gentleman. But why, what, how did I get here? Where did you come from? I was up on the hill back there. I saw your horse fall and went to you the quickest way. 
You were unconscious, and I carried you here out of the sun. I remember now, said Barbara. We were running, and Pilot fell. He must have stepped into a hole. She put up her free hand to her forehead and found it wet. Her eyes fell on the canteen, and the color came back into her face with a rush. But you haven't told me who you are she said sternly to the man who still stood with his hands uplifted. I'm a surveyor going south with a party on some preliminary work. We arrived in Rubio City this morning expecting to find the chief who wrote me from New York to meet him here with an outfit. He has not arrived and there was nothing to do, so I walked out on the mesa to have another look at this King's Basin country. Barbara knew that the seer had been called to New York by some capitalist who had become interested in the financial possibilities of the reclamation work. At the stranger's explanation of his presence, she regarded him with excited interest. Do you mean, is it the seer whom you expected to meet? Are you with him? The young man smiled gravely. I was sure that it was you he answered. You're the little girl whom we found in the desert. And you, burst forth Barbara eagerly, you must be Abe Lee. The surveyor answered whimsically. Don't you think I might take my hands down now? I'm unarmed, you know, and you could still shoot me if you thought I needed it. In her excitement, Barbara had forgotten that she still held her weapon pointed straight at him. She dropped the gun with a confused laugh. I beg your pardon, eh, Mr. Lee? I did not realize that I was holding up my... She hesitated, then finished gravely. My only brother. A quick, glad light flashed into the sharp blue eyes of the surveyor. You have not forgotten me, then. Forgotten? When Father and the Seer and Texas and Pat and you are all the, the family I have in the world? Her lips quivered, but she went on bravely. The seer has told me so many things about you, and I've thought about you so much. But I did not realize, though, that you were a big, grown-up man. The seer always speaks of you as a boy, and so I have always called you my brother Abe, as I call Texas and Pat my uncles. But I think you might have come to see me sometimes. Why didn't you come straight to me this morning instead of tramping way out here alone? Abe Lee was silent. How could he explain the place in his life that was filled by the little girl whom he had known for the two years that the building of the railroad had kept him with the seer in Rubio City? How could she understand the poverty and grinding hardship of his boyhood struggle when the only time he could snatch from his work he must spend on his books while she was growing up in the banker's home. He was more alone in the world than Barbara. Save for the seer, he had no one. Texas and Pat he had met at intervals when they came together on some construction work, and always they had talked about her. While the engineer had often told him of Barbara's interest in her brother, and sometimes the seer even shared with him her letters. But all this had only served to emphasize the distance that lay between them. It was not a distance of miles, but of position, of circumstances. The nameless little waif of the desert had become the daughter of Jefferson Worth, the child of the mining camp was Abe Lee. So when, at last, his work had brought him to Rubio City again, he shrank from meeting her and had gone out on the mesa to look away over La Palma de la Mano de Dios to be alone. Barbara, seeing his embarrassment at her question, guessed a part of the reason and gently sought to relieve the situation. I think we had better find my horse and start for home now, she said. The thin, sun-tanned face of the surveyor was filled with sympathy as he replied, I'm sorry, 
but your pony is down and out. Down and out? Pilot? Oh, you don't mean... You don't... Abe explained simply. His leg was broken, and he couldn't get up. There was nothing that could possibly be done for him. He was suffering so that I... It was for that I borrowed your gun. For a long time she sat very still, and the man, understanding that she wished to be alone, quietly went a little way up the canyon around the jutting edge of the rocky wall. Deliberately he seated himself on a boulder, and taking from the pocket of his flannel shirt tobacco and papers, rolled a cigarette. A deep inhalation in the gray cloud rose slowly from his lips and nostrils. Stooping, he carefully gathered a handful of sharp pebbles and, one by one, flipped them idly toward the opposite side of the canyon. Another generous puff of smoke and a second handful of pebbles followed the first. Then, rising, he dropped the cigarette and went back to her. I think we should be going now, he hesitated. Sister. She looked up with a smile of understanding. Thank you, Abe. Can we go back over the hill there, do you think? I, I, I don't want to see him again. Together they climbed the low hill at the mouth of the canyon from which she had seen the accident, the girl resolutely keeping her eyes fixed ahead so as not to see the dead horse on the plain below. When the top of the hill was between them and the canyon, she made him stop, and together they stood looking down and far away over the wide reaches of the king's basin. "'Isn't it grand? Isn't it awful?' she said in a low, reverent tone. "'It fairly hurts. It seems to be calling, calling, waiting, waiting for someone. Sometimes I think it must be for me. I fear it, hate it, love it so.' Her voice vibrated with strong passion, and the surveyor, looking up, saw her wide-eyed, intense expression, and felt, as did the seer, that somehow she was like the desert. "'Do you come here often?' he asked curiously. "'Yes, often,' she answered. "'I could not get along without my desert, and this is the finest place to see it.' The seer always comes out here with me when he can. Do you think that land will ever be reclaimed? She faced him with the question. Why, no one can say about that, you know, he answered slowly. There has never been a survey. Well, she declared emphatically, I know. It will be. Listen, don't you hear it calling? I think it's for that it has been waiting all these ages. The surveyor smiled as one would humor a child. Perhaps you are right, he said. Now you're laughing at me, she returned quickly. They all do, father and the seer and Texas and Pat. But you shall see. I believe, though, that the seer thinks that I am right. Only he always says, as you do, that there's never been a survey. And sometimes I think that even Father, away down in his heart, believes it too. All the long walk to Barbara's home, they talked of the desert and the seer's dreams of reclamation. And Abe told her how at last those stupid capitalists, as Barbara called them, had opened their eyes. The great James Greenfield himself had read an article of the Sears on reclamation from the investor's point of view and had written him. As a result of their correspondence, the engineer had gone to New York, and now a company organized by Greenfield was sending him south to look over a big territory and to report on the possibilities of its development. When they arrived at Barbara's home, they found the seer himself. The fifteen years had made no perceptible change in the general appearance of the engineer. His form was still strongly erect and vigorous, but his hair was a little gray, 
and to a close observer his face in repose revealed a touch of sadness that indescribable look of one who is beginning to feel less sure of himself or rather who from many disappointments is beginning to question whether he will live to see his most cherished plans carried to completion not because he has less faith in his visions but because he has less hope that he will be able to make them clear to others. When the evening meal was over, the surveyor said goodbye, for the expedition was to start in the morning, and he had some work to do. When he was gone, Barbara joined her father and the engineer on the porch. Here they are, she said. Haven't I kept them nicely for you? She was holding toward the seer a box of cigars. Indeed you have, returned the engineer in a pleased tone, helping himself to a cool, moist Havana. You are a dear good girl. Jefferson Worth did not use tobacco, but it was an unwritten law of the household that the seer, when he came, should always have his evening smoke on the porch, and that Barbara should be the keeper of supplies. She liked to see her friend's strong face brought suddenly out of the dusk by the flare of the match, and to watch the glow of the cigar end in the dark while they talked. "'And what do you think of your brother Abe, Barbara?' the big engineer asked when his cigar, the big engineer asked when his cigar was going nicely. "'Didn't he talk you nearly to death?' The girl laughed. I guess he didn't have a chance. I always do the most talking, you know. The seer chuckled. Abe told me once that most of the time he felt like an oyster, and the rest of the time he was so mad at himself for being an oyster that he couldn't find words to do the subject justice. I think he is splendid, retorted Barbara enthusiastically. He is, returned the engineer earnestly. I don't know a man in the profession whom I would rely upon so wholly in work of a certain kind. You see, Abe was born and raised in the wild, uncivilized parts of the country, and he has a natural ability for his work that amounts almost to genius. With a knowledge of nature gained through his remarkable powers of observation and deduction, I doubt if Abe Lee today has an equal as what might be called a surveyor scout. I believe he's made of iron. Hunger, cold, thirst, heat, wet, seem to make no impression on him. He can outwalk, outwork, outlast, and outguess any man I ever met. He has the instinct of a wild animal for finding his way in the coldest nerve I ever saw. His honesty and loyalty amount almost to fanaticism. But he is diffident and shy as a schoolgirl and as sensitive as a bashful boy. I verily believe he knows more today about the great engineering projects in the West than nine-tenths of the schoolmen, but I've seen him sit for an hour absolutely dumb, half scared to death, listening to the cheap twaddle of some smart yellow legs with the ink not dry yet on their diplomas. Put him in the field in charge of a party of that bunch, though, and he would be boss to the last stake on the line— or the last bite of grub in the outfit if he had to kill half of them to do it. I guess you'll think I'm a bit enthusiastic about my right-hand man, he finished with a short apologetic laugh, and I am. It's because I know him. He struck another match, and Barbara saw his face for an instant. As the match went out, she drew a long breath. I'm glad you said that, she said softly. I wanted you to. I'm sure he has earned it. Then they talked of the seer's new expedition that would start south at daybreak, and it seemed to Barbara that the very air was electric with the coming of a mighty age, when the race would direct its strength to the turning of millions of acres of desolate, barren waste into productive farms and beautiful homes for the people. At daybreak, the girl was up to tell the seer goodbye. I wish, she said wistfully as she stood with him a moment at the gate, 
I wish it was my desert that you and Abe were going to survey. The engineer smilingly answered, Some day, perhaps, that too will come. I know it will, she said simply. And as she stood before him in all the beautiful strength of her young womanhood, the seer felt that sweet, mysterious power of her personality, felt it with a father's loving pride. I believe you do know, Barbara, he said. I believe you do. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Five What the Indian Told the Seer. In the making of Barbara's Desert, the canyon carving, delta building river did not count the centuries of its labor. The rock-hewing, beach-forming waves did not number the ages of their toil. The burning constant sun and the drying, drifting wind were not careful for the ages. Therefore is the time of the real beginning of what happened in this, the land of my story, unknown. Somewhere in the eternity that lies back of all the yesterdays, the great river found the salt waves of the sea fathoms deep in what is now the King's Basin, and extending a hundred and seventy miles north of the shore that takes their wash today. Slowly, through the centuries of that age of all beginnings, the river, cutting canyons and valleys in the north and carrying southward its load of silt, built from the east across the gulf to Lone Mountain, a mighty delta dam. South of this new land, the ocean still received the river. To the north, the gulf became an inland sea. The upper edge of this newborn sea beat helpless against a line of low, barren hills beyond which lay many miles of rainless land. Eastward lay yet more miles of desolate waste and between this sea and the parent ocean on the west, extending southward past the Delta Dam, the mountains of the coast range shut out every moisture-laden cloud and turned back every life-bearing stream. Thus trapped and helpless, the bright waters, with all their life, fell under the constant fierce beating rays of the semi-tropical sun and shrank from the wearing sweep of the dry, tireless winds. Uncounted still, the centuries of that age also passed, and the bottom of that sea lay bare, dry and lifeless under the burning sky, still beaten by the pitiless sun, still swept by the scorching winds. The place that had held the glad waters with their teeming life came to be an empty basin of blinding sand, of quivering heat, of dreadful death. Unheeding the ruin it had wrought, the river swept on its way. And so, hemmed in by mountain wall, barren hills, and rainless plains, forgotten by the ocean, deserted by the river, that thirsty land lay the loneliest, most desolate bit of this great western continent. But the river could not work this ruin without contributing to the desert the rich strength it had gathered from its tributary lands. Mingled with the sand of the ancient seabed was the silt from faraway mountain and hill and plain. The basin of death was more than a dusty tomb of life that had been. It was a sepulcher that held the vast treasure of a life that would be would be when the ages should have made also the master men who would dare say to the river, Make restitution. Men who could with power command the rich life within the tomb to come forth. But master men are not the product of years, scarcely indeed of centuries. 
The people of my story have also their true beginnings in ages too remote to be reckoned. The master passions, the governing instincts, the leading desires, and the driving fears that hew and carve and form and fashion the race are as reckless of the years as are wave and river and sun and wind. Therefore the forgotten land held its wealth until time should make the giants that could take it. In the centuries of those forgotten ages that went into the making of the King's Basin Desert, the families of men grew slowly into tribes. The tribes grew slowly into nations, and the nations grew slowly into worlds. New worlds became old, and other new worlds were discovered, explored, developed, and made old. War and famine and pestilence and prosperity hewed and formed, carved and built and fashioned, even as wave and river and sun and wind. The kingdoms of earth, air and water yielded their wealth as men grew strong to take it. The elements bowed their necks to his yoke to fetch and carry for him as he grew wise to order. The wilderness fled, the mountains lay bare their hearts, the waste places paid tribute as he grew brave to command. Across the wide continent the tracks of its wild life were trodden out by the broad cattle trails. The paths of the herds were marked by the wheels of immigrant wagons, and the roads of the slow-moving teams became swift highways of steel. In the east, the great cities that received the hordes from every land were growing ever greater. On the far west coast, the crowded multitude was building even as it was building in the east. In the southwest, savage race succeeded savage race until at last the slow-footed padres overtook the swift-footed Indian and the rude civilization made possible by the priests in turn ran down the priest. About the land of my story, forgotten under the dry sky, this ever-restless, ever-swelling tide of life swirled and eddied, but touched it not. On the west it swept even to the foot of the grim mountain wall. On the east one far-flung ripple reached even to the river when Rubio City was born. But the desert waited, silent and hot and fierce in its desolation, holding its treasures under the seal of death against the coming of the strong ones, waited until the man-making forces that wrought through those long ages should have done also their work, waited for this age, for your age and mine, for the age of the seer and his companions, for the days of my story, the days of Barbara and her friends. The seer's expedition returning from the south made camp on the bank of the Rio Colorado, twenty miles below Rubio City. It was the last night out. Supper was over, and the men, with their pipes and cigarettes, settled themselves into various careless attitudes of repose after the long day. Their sunburned faces, toughened figures, and worn, desert-stained clothing testified to their weeks of toil in the open air, under the dry sky of an almost rainless land. Some were old-timers, veterans of many a similar campaign. Two were new recruits on their first trip. All were strong, clean-cut, vigorous specimens of intelligent, healthy manhood. For in all professions, not except in the Army and the Navy, there can be found no finer body of men than our civil engineers. Easily they fell to talking of tomorrow night in Rubio City, of baths and barbers and good beds and clean clothes and dinners and the pleasures of civilization and prospective future jobs. Much good-natured chaff was passed, 
with hearty give-and-take jokes that had become time-worn in the many days and nights that the party had been cut off from all other society were revived with fresh interest incidents and accidents of the trip were related and reviewed with zest with here and there a comment of the work itself that was still fresh in their minds abe lee sitting with his back against a wagon wheel and his long legs stretched straight out in front listened enjoying it all in his own way taking his share of the chaff with a slow smile exhaling great clouds of cigarette smoke and only at rare intervals contributing a word or a short sentence to the talk abe was at home with these men out there in the desert night under the chief he was their master respected admired and loved but the old-timers knew that tomorrow in town with these same men dressed in conventional garb on the street or in the hotel the surveyor would be as bashful and awkward as a country boy so they joked him about his numerous sweethearts in rubio city and related many entirely fictitious love adventures and romantic experiences that he was said to have passed through in different parts of the country during the years they had known him not one of them but would have been astonished beyond words had he known of abe's adventure the afternoon before they left rubio city and how through every day of the hard grinding labor with the expedition the image of the girl he had watched through his field glass was before him when the fire of the wits was turned on another mark abe slowly arose to his feet and slipped out of the circle going quietly to the cook wagon where the chinaman sat smoking in solitary grandeur he asked wing where's the chief i saw him talking to you a little while ago me no sabe boss abe chief him go off that way he pointed toward the river with his long bamboo pipe wing sabi chief feel very bad boss sabi dem the white man regarded the chinaman silently for a moment then you're a good boy wing good night night boss abe came the plaintive answer and the surveyor went on to where a group of cocopa indian laborers made their rude camp these he greeted in spanish and asked has the chief been with you since supper no senor he by river there little time passed said one pointing to a clump of cottonwood trees that rose above a fringe of willows buenos noches hombres said abe buenos noches senor came the chorus of soft voices in the dusk on the high bank under the cottonwoods the seer sat with bowed head he did not heed the broad yellow tide of silt-laden water that swept by him silently. He did not see the myriad stars in the velvet sky, nor notice the golden moon climbing slowly up from the dark level of the land. The jovial voices and merry laughter of his men came to him from the camp, but he did not hear. Tomorrow the expedition would be over. The party disbanded. He would make his report to the capitalists who had sent him forth. His report, the seer groaned. Few words would be needed to sum up the work of the last two months, but it would not be easy to frame them. His ear caught the snap of a twig and a whiff of cigarette smoke floated to him. He turned his head quickly. That you, Abe? the long figure of the surveyor settled on the bank by his side for a little neither spoke while the seer with slow care filled and lighted his pipe well lad he said at last we have about reached the end of another failure will you go to new york sir no it will not be necessary i can write in fifty words all there is to say perhaps they will send you out again offered the surveyor their interest is not strong enough they only tackled this because some other fellows were considering the proposition that made them think there might be something in it 
If I had the capital to make surveys and could go to them with data for some other project, they might consider it, but... Abe rolled another cigarette, and with the first cloud of smoke came the slow words, Well, then, let's get the data. Even at what seemed a hopeless suggestion, the disencouraged heart of the old engineer beat more quickly. He turned his face toward the younger man. Where? Abe stretched forth a long arm toward the broad Colorado at his feet and toward the desert beyond. The King's Basin? You've often told me about that country. If I savvy the lay of the land, we're somewhere at the southern end of it, at the beginning of the high ground of the delta that shuts out the ocean. There's water enough here for five times that territory. Do you mean... The seer began quickly and stopped. I mean this. You already know the north and northeastern part of the basin from the railroad. You'd been through it from the west on the San Felipe Trail. Send the outfit in tomorrow with the boys. Give them orders on the bank for their pay and let them go. You and I can scout around the delta end of that country over there for a week or two, and if it looks good, with what you've already seen, you have enough to talk on. Then go on to New York, and when you report on the Southern Project, turn loose on them with this. Abe, said the engineer thoughtfully, if anyone but you were to propose that I go before these capitalists to interest them in a project without ever having put an instrument on it, I would knock him down. Such recklessness would ruin any civil engineer in the world. If, if he guessed wrong, finished Abe dryly. If he guessed wrong, admitted the seer reluctantly. If it looked good enough for you to risk an option, you would have some strong talking points, ventured Abe. There must be 500,000 acres in that old seabed. The Colorado carries water enough for five times that area. There's a railroad already built along one side. There's San Felipe and the whole coast country within easy reach. It beats the other proposition a hundred to one if it can be done at all. The seer rose and paced up and down in the bright moonlight. Presently, he said, if you accept the position with Hunt up north, you should go on at once. That job would be the best thing you ever had. Don't you want to take it? You know what I want if you can use me. I could manage your present salary for this trip, but beyond that... You know how uncertain it all is. Hunt can't wait any longer. Look here, said Abe angrily. I understood when I made my proposition that our salaries would stop when we cut the outfit. Do you think I meant for you to take all the risk? I'm only a surveyor, and you an educated engineer, but this thing means as much to me as it does to you. Let me share the expense, and I'm with you but not on any other terms. Hunt and his job can go hang. I don't see why you should assume that it's only my pay that I work for. It was a long speech for Abe. The engineer put his big hand on the young man's shoulder. Thank you, Abe, he said. That does me good. I've always known that it was there, but it's a real hard road, lad, a mighty hard road. Then... I wonder if we have an Indian in the outfit who knows this country. Yes, sir, Abe answered promptly. Jose knows it well. I've been pumping him for a month. I'll get him. As the tall figure of the surveyor disappeared in the direction of the Coca Path camp, the seer smiled to himself. Been pumping him for a month, he repeated. That means that he saw almost before I did that the other proposition was no good. Huh! <laughs> he faced toward the river and looked away into the night where the king's basin lay, a weird dream country under the light of the moon. And because it was impossible to think of Barbara's desert without thinking of Barbara, he smiled again, 
musing that there would be little sleep that night for the girl in Rubio City if she knew what he and Abe were considering. From across the river came the shrill, snarling, yelping, coyote chorus, and the engineer saw again the body of a dead woman at the dry water hole, an empty canteen, and a big-eyed, brown-haired baby stretching out her arms to him. While the seer was too careful an engineer to take quickly the suggestion of Abe, he had seen too many tests of the desert-bred surveyor's genius not to consider his proposition seriously. He was also too much of a dreamer not to be influenced by thoughts of Barbara and her association in his mind with this particular project. Could it be that the land which had so tragically given the child into his life was now to realize his dreams of reclamation? He was interrupted by the return of Abe, who was followed by an old, grizzly-haired Kokopa. "'Tell the chief what you've told me, Jose,' said the surveyor, and, stepping aside, he rolled the inevitable cigarette with an air of taking himself wholly out of the matter under consideration. "'You sabe that country over there, Jose?' asked the chief. "'Si, senor,' came the soft answer, and, reaching out, the Indian gently turned the engineer so that the latter stood with his back squarely to the river." taking the seer's right hand and holding it outstretched with open palm upward and in one of his own, and tracing with the other dark-skinned finger, as one might trace on a relief map, he continued in Spanish as he drew his finger carefully along the white man's thumb from the wrist. Here are the mountains that shut out the country by the big sea where is San Felipe. I go there once, long time ago. My people live there. He indicated the space between the first and second joints of the thumb. Next, he touched the base of the seer's little finger. Here is Rubio City. Then, tracing the outer rim of the palm toward the wrist, here are the hills and the railroad that the senor made. His finger paused in the depression between the base of the thumb and the outer edge of the palm at the wrist. The senor's railroad goes through the pass in the high mountains here. Next, from the outer edge of the hand, he traced across the palm at the base of the fingers. The river goes this way to the big water that comes in from the sea here. He indicated the open space between the extended thumb and the inner edge of the palm. We stand now here, he touched the base of the seer's index finger. It is the hollow of God's hand, senor, la palma de la mano de Dios, he repeated reverently. He dropped the engineer's hand and stood quietly waiting to be questioned. Again the seer put forth his hand, and pointing with his own finger to the inner edge of the palm between the base of the index finger and the thumb, he asked, The land is high here. See, si, senor, a little, just like the hand. It is much low here, he touched the deepest part of the palm, and a little high here where we stand. Sometimes when much water comes, the river goes all over here. He indicated the extreme inner edge of the palm. Most always this water go all this way toward the open space between the thumb and the palm. Sometimes a little goes here. He traced the lines that cross the palm towards the wrist. You can show us this country. Si, sí, senor. How long will it take? What you like? From here to Lone Mountain Strait? Maybe one day go, maybe two day go. There is water. See, much water left from the river last time big water come. The chief looked at the silent Abe, then back to the old Indian. All right, Jose. We go in the morning. 
You, Signor Lee, and I. Be ready. See, si, Signor. Buenas noches, Signores. Good night. Good night, returned the two white men. There was much conjecturing among the surprised surveyors next morning when the chief gave to each man his paycheck and placed an old-timer in charge with instructions as to the disposition of the outfit when they should arrive in Rubio City. Two loaded pack mules and three saddle ponies were ready when the seer had finished his business with the men. Goodbyes were spoken all around, and the seer and Abe, with Jose in the lead, turned back toward the south. Looked like they had forgotten something, said one of the recruits, as the group stood watching the little party jog steadily into the distance, apparently retracing the tracks the expedition had made the day before. Sonny, remarked the veteran left in charge, what one of that pair forgets, the other is dead sure to remember. All the signs say they are making big medicine. All we have to do with it is to push for Rubio City pronto and cash our paychecks. Lord, but I wouldn't like to be in it, he added regretfully as he turned away. With provisions for three weeks on the pack animals, and the assurance of Jose that there was feed and water in the overflow lands for the horses, the seer and Abe proposed to cover most of the territory lying between the Rio Colorado and Lone Mountain. It was here that the great river, in the ages long past, had built the Delta Dam, thus cutting off the northern end of the gulf that was now the King's Basin Desert. It was their plan to follow this high land that separated the ocean from the basin to the mountains, then to work back as far out in the basin from water and feed as they could. They would then follow the river on the basin side to Rubio City. They had barely passed beyond sight of the main party when Jose turned directly toward the river, at that stage of water, a long bar put out into the stream, and from its point, the current set strongly toward the opposite bank. Here we cross, said the Indian briefly. Constructing a rude raft for their supplies and swimming the animals, they reached the other shore some distance below the point of launching with no accident, and that night camped well back from the river on the Delta land. Day after day they rode from sunrise until dark, studying the land, estimating distances and grades, observing the courses of the channels cut by the overflow and the marks of high water, noting the character of the soil and the vegetation, sometimes together, sometimes separated, with Jose to select their camping places and to help them with his Indian knowledge of the country. And always at night, after the long hard day, when supper, cooked by their own hands, was over, with pipe and cigarette, they reviewed their observations and compared notes, summing up the results before rolling in their blankets to sleep under the stars. Some day, perhaps, when the world is much older and very much wiser, civilization will erect a proper monument to the memory of such men as these. But just now, civilization is too greedily quarreling over its newly acquired wealth to acknowledge its debt of honor to those who made this wealth possible. But the seer and his companion concern themselves with no such thoughts as these. They thought only of the possibility of converting the thousands of acres of the King's Basin Desert into productive farms, for this they conceived to be their work. They had worked across the basin to Lone Mountain and back to the river to a point nearly opposite the clump of cottonwoods where they had left the expedition. Tomorrow night they would be in Rubio City. Abe, said the seer, our intake would go in right here. 
We could follow the old channel of Dry River with our canal about twenty miles out, put in a heading and lead off our mains and laterals. For two or three hours they discussed plans and estimates. Then the engineer shut his notebook with a snap. If those New Yorkers don't listen to what I can tell them of this country now, they're a whole lot slower than I take them to be. Then you think you will make a guess on the proposition? asked Abe shyly. The seer laughed like a boy. I start for New York tomorrow night, he answered. In the afternoon of the next day, they struck the San Filippo Trail a few miles from Rubio City. Perhaps it was the sight of that old road with its memories for the seer and his companion that led the engineer to say, It's curious, Abe, but I can't shake off the odd feeling that Barbara's life is somehow wrapped up in that country out there. As he spoke, he turned in his saddle to look back toward the basin. She seems to belong to it somehow, as in a way it belongs to her. There's a look in her eyes sometimes that makes me think of the desert, and the desert always reminds me of her. I know one thing, he finished with a short laugh. If I was to let out some of the fancies that have come to me in this connection, it would ruin me forever, so far as my profession goes. Abe made no reply, possibly because he also had fancies. Fancies that he could not tell, even to the seer. It is astonishing what a great cloud of dust five animals can stir up on a desert trail. As the little outfit jogged slowly along, the great yellow mass rolled up into the air high above their heads and hung, a long, slow-drifting streamer above the trail until it vanished in the distance. Barbara, who was riding out of town on the mesa, saw that cloud and stopped to study it intently for a few moments, as if debating some question. Then, touching her animal with the spur, she set off rapidly in the direction of the approaching horsemen, while the two men watched the dust that arose from the single horse's feet with the interest that travelers in lonely lands always feel in any life that chanced to come their way. "'Abe, that's a woman,' exclaimed the seer after a time. "'Abe said nothing. "'He had discovered that interesting fact some moments before. "'The engineer rose in his stirrups. "'Abe, I'll bet a month's salary it's Barbara.' "'I'm not gambling,' returned the other, smiling at his companion's excitement. "'I know it is.' The big engineer dropped into his saddle with a grunt of disgust. "'Young man, you've got eyes like a buzzard,' he said, twisting about to face his companion. "'By all traditions, I suppose I should say eagle, but you certainly don't look much like that noble king of birds. You're carrying dirt enough to bury a horse.' The seer took off his sombrero and began beating the dust from his shoulders, while the surveyor looked on in silent amusement. She'll think by the dust you're raising that there's some kind of a scrap going on and that she'd better head the other way. Not much she wouldn't head the other way from a scrap. She would come on all the faster. I thought you knew Barbara better than that. He replaced his hat. Why, Abe, one time when she was... The surveyor interrupted his chief by standing up in his stirrups in turn and sweeping his hat in greeting, while the seer, in waving his own sombrero and whooping like a wild man, forgot he was about to relate. The girl came on at a run and, guiding her horse between the two dust-covered men, held out a hand to each. End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
Chapter 6, The Standard of the West Three days after the seer's letters to Abe and Barbara telling them that James Greenfield and his associates would finance an expedition to make the preliminary surveys in the King's Basin Desert, the westbound overland dropped a passenger in Rubio City from New York. The stranger was really a fine-looking young man with the appearance of being exceptionally well-bred and well-kept. Indeed, the most casual of observers would not have hesitated to pronounce him a thoroughbred and a good individual of the best type that the race has produced. A company of men and women, traveling acquaintances evidently, followed him from the Pullman to bid him good-bye and to look at the Indians, who, with their wealth of curios spread before them, squatted in a long row beside the track, objects of never-failing interest to travelers from the east. Ugh, said a tall blonde, who displayed more bracelets, bangles, chains, and charms, both natural and manufactured, than any blanketed squaw in the party of natives. I suppose if we ever see you again, you'll be the color of that thing there. She pointed to a smoky, copper-colored papago in a green headcloth and decorated shirt, who posed in a watchful attitude near his thrifty help meet. How perfectly romantic! gushed a billow divorcee clinging to the young fellow's athletic arm with little shivers of delight to think of you in this great savage wild land among these strange people aren't you just a little bit frightened by george i half wish i was going to stop with you you'll get some great shooting don't you know exclaimed one of the men while the chorus joined in you'll die of loneliness you'll find nothing to eat and do take care of yourself. Then, as the warning, all aboard, and the clang of the engine bell came down the platform, there were quick goodbyes and a rush for the car. The colored porters tossed their steps aboard and followed. Smoothly, the long, dust-covered coaches slid past. There was a waving of handkerchiefs and caps from the rear of the observation car, and the young man turned to look curiously about. Hotel? The stranger glanced doubtfully at the tough-looking citizen who reached for his suitcase, and without replying stepped into the questionable-looking hack standing nearby. The driver threw the suitcase into the vehicle after his passenger, and, climbing to his seat, yelled to the team. There was no rush of brass-buttoned bellboys to meet the guest at the door of the hotel, and the room was well filled with a group strange to the eyes of the young man from New York. Bronze-faced men in flannel shirts and belted trousers talked to men well-dressed in more conventional business clothes. Others in their shirt-sleeves sat smoking with companions in blue overalls, Two or three wore guns loosely belted at their hips. Here and there was the pale-faced, white-collared, tired, and tailored tourist. In the corner near the big window, a group of women, some in white duck, some in khaki or corduroy, sat chatting and enjoying the scene. No one paid the least attention to the newcomer. The tough-looking driver of the hack dropped the suitcase near the desk with a bang and turned to reply to a good-natured remark addressed to him by a jovial, well-dressed man standing near. Only the clerk regarded the stranger. "'Have you a room with a bath?' the clerk smiled. "'Certainly, sir.' Then, to a young fellow talking over the cigar counter to a man in high-heeled boots and spurs, Jack, show this gentleman to forty-five. In the well-furnished room, the guide threw open long French windows and pointed to a cot on the screen porch outside. Better sleep on the porch, he volunteered. Sleep on the porch? Suit yourself, came the answer as the independent one turned away. 
Look here. The employee of the house paused. I want my trunk sent up immediately. Sure, Mike. Let's have your checks. So long. The stranger stood staring at the door which the breezy young man, as he disappeared with a cheery whistle, had shut behind him with a vigorous bang. In the dining room, the man from New York found the same easy freedom in the manner of dress, the same lack of conventionalities, and the same atmosphere of general good fellowship. Yet he could not say that there was any lack of real courtesy, and certainly there was no rude or boisterous talk. It was, to say the least, unsettling to the exceptionally well-bred and well-kept stranger, accustomed to the hotels and restaurants in the East, frequented by his class. Early that evening the Easterner sallied forth, clearly bent on sightseeing. He had dressed for the occasion. The gray traveling suit had been put aside for a tailor-made outfit of corduroy. The coat, worn without a vest over a fine negligee shirt of silk, was Norfolk. The trousers were riding trousers, and above the tan shoes were pigskin pooties. All this, with the light soft hat, neat tie, and the undeniably fine figure and handsome face, would have made him attractive at any stage. The tourists turned to look after him with expressions of admiring envy. The natives, white, red, black, yellow, and brown, accepted him with no more than a passing glance as a part of the strange new life that the railroad was constantly bringing to Rubio City. Calmly conscious of himself and openly interested in a mildly condescending way, the young man strolled down one side of the main street to the end of the business section, then back on the other. Twice he made the round, then, seeking scenes of further interest, pushed open the swinging doors of Rubio City's most popular place of amusement, the Gold Bar Saloon. At a table in one corner, two men, one tall, dark-faced, coatless, with unbuttoned vest, leather wrist guards, and a heavy gun loosely buckled about his slim waist, the other, thick-set, heavy, red-faced, were holding animated conversation over their glasses. That is to say, the thick, red-faced man was animated. Glaring at his companion, he banged his huge, hairy fist on the table until the glasses jumped. "'You're a damned old savage, would you talk? For what the hell is a country good for as it is?' A thousand square miles, and you wouldn't feed a jackrabbit. Tis a blistering, sizzling, roasting wilderness of sand and cactus, fit for nothing but them sign wanders, horn toads, healy monsters, and all their poisonous relations, including yourself. The New Yorker, standing at the end of the bar nearest the table occupied by Barbara's uncles, who had just arrived from the gold center mines, heard the words of Pat and turned toward the two friends with amused interest. Texas Joe silently lifted his glass and, with a look of undisguised admiration for his belligerent partner, waited for more. More came with another thump of the huge fist. "'Tis civilization that you need, and tis civilization that we're bringing to you, and tis civilization that you got to take whether you like it or not." Look at the seer now. One gentleman with brains and education like him is worth more to this country than all the hell-roaring savages like yourselves between the coast and Oklahoma, which is not so much better than it was. We bring you money. We bring you schools. We bring you railroads. And we'll keep on bringing you blessings and joys of civilization till you mend your ways and live like Christians. He paused. Texas was staring with childlike simplicity at the immaculate figure of the stranger in pooties. Pat turned to follow the gaze of his companion, just as the plainsman drawled softly, "'And you've brought us that.' The Irishman's heavy jaw dropped. He gasped and gulped like an uncouth monster. Then, speechless, he drained his glass." 
The stranger's face flushed, but he did not move. Partner, drawled Texas, your remarks is sure edifying a heap and some convincing, but I'm still constrained to testify that the real cause and reason for the declining glory of this year great western country is poor shooting, that same in turn being caused by the incoming herds from the effete east being so numerous as to hinder gun practice. Guns, is it? interrupted the other with a roar. A man should be ashamed to go about all the time with a cannon tied to his middle. Tis the mark of a child. Look at ye, with all your artillery and me with fingers that never pushed a trigger. He held out his great paws and studied them admiringly. Why, you hear him? With them two hands I could break you, gun and all, like a... He was interrupted by a wild-eyed individual who rushed into the room from the street and, springing toward them, burst forth with, "'Give me your gun, Texas, quick! I ain't got mine on, and that damned red holt is a layin' for me at the corner!' Texas Joe dropped his slim hand caressingly on the big forty-five at his side, leaned easily back in his chair, and eyed the excited citizen in a manner calmingly judicial. Bill, your coming is some opportune. You're sure Johnny on the spot. Let me have your gun, Tex. Just loan her to me. I'll be back in a minute. Oh, I ain't doubting that you'd be back all right, Bill. That's just the point. When you blew in so promiscuous and interrupted the meeting, me and my friend here was just resolving how there's too much bad shooting being done in this year Rubio town. It's a spoiling the fair name and a ruining the reputation of this country, for which said reason us too undertakes to regulate and reform some. He turned with elaborate politeness to Pat. I voices your sentiments correct, pard. The Irishman's fist struck the table and his eye flashed. To the trim of a gnat's heel, he roared. Texas bowed and continued. Therefore, Bill, this year's our verdict. You camp right here peaceable while I go out and fetch this red hort person what's been annoying you. We'll stand you up at fifteen steps with nothing between to obstruct ceremonies and drop the hat. Me and my friend referees the job and undertakes to see that the remains is duly and properly planted with all regular honors. Sabi? The bloodthirsty one growling something about attending to his own funeral and finding a gun somewhere else went quietly and quickly out. Before the pugnacious Pat could voice his disgust and disappointment at the disappearance of the troubled hunting citizen, a low, contemptuous laugh from the well-built stranger at the bar drew the attention of the two friends. The young man was watching them with an amused smile. Texas Joe and the Irishman regarded each other thoughtfully. Pard, said Tex in a low, earnest tone, do you reckon that their hilarity was in any ways directed toward this corner of the room? The stranger, receiving his change from the bartender, was moving leisurely toward the door, when his way was barred by the heavy bulk of Pat. There was no misunderstanding the expression on the battle-scarred features of the Irish gladiator. Eyeing the athletic Easterner fiercely, he growled with deliberate meaning. You seem to be finding plenty of amusement in the private affairs of me friend and myself. Do you think that we're a couple of hoochie-goochie girls to be making sport? for all the dumb dudes that runs to look at us when their mamas don't know they're out? The other regarded him with well-bred surprise. Stand aside, he said curtly. Oh, ho you will leave without properly apologizing for your outrageous conduct, will ye? Tis an ambulance that you're made to take you home when I've taught you manners, you dang yellow-legged cock-a-doodle. He lifted his fists, and the stranger, without giving back an inch or exhibiting the slightest suggestion of fear, 
but rather with the calm self-confidence of a trained athlete squared himself for the encounter eagerly the patrons of the place miners cowboys ranchers adventurers mexicans indians had gathered around the two men delighted with the prospect of what promised to be no tame exhibition already several bets had been placed and critical estimates and comments on the comparative merits of the two were being made freely when a hand fell on pat's uplifted arm turning with an oath of rage at the interruption the irishman faced abe lee hello pat amusing yourself as usual to the angry protests from the crowd the tall surveyor gave not the slightest heed for a moment the irishman looking up into that thin sun-tanned face was speechless as though he faced some apparition then with a yell of delight he caught the lank form of the seer's assistant in a bear-like hug for the love of god is it ye you old sand rat where the hell did ye drop from and for what are you doing in this disreputable company look at uncle tex there the sentimental old savage is fair slobbering with delight and eagerness to get at ye come come we must have a drink as quickly as it had risen the storm had passed the crowd as if moved by a single impulse separated and the room was filled with loud talk and laughter glancing around pat's eye met the still defiant look of the stranger who had not moved from his place but stood calmly watching the irishman and abe as if waiting the pleasure of the man who had challenged him the irishman grinned in appreciation hold on a minute he said to abe who was moving away with texas joe toward a vacant table then to the stranger i ax your pardon sir for going off me head that way tis a habit i have worse luck to me being sensitive do you see about me personal appearance and some wishful for a bit of honest enjoyment if you'll have a drink with me and me friends here i'll take it kindly until we can find some better cause for grievance the young man's tense figure relaxed a smile broke over his face and i beg your pardon he said heartily the fact is i was not laughing at you at all but at the way you two men call the bluff of that fellow who wanted the gun i should have said so and apologized but i too was a little upset and thrown off my guard faith it looked to me that you was thrown on your guard tis the science ye have and i'm a dutchman he eyed the athletic limbs deep chest broad shoulders and well-set head with eyes that twinkled his approval some day but never mind now come he led the way to the table as they seated themselves pat regarded the surveyor with pleased interest well well tis a most unexpected word as twas the old devil himself that clapped his hand on me arm i'll be no more surprised than i was to see the lad here tell us me boy what tis that's brung you here haven't you two been to see barbara yet the surveyor demanded as though charging them with some neglected duty we have not and by that you'll know that we've been in this town less than an hour by texas watch that barbara gave him and that he lost down the shaft at gold center when the surveyor had explained his presence in rubio city and texas and pat had agreed to join the king's basin party the stranger said i think it is quite time now that i introduce myself you are mr lee i believe abe assented and with his two companions regarded him with interest taking a letter from his pocket and handing it to the surveyor the young man continued i'm a civil engineer i have instructions from the chief to report to you my name is willard holmes the next morning the young engineer from the east presented his card at the pioneer bank and asked for mr worth the man who received the correctly engraved bit of pasteboard 
merely nodded toward the other end of the long partition of polished wood plate glass and bronze bars you'll find him back there mr holmes the new yorker smiled at the provincialism but sought the banker without further ceremony closing the door with one hand jefferson worth with the other indicated the chair at the end of his desk sit down you have a letter from mr greenfield relative to my coming asked willard holmes the banker lifted a typewritten sheet from his desk glanced at it and turned back to his visitor yes he said the involuntary movement was the instinctive act of one who habitually verifies every statement. Then, as those expressionless blue eyes were fixed on the stranger's face, the engineer's sensation was as though from behind that gray mask something reached out to grasp his innermost thoughts and emotions. He felt strangely transparent and exposed as one alone in his lighted chamber at night might feel someone in the dark without watching through the window. Presently, the colorless, exact voice of Jefferson Worth asked, This is your first visit west? Yes, sir. My work has been altogether in New York and the New England states. Five years with the New York Contracting and Construction Company, said Jefferson Worth exactly, laying his hand again on the letter on his desk. Yes, for the past two years I've had charge of their more important operations. The engineer's tone was a shade impressive. But there was not the faintest shadow of a hint in the face or manner of that man in the revolving chair to intimate that he was impressed. The visitor might as well have spoken to the steel door of the big safe in the other room. You are well acquainted with Mr. Greenfield and his associates? My father and Mr. Greenfield were boyhood friends and college classmates, the engineer explained. Since the death of my father when I was a little chap, I have lived with Uncle Jim. He was my guardian until I became of age. The young man did not think it necessary to add that the death of his father had left him penniless and that his father's friend, who had never married, had reared and educated the child of his old classmate as his own son. Neither did he explain that his rapid advancement in his profession was due largely to the powerful influence of the capitalist and those closely associated with him, together with the strength of the proud social position to which he was born, rather than to hard work and experience. Probably Willard Holmes himself did not realize how much these things had added to his own native ability and technical training. He had never known anything else but these things, and he accepted them as unconsciously as his voice was colored with the accent of the cultured East. How do you size up this King's Basin proposition? questioned the banker. Again, Willard Holmes smiled at the Western man's words. Sizing up and proposition were pleasingly novel forms of expression to him. Really, he answered, I haven't gone into it very thoroughly as yet. Mr. Greenfield asked me to come out because he and his associates felt, he paused, perhaps it would be just as well not to say what Mr. Greenfield and his associates felt, that with my experience in connection with large corporations, I could be of value to them in certain phases of the work, he finished. He wondered if the man, who listened with such an air of carefully considering every word and mentally reaching out for whatever lay back of the verbal expression, had grasped what he was about to say. Jefferson Worth waited and Holmes continued. Mr. Greenfield and his friends are very anxious that you should come in with them on the organization of this company, Mr. Worth. That is, of course, providing the scheme proves to be practicable. They instructed me to urge you personally to consider their proposal favorably and to ask you by all means to represent them on this expedition if possible. They realize that a man of your recognized ability and standing in the financial world, particularly in the West, 
in close touch as you are with capital and conditions in this part of the country, and no doubt familiar with the reclamation work, would be a valuable addition to their strength. In fact, I may say they would depend largely upon your judgment as to whether the scheme was practicable from a business standpoint. On your side, I'm sure you recognize the advantage of allying yourself with such a group of capitalists who are strong enough to finance any undertaking, no matter how great. Their interests are already enormous. As you know, they operate only on the largest scale, and if this survey justifies the report already made, they will make a big thing out of this for everyone interested. The cold, exact voice of Jefferson Worth came as if from a machine incapable of inflection. I have written Mr. Greenfield that I would look into the proposition for him. I will go out with the outfit. Have you seen Abe Lee? I met him last night, and we had a little talk over things. I confess I was a little surprised. Why? Well, that he is in charge. I was instructed to report to him. I find that he's had no schooling whatever, that, in fact, he is nothing but a kind of self-educated surveyor. I have no doubt that he is a good practical fellow, but it seems to me somewhat reckless to put him in such a responsible position. Jefferson Worth did not say that he himself had had no more schooling than the Sears lieutenant. Perhaps that also was not necessary to explain. He did say, We have only one standard in the West, Mr. Holmes. And that? What can you do? Came the words as if spoken by cold iron. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Seven Don't You Like My Desert, Mr. Holmes? After his noonday meal, Willard Holmes, following the example of others, sought the shade of the arcade in front of the hotel. Helping himself to a chair and moving a little away from the general company, he sat enjoying his cigar, musing on the novelty of his surroundings and reviewing his impressions of the last few hours. It was natural that he should make comparisons, that he should see men and things in the light of the only men and things he had ever known. Abe Lee, he measured by the standing of his own school-trained engineering friends, demanding that the desert-born and desert-trained surveyor exhibit all the hallmarks of Boston. He might as consistently have demanded that the flood of sunlight that fell in such blinding glory upon the new world before him should shine as through the smoke-grimmed city atmosphere of New York. One was no more impossible than the other. Jefferson Worth, he compared with the college and university friends of his father, with Mr. Greenfield and the New York-bred businessmen of his class, demanding that the Western pioneer banker show the same characteristics that distinguished the cultured capitalist whose great-great-grandfathers were pioneers. Rubio City he saw in the light of those eastern cities that were founded in the days when men knew not that there was any world west of the Alleghenies. Turning his head now and then to look over the typical groups that sat in the shade of the arcade, dressed or undressed, with all the easy freedom of a land too young as yet to have conventions, he recalled his favorite hotels in his home cities, and smiled to think of what would happen if some of those roughly clad individuals were to appear there among the guests. He did not know yet that some of these roughly clad individuals were as much at home in those same favorite hotels as was he himself. Likewise, as he watched the passing citizens in the street, he recalled the scene from the windows of his club at home a famous club on a famous avenue. 
That young woman, for instance, with her khaki divided skirt, wide sombrero, fringed gauntlets, and the big western saddle, coming there on a horse whose feet seemed scarcely to touch the ground as he plunged and pranced impatiently along, springing sidewise with arched neck and pointed ears at every object that could possibly be made into something frightful by his playful fancy. What a sensation she would create at home. By Jove, but she could ride, though. He watched with admiring eyes the strong, graceful figure that set the high-strung, uncertain horse as easily and unconsciously as any one of his women friends at home would rest in a comfortable chair. As the horsewoman drew nearer, he fell to wondering what she was like. Could she talk? for instance, of anything but the homely details of her own rough life. He shrugged his shoulders as he fancied her crude attempts at conversation, her uncouth language, and raw expressions. The girl turned her horse toward the hotel entrance. As she drew still nearer, he saw that she was not pretty. Her mouth was too large, her face too strong, her skin too tanned by the sun and wind. At the sidewalk, the girl swung from the saddle lightly, and throwing the bridle reins over the horse's head with a movement that brought out the beautiful lines of her figure, she turned her back upon the pawing, restless animal with as little concern as though she had delivered him to a correctly uniformed groom. No, she was not pretty. She was magnificent. The adjective forced itself upon him. All along the arcade, people were smiling and greeting, the men lifting their hats. Two cowboys in high-heeled boots and chaps paused in passing. "'That new hoss of yours is sure some hoss, Miss Barbara,' said one admiringly, sombrero in hand. The girl smiled and Holmes saw the flash of her perfect teeth. "'Oh, he'll do, Bob.' when I've worked him down a little. She passed into the hotel, followed by the eyes of every man in sight, including the engineer, who had noted with surprise the purity and richness of her voice. The New York man had turned and was watching a company of Indians farther down the street when that voice close beside him said, I beg your pardon, is this Mr. Holmes? He turned quickly rising to his feet. She smiled at his astonished look. The clerk pointed you out to me. I'm Barbara Worth. You met father at the bank this morning. Texas Joe and Pat told me about your being here, and I could scarcely wait to see you. I'm afraid you must have thought them a little rough last night, but really it's only their fun. They're as good as gold. As she stood now close to him, the red blood glowing under the soft brown of her cheeks, Willard Holmes felt her rich personality as distinctly as one senses the presence of the ocean, the atmosphere of the woods or the air of meadows and fields. But by all his conventional gods, this was the unconventional limit, that this girl, the daughter of a banker, should openly seek out a total stranger to introduce herself to him on the public street before a crowd of hotel loungers, and the way she spoke of those rough men in the saloon, one would think they were her intimate friends. He managed to say, Really, I'm delighted, Miss Worth. May I escort you to the hotel parlor? She looked at him curiously. Oh, no, indeed. It is much nicer out here in the arcade, don't you think? But you may bring another chair. Dumbly he obeyed, feeling that every eye was on him and flushing with embarrassment for her. When Texas and Pat told me that you were one of the engineers going out with the King's Basin Party, I could scarcely wait to see you. It makes it all seem so real, you know. You're coming all the way out here from New York. I have dreamed so much about the reclamation of the King's Basin Desert, and you see I consider all civil engineers my personal friends. Indeed, he said. 
It is always safely correct to say indeed, as he said it, particularly when you have nothing else to say. She regarded him doubtfully with an open, straightforward look which was somewhat disconcerting. She was so unconscious of the strength of her splendid womanhood, and he felt her presence so vividly. I suppose you must find everything out here very strange, she said slowly. Father says this is your first visit to the West, and of course it can't be like your part of the country. It is all very interesting, he murmured. This also was sane and safe. I know that Abe is very busy and father never leaves the bank except on business, so there's no one but me to look after you, she smiled. That is, no one of our King's Basin people. Willard Holmes was of that type of corporation servant who recognizes no interest but the financial interest of the capital employing him. His service as a civil engineer belonged wholly to those who bought him for their own profit. Barbara's innocent words aroused him. What the deuce did she mean by our King's Basin people? Greenfield and his friends thought that they were the King's Basin people. In the interest of his employers, he must look into this. It's very kind of you, I'm sure, he said with a little more warmth. To tell the truth, I was feeling a bit strange, you know. I'm sure you must be nearly dead with lonesomeness. Wouldn't you like to go for a ride? I would so like to show you my desert. Her desert, he mentally observed. Indeed, he must look into this. Fully alert now, he answered heartily. I should be delighted, I'm sure. You're more than kind. When could we go? Right now, she said quickly. Here comes Pablo Garcia. I'll send him for another horse, she called to the passing Mexican. Here, Pablo. The young fellow came to her quickly and stood, sombrero in hand, his dark eyes shining with pride at the recognition. In Spanish, she directed him to fetch a horse for the senor. Si, sí, senorita. With a low bow, the Mexican turned to obey. The eastern man, not understanding the words, but awakening suddenly to the meaning of the action, broke forth with, Here, wait a minute. Wait, repeated Barbara in Spanish. Pablo paused. You're sending him for a horse and saddle? asked Combs. Yes, it will take only a few minutes. But I don't ride, you know. You don't ride? The girl looked at him in blank amazement. I don't think I ever saw a man before who didn't ride. He laughed indulgently. Something in her voice and manner touched his sense of humor. I'm very sorry. I know I ought to, he said in mock humility. Oh, well, we can drive. I'll have Pablo bring a rig. She explained what she wanted to the Mexican in his native tongue, and this time he mounted her horse and rode away. When the man returned a little later with a span of restless half-wild broncos hitched to a light buggy, the girl stepped into the vehicle and took the reins as a matter of course. With a low chuckle of amusement, the engineer took his place at her left. He was beginning really to enjoy the situation. Shying and plunging the team demanded all of Barbara's attention, but she managed to steal a look at her silent companion now and then, as if expecting him to show signs of nervousness. Willard Holmes, on his part, was wrapped in silent admiration of her strength and skill. They'll cool down in a little while, the girl volunteered, as if to reassure her guest after a particularly wild break on the part of the horses. But on the extreme edge of town, where the wagon road runs closest to the railroad track, a passing switch engine proved too much for the excited team. In a moment, the frightened animals were running toward the mesa at full speed. With all her strength, Barbara struggled to regain control 
but her arms were a woman's arms, and the horses, quick to recognize their advantage, put back their ears and ran the faster in mad defiance. The girl was not frightened. She was annoyed. I'm afraid they're running away, she gasped at last. To her surprise, a hearty laugh was the only answer to her confession. She shot a quick glance over her left shoulder. Her companion was leaning back in his seat, his merry face expressing the keenest enjoyment. Then the girl felt a big hard shoulder pressing against her, long powerful arms stretched over hers, and two masterful hands closed on the reins above her cramped fingers. She relinquished her hold and shrank back out of the way with a sigh of relief and, yes, a look of admiration as the horses, with a few wild leaps and ineffectual attempts to run again, settled down to a more rational gait. My, she gasped at the exhibition of the engineer's strength, I believe you could pull their front feet off the ground. Her companion was still smiling. Why didn't you tell me you could drive, she demanded. He chuckled maliciously, for he had understood her reason for taking the reins at the start, and he had not been insensible to the meaning of her glances at the beginning of the ride. You didn't ask me, and besides, I enjoyed seeing you handle them. But you told me you couldn't ride, she said reproachfully. I can't, he returned. That is, I never did. Not as you people in this country ride. Then he laughed again. Confess now. Didn't you expect me to jump back there? I shall confess nothing, she retorted sharply. And hereafter I shall take nothing for granted. On the high ground near the foot of the hill at the canyon's mouth, she asked him to turn around and stop. Willard Holmes had been too much occupied with the team and the girl to notice the landscape. And now that wonderful view of the mesa, the king's basin, and the mountains burst upon him without warning. No sane man could be insensible of the grandeur of that scene. The man, whose eyes had looked only upon eastern landscapes that bore in every square foot of their limited range the evidence of man's presence, was silent, awe-stricken before the mighty expanse of desert that lay as it was fashioned by the creative forces that formed the world. Turning at last from the glorious ever-changing scenes, wrought in color of gold and rose and lilac and purple and blue, to the girl whose eyes were fixed questioningly upon him, he said in a low voice, Is it always like this? Barbara nodded. Always like that, but always changing. It is never the same, but always the same, like, like life itself. Do you understand? He turned again to the scene in silent wonder. Do you like my desert? She asked after a little time had passed. His mind caught at the expression. Do you mean to say that that is the king's basin? That we're going there to work? Why, of course, she laughed uneasily. Don't you like it? Like it, he repeated. But is there anyone living out there? She was amazed at his words. Living there? Of course not. But you are going to make it so that thousands and thousands can live there, you and the others. Don't you understand? Her voice expressed a shade of impatience. I am afraid I did not realize, he answered slowly. That's just it, she cried, thoroughly aroused now and speaking passionately. That's just the trouble with you eastern men. You don't realize. For years the dear old seer and a few others have been trying to make you see what a work there is to do out here, and you won't even look up from your little old truck patches to give them intelligent attention. You think this king's basin is big? while the seer says that if every foot of that land were under cultivation, it wouldn't be a posy bed beside what there is to do in the West. I suppose you must have done some great things in your profession, Mr. Holmes, 
or those capitalists wouldn't have sent you out here, but you can't have done anything that will mean to the world what the reclamation of the King's Basin Desert will mean 100 years from now, because this work is going to make the people realize, don't you see? The young engineer's face flushed under her words, and as he watched her strong face glowing with enthusiasm for the seer's dream, he felt the sweet power of her personality sweep over him as he felt the breeze from off the desert. He was held as enough by some magic spell, not by the lure of her splendid womanhood, but by that and something else, something that was like the country of which she spoke so passionately, and he remembered wondering if this girl could talk. He relieved the tense strain of the situation by holding out the reins and saying with a whimsical smile, Here, you can drive. She caught his meaning and smiled in acknowledgment. Thank you, but I don't want to drive. That's really the man's part, you know. I suppose, she added, that you think me bold and mannish and coarse and everything else that a girl ought not to be, but I... She turned away her face and her voice trembled. But you can't understand, Mr. Holmes, what this desert means to me. Perhaps I don't understand, he said seriously, but I am sure of this. Somewhere back of every really great work that's ever been accomplished in any age, there has been a woman like you. Then they drove back to the hotel where she left him and drove to the barn herself. A few minutes later he saw her pass again, riding her own quick-stepping horse. During the two weeks that followed before the seer's return, while Abe Lee was busy getting ready for the work in Barbara's desert, Willard Holmes and the girl were often together. The man from New York admitted somewhat proudly, Barbara thought, as if the very confession somehow established the superiority of the East, that he was shockingly ignorant of all things Western. But apparently overlooking the subtle assumption in the manner of his confession, she laughingly undertook his education. For one thing, he must learn to ride. Really, he demurred, I don't think I care for that particular amusement. I've never taken it up at home, you know. But of course, if it is the thing to do, I... Amusement? Amusement, she laughed. Riding isn't an amusement, it's a necessity. The horse is our streetcar and railroad and steamboat. Where you think city blocks and squares, we think miles. And where you think miles, we think hundreds of miles. Two legs are not enough in this country, so we double the number and go on four. You'll find yourself wishing for eight before you get back from the King's Basin. So at her bidding, Texas Joe secured a horse for him, and almost every afternoon the two were in their saddles. And every night over his evening cigar at the hotel, the engineer found himself reviewing the incidents and conversations of the ride, forced to wonder at some new and unexpected revelation of the mind and character of this western girl, who was so interested in the reclamation work and so unconscious of her womanly power. He came quickly to look forward to their hours together and to plan and carry out many conversational experiments. Invariably, he had his reward. One afternoon, he tried skillfully to shape the conversation to the end that he might tell her, quite without ostentation, of the proud history and social position of his family and of his own rank in this upper eastern world. She humored him patiently, helping him out with questions and artless, admiring exclamations and comments, until he was quite sure that she was properly impressed. Then she said, in a tone of honest sympathy, But you mustn't let all this worry you, you know. Worry me, he echoed in amazement. She nodded seriously, but with a glint of mischief in her eyes. Yes, I can understand that it must be hard for a man to do his work handicapped as you are, but no one away out here will count it against you. 
Every man here has a chance, no matter what his past has been. You see, we don't care what a man has been or what his fathers were. We accept him for what he is and value him for what he can do. So all you need to do is to forget and go straight ahead with your work, and you'll easily live it down. Only, of course, she added gently, I wouldn't advise you to tell everybody what you've told me. Some might not understand. He retorted warmly, Of course you cannot understand our point of view. Everything is so new and raw cut here that you have no social standards. New and raw? She laughed again. Why, Mr. Holmes, you're the only new thing in this country. You see that man over there? They were riding south on the road that follows the river, and she pointed to an Indian who sat idly in the shade of his pole-and-mud hut. What's the matter with him? asked the engineer. Nothing. Only he, too, has ancestors. Ages and ages before your forefathers knew that this continent existed, that man's people lived in a city not far from here, a city with laws, customs, religions, social standards, yes, and civil engineers, for you can easily trace the lines of their canals in which they brought water from the river and carried it through a tunnel in the mountains to irrigate their land, just as you modern engineers are planning to do. The seer and I rode over there once, and he told me about it. I'll show you if you like. Knew why the West was ages old before the East was discovered. The seer says that if Columbus had come first to the western coast, New England today would still be an uninhabitable, howling wilderness. But I don't see what all this has to do with social standards, he said, needled at her reply. Simply this, if a man's position in life is to be fixed by the age of his family or the number of years that they have occupied a certain section of the country, then that Indian is your superior. His ancestors lived here long before yours settled in New England. But we are proud of our ancestors because of what they were and what they accomplished. We have a right to be. Think of what the world owes them. Oh, I must have misunderstood you. You seem to place so much emphasis on their having come over in the Mayflower. They were grand, those brave old pioneers. I'm proud of them, too, for what they were. And did they have social positions by which they fixed a man's place in life, I wonder? Of course, they could not have had the society with the wealth and culture that we have now. The country was all new. Something like the West is today, I suppose. She laughed aloud. And you are proud of them. How fine. Isn't it splendid to think it in two or three hundred years when the West has been civilized and the desert reclaimed as your pioneer forefathers civilized and reclaimed the East, when wealth and culture have come, a man's social standing will be determined by his relation to us, and people will be proud of what we are doing. After all, Mr. Holmes, the only difference between the East and the West seems to be that you have ancestors and that we're going to be ancestors. You look back to what has been. We look forward to what will be. You are proud and take rank because of what your forefathers did. We are proud and take rank because of what we are doing. And we're doing exactly what they did. Honestly now, which would you rather? Worship an ancestor, or be an ancestor worshipped. When they laughed together over this, he said, I am beginning to understand, Miss Worth, that the ideal American, whom we are always hearing about but never meet, must be a Westerner. He couldn't possibly be of the East, could he? His words were almost a sneer. The ideal American is neither Eastern nor Western in the way you mean, Mr. Holmes. He is both. Indeed, you admit that we of the East could give him something then. You could give him all that your forefathers have given you. And what could the West give him? She looked at him steadily a moment before answering slowly. 
I think you will have to find that out for yourself. He was taken a little aback by her answer. It sounded as though she wished to end the conversation, but her talk had stirred him strongly, though he tried to hide this under cover of a cynical tone. He said triumphantly, But you see, after all, you admit that one is not altogether hopeless because he happens to come of a good family. Certainly I admit it, she cried. But don't you see what I mean? Ancestors are to be counted as a valuable asset, but not as working capital. As she spoke, she turned toward him again with that steady look, and the man felt the strange, mysterious power of her personality, the challenging lure of her young womanhood, that and more. What was it back of those steady eyes that called to him, inspired him, that almost frightened him? that made him feel as Barbara herself felt in the presence of the desert. There was no trace of cynicism in his voice now, nor any hint of a sneer on his face as Willard Holmes straightened unconsciously in his saddle. "'Bye, George,' he said. "'It's good to hear you say those things. Nobody talks that way nowadays. I suppose our great-great-grandmothers did, though.' She colored with pleasure, but answered lightly. That puts me a long ways behind the times, doesn't it? Or a long way ahead, he offered. In the meantime, while the education of Willard Holmes progressed, the party that was to make the first survey of Barbara's desert was being formed and equipped under the direction of Abe Lee. Horses, mules, wagons, camp outfits and supplies with Indian and Mexican laborers teamsters of several nationalities, and here and there a Chinese cook, were assembled. Toward the last, from every part of the great West Country, came the surveyors and engineers, sunburned, khaki-clad men, most of them toughened by their out-of-doors life, overflowing with health and good spirits. They hailed one another joyously and greeted Abe with extravagant delight, overwhelming him with questions. For the word had gone out that the seer, beloved by all the tribe and his lieutenant, almost equally beloved, were making big medicine in the King's Basin Desert. Not a man of them would have exchanged his chance to go for a crown and scepter. The Eastern engineer met these hardened professional brothers cordially. He listened to their remembrances of life and work in the mountain, plain and desert with interest, discovering to his surprise that most of them were Eastern-born and bred, with technical training in the schools with which he was familiar. But their almost boyish enthusiasm over the work ahead, their admiration for the chief and for Abe Lee, he viewed with cold indifference. With all his duties, Abe found frequent opportunity to report to Barbara for the girl's interest in every detail of the preparations was never failing. Her friends protested that they never saw her now at their little social affairs, for she was always off somewhere with some engineer, and that when they did chance to catch her alone, she would talk of nothing but that horrid King's Basin country. Every evening, early after supper, the surveyor would slip away from his companions at the hotel to spend an hour on the veranda at the banker's home, talking in his straightforward way with Barbara and her father of the work that was so dear to the heart of the girl. And because it was his work, and in the nature of a report to one who, he felt, had in some subtle way authority to hear, Abe talked with a freedom that would have astonished many of his friends who thought they knew him best. Three times while Abe was there, Willard Holmes appeared, and each time, at the engineer's presence, the surveyor's painful diffidence became apparent, and he soon, with some stammering excuse, left. The last time this happened, Barbara walked down to the gate with the painfully embarrassed surveyor. Everything was in readiness for the coming of the chief who would arrive the next day, and the following morning the expedition would start for the field. Buenos noches, hermano. Good night, brother. 
called Barbara, as the tall surveyor walked away down the street. Buenos noches, came the answer. Willard Holmes heard and frowned. You seem to be very fond of Spanish, Miss Worth, he said when the girl came back to the porch. I notice you use it so often with our long friend there. Barbara laughed at his evident displeasure. The language seems to belong so to this country. To me its colors are all soft and warm, like the colors of the desert. I never thought of it before, but I suppose I use it so often with Abe because he, too, seems to belong to this country. The engineer looked at her curiously. I don't think I quite see the connection. You mean that he has Spanish blood? Not at all, said Barbara quickly. But he is desert-born and desert-trained. He has the same patient stillness, the same natural bigness, and the same unconquerable hardness. Oh, but you say the desert's not unconquerable, that it will be subdued. Your analogy is at fault. No, Mr. Holmes, it is you who do not understand. There's something about this country that will always remain as it is now. Abe Lee is like that. Whatever changes may come, he will always be ably of the desert. Your views are really poetical, and your character analyses very clever, Miss Worth. But after all, men are men, wherever you find them. Human nature is the same the world over. Oh, I'm sure that is so, Mr. Holmes. I know there must be many Western men in the East, only they haven't found themselves yet. He laughed heartily as he rose to go. Will you ever bid me good night in your language of the desert? he asked. Perhaps when you have learned that language, she said with an answering smile. By George, I shall try to learn it, he answered. Oh, I wish you would, came the earnest answer. I know you could. And again the engineer felt strongly back of her words that unvoiced appeal. As he went down the street, he knew that she did not refer to the Spanish tongue when she wished him to learn the language of her desert. Alone in her room that night, Barbara's mind was too active for sleep, and she sat for a long time by the open window, looking out into the vast, silent world under the still stars. Until she introduced herself to Willard Holmes, Barbara had never known Eastern people. Tourists she had seen, and at rare intervals, met in a casual way, but they had always examined her with such frankly curious eyes that she had felt like some strange animal on exhibition and had repaid their interest with all the indifference she could command. Occasionally, also, she had been introduced to Eastern businessmen, whom she chanced upon talking with her father in the bank but they had turned quickly away to the matters of their world after the usual polite nothings demanded by the introduction. The home life and life of Willard Holmes were as foreign to her as her land and life were strange to him. So it happened in this instance also that in the education of the Eastern engineer the teacher learned quite as much as the pupil. The traits that stood out so prominently in the Western men whom Barbara knew and so much admired were, in Willard Holmes, buried deeply under the habits and customs of the life and thought of the world to which he belonged, buried so deeply that the man himself scarcely realized that they were there, and so was led to wonder at himself when his blood tingled with some strong presentation to this western girl's views. But Barbara knew. Beneath the conventionalities of his class, the girl felt the man a powerful character, with all the latent strength of his nation-building ancestors. She wanted him, as she put it to herself, to wake up. Would he? Would he learn the language of her desert? She believed that he would, even as she believed in the reclamation of the king's basin lands. And she was glad, glad that the seer and Abe and Tex and Pat and her father, the men who had brought her out of the desert, were going now back into that land of death to save that land itself 
from itself. And, she whispered it softly under the stars, she was glad, glad that Willard Holmes had come to go with them to learn the language of her land. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Eight: Why Willard Holmes Stayed. Slowly, day by day, the surveying party under the seer pushed deeper and deeper into the awful desolation of the King's Basin Desert. They were the advance force of a mighty army ordered ahead by good business, the master passion of the race. Their duty was to learn the strength of the enemy, to measure its resources, to spy out its weaknesses, and to gather data upon which a campaign would be planned. Under the seer, the expedition was divided into several smaller parties, each of which was assigned to certain defined districts. Here and there, at seemingly careless intervals in the wide expanse, the white tents of the division camp shone through the many-colored veils of the desert. Tall, thin columns of dust lifted into the sky from the water wagons that crawled ceaselessly from water hole to camp and from camp to water hole hung in long clouds above the supply train laboring heavily across the dun plain to and from rubio city or rose in quick puffs and twisting spirals from the feet of some saddle horse bearing a messenger from the chief to some distant lieutenant every morning from each of the camps squads of khaki-clad men bearing transit and level stake pole and flag the weapons of their warfare, put out in different directions into the vast silence that seemed to engulf them. Every evening the squads returned, desert-stained and weary, to their rest under the lonesome stars. Every morning the sun broke fiercely up from the long level of the eastward plain to pour its hot strength down upon these pygmy creatures, who dared to invade the territory over which he had, for so many ages, held undisputed dominion. Every evening the sun plunged fiercely down behind the purple wall of mountains that shut in the basin on the west, as if to gather strength in some nether world for tomorrow's fight. Always there was the same flood of white light from the deep, dry sky that was uncrossed by a shred of cloud. Always the same wide, tawny waste, harshly glaring near at hand, filled with awful mysteries under the many-colored mist of the distance, until the eyes ached and the soul cried out in wonder at it all. Always there were the same deep nights with the lonely stars so far away in the velvet-purple darkness, the soft breathing of the desert, the pungent smell of greasewood and salt bush, the weird quavering call of the ground owl, or the wild coyote course, as if the long-lost spirits of long-ago savage races cried out a dreadful warning to these invaders. And in all this the land made itself felt against these men in the silent menace, the still waiting, the subtle call, the promise, the threat and the challenge of La Palma de la Mano de Dios. To Barbara, who rode often in these days to the very rim of the basin, there to search the wild, wide land with straining eyes for signs of her friends, the white glare of the camps was lost in the bewildering maze of color. The columns, clouds, and spirals of dust, save perhaps from a near supply wagon coming in or passing out, 
could not be distinguished from the whirling dust devils that danced always over the hot plains. The toiling pygmy dots of the little army were far beyond her vision's range. It was as though the fierce land had swallowed up horses, wagons, and men. Only through the frequent letters brought by the freighters did she know that all was going well. Perhaps the gray lizard that climbed to the top of a line stake wondered at the strange new growth that had sprung so suddenly from the familiar soil, or perhaps the horned toad, scuttling to cover, marveled at the strange sounds as the stakes were driven and man called to man figures and directions. Perhaps the scaly sidewinder, springing his warning rattle at the approaching step, questioned what new enemy this was, or the lone buzzard, wheeling high overhead, watched the tiny moving figures with wondering hopefulness, and the coyote, that hushed for a little his wild muse to follow up the wind, this strange new scent, laughed at the seer's dream. These lines of stakes that every day stretched farther and farther into and across the waste seemed in the wilderness of the land pitifully foolish. Looking back over the lines, the men who set them could scarcely distinguish the way they had come. But they knew that the stakes were there. They knew that some day that other mightier company, the main army, would move along the way they had marked to meet the strength of the barren waste with the strength of the great river and take for the race the wealth of the land. The sound of human voices was flat and ineffectual in that age-old solitude, but the speakers knew that following their feeble voices would come the shouting, ringing, thundering course of the life that was to follow them into that silent land of death. With the slow passing of the weeks came the trying out and testing of character inevitable to such a work. The concealing habits of civilization were dropped. Kindly, useful conventionalities were lost. Face to face with the unconquered forces of nature, nothing remained but the real strength or weakness of the individual himself. In some, there were developed unguessed powers of endurance that bore the hard days without flinching, cheerful optimism that laughed at the appalling immensity of that task, strength of spirit that made a jest of galling discomforts, courage that smiled in the face of dangers. These were the strength of the party. Some there were who grew sullen, quarrelsome, and vicious in a kind of mad rebellion. These must be held in check, controlled and governed by the seer with the assistance of Abe Lee and his helpers. Some became silent and moody, faint-hearted and afraid. These were strengthened and guarded and given fresh courage. Some grew peevish and fretful, whining and complaining. These were disciplined wisely, forced gently into line. Some staggered and fell by the way. These were sent back and the ranks closed up. But the work, always the work, went on. To Willard Holmes, the life was a slow torture, a revelation and an education. He found himself stripped of everything upon which he was accustomed to rely. Family traditions, social position, influential friends, scholarship, experience in the world to which he was born. All these were nothing in the hollow of God's hand. Slowly he learned that the power of such wealth is limited to certain fields. New York was very far away. He felt that he had been hopelessly banished to a strange world. Many times he would have thrown it all up and turned back with other deserters, but there was red blood in his veins. Stubborn pride and the thought of the girl who had hoped he would learn the language of her country enabled him to hold on. 
Once he ventured to speak to the chief in a hopeless voice of the evident impossibility of ever converting that terrible land into a habitable country, and the seer, strong in the strength of his dream, had looked at him from the still depth of his brown eyes without a word, looked until the younger man had turned away, his cheeks flushed with shame and his spirit doing homage to the strength of the master spirit of the work. And the eastern engineer remembered with new understanding his talks with Barbara Worth. When they pulled the dead coyote from the only water hole within two days' travel, and Holmes nearly fainted at the sickening sight, it was Texas Joe who saved the day for him by remarking with an air of philosophical musing, after the deep draught of the tepid, tainted water. It ain't so bad as you might think, Mr. Holmes. Once your old factory nerves have become somewhat regulated to the aroma, and your palate has been educated to the point of appreciating the deliciously foreign flavor, in the judgment of some connoisseurs, it has several points the lead of them imported fancy drinks you get in Frisco. When a Mexican died horribly from the bite of a rattlesnake, and Holmes himself was barely saved from a like fate by the prompt action and ready knowledge of Abe Lee, it was the slow smile of the desert-bred surveyor that stiffened him to go on. And when he was nearly beaten by a three-day sandstorm so searching that even the flapjacks and bacon gritted in his teeth, and his bloodshot eyes smarted in his head like coals of fire, and his skin felt as though it had been sandpapered when he would have sold his soul for a bath, and actually began to get his things together in readiness for the next wagon out. It was Pat, who, with the devilish ingenuity of an Irish imp, mocked and jeered him for a quitter, fit to act only as lady's maid or to serve soft drinks in the corner drug store, until his fainting heart took fire, and, cursing his tormentor with all the oaths he could muster, he offered to whip single-handed the whole grinning camp, and stayed. Thus he was advanced to the second degree, when he began to sense the spirit of the untamed land and of the men who went to meet it with sheer joy of the conquest. When he began to glory in the very greatness of the task, and the long dormant spirits of his ancestors stirred within him as he caught glimpses of the vision that inspired the seer, or perhaps it should be written, the vision that tempted his employers, James Greenfield and his fellow capitalist. He was still far from ready for the final degree, but even that might come. Through all those hard days, Jefferson Worth moved with the same careful, precise, certain manner that distinguished him in his work at home. Even the desert sun that so tanned, blistered, and blackened the faces of his companions could not mark the gray pallor of that mask-like face. No disturbing incident or unforeseen difficulty could wring from him an exclamation or change the measured tones of his colorless voice. He seemed to accept everything as though he had foreseen, carefully considered, and dismissed it from his mind before it came to pass. Day after day he rode in every direction over the land within easy reach of the many camps familiarizing himself with every detail of the work, observing soil, studying conditions, poring over maps and figures with the seer, verifying estimates, listening to and taking part in the many councils of the leaders. But not once did anyone catch a hint of what was going on behind those expressionless blue eyes that seemed to see everything without effort and to be incapable of expressing the emotions of the soul within. To the men, he was the visible representative of that invisible power that willed their going forth. He was capital, money, business incarnate. 
they set him apart as one not of their world. In his presence laughter was hushed, jests were unspoken. Silently they waited for him to speak first. When he conversed with them, they answered thoughtfully in subdued tones, seeming to feel that their words were received by one who placed upon them undreamed-of values. Filled as these men were with the enthusiasm of their work, they were never unconscious of the knowledge that but for the power represented by Jefferson Worth, their work would be impossible. Small wonder, then, that there was consternation in the headquarters camp that night when Pat appeared, hat in hand, before the company of leaders in the seer's office tent. "'I beg your pardon, sir.' "'What is it, Pat?' asked the seer, and all eyes were turned upon the burly Irishman, whose face and voice, as well as his presence at that hour, betrayed some unusual incident. "'Tis this, sir. Has anyone seen Mr. Worth this evening?' Every head was shaken negatively. "'Was he not at supper with you gentlemen?' "'Why, no, he was not,' returned the seer. "'But it is nothing unusual for him to be late. Have you asked the cook?' "'We have, sir. You see, when it come time to turn in, and he hadn't showed up, and Tex seen that his horse was with the bunch, we got a bit uneasy-like. We asked the cook, and we been to his tent.' and we asked them in. Perhaps he has put up at one of the other camps, suggested the surveyor. That's not like, sir, for he rode eastward this morning. Me and Tex watched him go, and there's nary a camp in that direction, as we all know. He surely intended to return here, or he would have told us, said the seer. You know how careful he is. What do you think, Abe? Before Abe could answer, a Mexican ran up, and Pat, turning, hauled him into the tent by the neck. "'What the hell is it, you greaser? Senior Texas, send me quick!' the little brown man panted, bowing low to the company, sombrero in hand. "'Senior Worth's horse, he just come. In the saddle is no one. Senior Worth is not come. I think he is gone.' Before the Mexican finished speaking, there was a rush of feet, and he was alone. With a shrug of his shoulders and a flash of his white teeth, he turned leisurely to follow, saying half aloud, It is all in la palma de la mano de Dios in your worth. Maybe so you come back, maybe this time not. He stood for a moment looking into the black vault of the night, then with another shrug retired to his blanket to sleep. Abe Lee was first to reach the corral, where Texas Joe, by the light of a lantern, was examining Mr. Worth's horse. No word was exchanged between them, while the surveyor, in turn, looked carefully over the animal. The others, coming up, stood silently, a little apart, waiting for the word of these two. "'What do you make of it, Abe?' asked the seer when the long surveyor turned toward him. Deliberately rolling a cigarette, Abe answered from a cloud of smoke. He's left a foot, too far out to walk in, likely. We'll go for him in the morning. A startled exclamation came from Willard Holmes, but no one heeded as the surveyor turned to Texas Joe. How do you figure it, Tex? The same, came the laconic answer. This year Paiuse wasn't broke to stand. He must have been tied somewheres. "'cause the reins are busted.' "'He pointed to the pieces of leather hanging from the bit. "'The canteen is gone. "'Jefferson Worth is too old a hand in the desert to leave it on the horse. "'He likely tied the pony to a bush and went to climb a hill or something. "'Mr. Hoss breaks loose and pulls for home. "'It happened a good way out, "'cause the pony is pretty well tired.' which he wouldn't have been, traveling light, if Mr. Worth hadn't ridden some distance before it happened, and if he was nearer, the pony would have been in earlier. He'll likely show us a smoke in the morning, and even if he don't, it'll be easy to trail him, because there ain't no wind. Will I go, sir? He looked at the chief. 
Yes, you and Abe, don't you think? Abe assented, and the men turned toward the tents while Texas led the tired horse away. The New York engineer approached the chief. Do I understand, sir, that you propose to do nothing until morning? The seer faced him. There is nothing to do, Mr. Holmes, he said simply. Willard Holmes was amazed at the man's apparent unconcern. Nothing to do, he exclaimed. Why don't you arouse the men and send them in every direction to search? Why, man, don't you realize the situation? Mr. Worth may be hurt. He may even be dying alone out there. I protest. It's monstrous. It's cowardly. Inhuman to do nothing. The company, attracted by the loud words, paused. Abe Lee, standing beside his chief, rolled another cigarette while the engineer was speaking. The seer answered patiently. But, Mr. Holmes, we could accomplish nothing by such a search as you suggest. The territory is too large to cover with a hundred times the number of men we have in camp. At daylight, when they can follow his trail... Abe and Tex will ride to him as fast as their horses can go. Granting that the worst you suggest may be true, our plan is the only sane way. But I protest, sir, you should make the attempt. I will not submit to idly doing nothing while a life is in danger, particularly that of a man like Mr. Worth. I shall go alone if no one will help me. And, he straightened himself haughtily, I shall report this to Mr. Greenfield and the men interested with him in this work. At the last words, one of those rare changes swept over the big engineer, and the witness saw a side of the chief's nature that was seldom revealed. His eyes flashed and his face hardened as he burst forth in tones that startled his hearers. Report me? You? Report and be damned, sir. I was old at this work when you were a sucking babe. These men were learning the desert when you were attending a fashionable dancing school. Why, you damn lily-fingered tenderfoot, you couldn't find your way five hundred yards in this country without a guide or a compass. Now, sir, I am running this outfit, and if you have any protests against my cowardly inhumanity, I advise you to smother them in your manly breast." or by hell I'll ship you out on the first wagon tomorrow morning and let you report to Greenfield that you were fired because you didn't know your work yourself and hadn't intelligence enough to listen to those who did. The chief paused for breath, and Willard Holmes, whose experience with large corporations was expected to make him particularly valuable to the capitalist who sent him out, turned away with what dignity he could command. Holy mutter, came a hoarse whisper from Pat to Abe. I made sure the poor boy would shrivel up. Such a blithering, blistering tongue lashing would scorch the hide of the old devil himself. He looked admiringly after the seer. Do you think now that the poor lad will be after tackling the job alone, like he said? Sure, it's nerve he has all right but he lacks judgment. Yes, he has the nerve, all right, returned Abe slowly, and we'd better keep an eye on him. Tell Tex. Willard Holmes knew that he owed his chief an apology, and he promised himself to make it in the morning. But neither the explanation of the seer nor the bitter humiliation that he had brought upon himself could turn his thoughts from Mr. Worth alone on the desert. To sleep was impossible. The banker might be... As he tossed his blankets, the engineer pictured to himself a hundred things that might have happened to Barbara's father. It was some two hours later when Pat touched Abe Lee on the shoulder. All right, Pat, said the surveyor, fully awake and in possession of all his senses in an instant. There's a light bobbing off into nowhere, and the lad's blankets are empty. Fifteen minutes later, a quiet voice within three feet of Willard Holmes asked, Shall I go with you, sir? 
The eastern man jumped like a nervous woman. He had not heard the approach of the surveyor, who walked with the step of an Indian. I couldn't sleep, he explained. I thought I would follow the tracks a little way out, at least. He may not be so far away as you think. After Abe had taken time to make his cigarette, he spoke meditatively. Mr. Worth rode a horse. I understand that, returned the man with the lantern tartly. I saw him go this morning, and I saw the horse tonight. This is the track. From another cloud of smoke came the quiet, respectful answer. But this is a mule's track, Mr. Holmes. It is Manuel Ramirez's mule. See, he has a broken shoe on the off forefoot. I noticed it yesterday when I sent Manuel to Hunter Waterhole. Besides, Mr. Worth rode northeast, not in this direction. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Nine: The Master Passion, Good Business. When Jefferson Worth left headquarters camp that morning, his purpose was to ride over a part of the territory lying southeast of the old San Felipe Trail between the sand hills and the old beach line. He had covered practically all of the land on the western side of the ancient seabed, from the Delta Dam at the southern end north to the lowest point in the basin, and southward again on the eastern side as far as the old trail. It remained for him to see only this section of the southeast. It was nearly noon when the banker, from a slight elevation that afforded him a view of the surrounding country, recognized the group of sand hills, and, by the general course of Dry River, distinguished the spot where the San Felipe Trail crosses the deep arroyo. Occupied with his thoughts, he had ridden farther from camp than he had realized. He should turn back. But the distant scene of the desert tragedy called him. He became possessed of a desire to visit once more the spot that was so closely associated with the child who had so strangely come into his life and whom he loved as his own daughter. An hour later he dismounted to stand beside the water hole where, with his companions, he had found the dead woman with the empty canteen by her side. The incidents of that hour were as vivid in the banker's memory as if it had all happened only the day before. He remembered how Texas Joe had lifted the canteen and, inverting it, had held out to them his finger, moistened with the last drop of water in the cloth-covered vessel, and how he and his companions standing by the dead body of the woman, had turned to each other in startled awe at the coyote's ghostly call in the dusk. He heard again with thrilling clearness the baby's plaintive voice. Mama, Mama, Barbara wants drink. Please bring drink, Mama. Barbara's afraid. Going a short way up the wash, he stood with uncovered head on the very spot where he had knelt with outstretched hands before the big-eyed, brown-haired baby girl, who, crouching under the high bank, shrank back from him in fear. He saw the frightened look in her eyes and heard the sweet voice cry, Go away! Go away! Go away! Then he saw the expression on the little face change as Pat and Tex and the boy tried to reassure her, saw her hold up her baby hands in full confidence to the big engineer, and felt again the pain and humiliation in his heart. Why had the baby instinctively feared him? Why had she turned from him to the seer? Why, he asked himself bitterly, had she always feared him? Why did she still shrink from him? 
for Barbara did shrink from him unconsciously, unintentionally. But to Jefferson Worth, none the less plainly now than when he knelt before her that night in the desert. And it hurt him now, as it had hurt him then. Hurt the more, perhaps, because Barbara did not know, because her attitude was instinctive. Still living over again the incidents and emotions of that hour in the desert night, he walked back to the crossing and, leading his horse, climbed the little hill out of the wash to the spot where, with Texas and Pat, he had rendered the last possible service to the unknown woman who had given her life for the life of the child, the child that was his, but not his. Long ago he had marked the grave with a simple headstone, bearing the only name possible, the one word, mother, and the date of her death. Then mounting again, he rode swiftly along the old trail toward the sand hills in the near distance. The great drifts in the years that had passed had been moved on by the wind until the wagon and all that remained of the half-buried outfit were now hidden somewhere deep in its heart. But the general form of the sand hill was still the same. Dismounting, Mr. Worth tied his horse to a scraggly, half-buried mesquite and, taking his canteen from the saddle, climbed laboriously up the steep, sandy slope. He would look over the country from that point and then make straight for camp, for it was getting well on in the afternoon. From the top of the hill he could see the wide reaches of the King's Basin Desert sweeping away on every side. At his feet... The bare sand hills themselves lay like huge, rolling, wind piled drifts of tawny snow, glistening in the sunlight with a blinding glare. Beyond these were the gray and green of salt bush, mesquite, and greasewood, with the dun earth showing here and there in ragged patches. Still farther away, the detail of hill and hummock and bush and patch was lost in the immensity of the scene while the dull tones of gray and green and brown were overlaid with the ever-changing tints of the distance, until, to the eyes, the nearer plain became an island surrounded on every side by a mighty, many-colored sea that broke only at the foot of the purple mountain wall. The work of the expedition was nearly finished. The banker knew now, from the results of the survey and from his own careful observations and estimates, that the seer's dream was not only possible from an engineering point of view, but from the careful capitalist standpoint would justify a large investment. Lying within the lines of the ancient beach, and thus below the level of the great river, were hundreds of thousands of acres, equal in richness of the soil to the famous delta lands of the Nile. The bringing of the water from the river and its distribution through a system of canals and ditches, while a work of great magnitude requiring the expenditure of large sums of money, was, as an engineering problem, comparatively simple. As Jefferson Worth gazed at the wonderful scene, a vision of the changes that were to come to that land passed before him. He saw first, following the nearly finished work of the engineers, an army of men beginning at the river and pushing out into the desert with their canals, bringing with them the life-giving water. Soon, with the coming of the water, would begin the coming of the settlers. Hummocks would be leveled, washes and arroyos filled, ditches would be made to the company canals, and in place of the growth of gray-green desert vegetation with the ragged patches of dun earth would come great fields of luxuriant alfalfa, billowing acres of grain, with miles upon miles of orchards, vineyards, and groves. The fierce desert life would give way to the herds and flocks and the home life of the farmer. The railroad would stretch its steel strength into this new world. Towns and cities would come to be where now was only solitude and desolation. 
and out from this world-old treasure-house vast wealth would pour to enrich the peoples of the earth. The wealth of an empire lay in that land under the banker's eye, and capital held the key. But while the work of the engineers was simple, it would be a great work, and it was the magnitude of the enterprise and the consequent requirement of large sums of money that gave capital its opportunity. Without water, the desert was worthless. With water, the productive possibilities of that great territory were enormous. Without capital, the water would not be had. Therefore, capital was master of the situation and, by controlling the water, could exact royal tribute from the wealth of the land. Knowing James Greenfield and his business associates as he knew them, familiar with their operations as he was, and knowing that they represented the power of almost unlimited capital, Jefferson Worth realized that they would plan to share in every dollar of wealth that the King's Basin lands would be made to produce. Already his trained mind saw how easily, with the vast power in their hands, this could be brought about. And these men, recognizing his peculiar value in such an enterprise as this, wanted him to join them. It was a triumphant moment in the life and business career of the Western banker, the culmination of long, hard years of unceasing toil of unfaltering devotion to business, of struggle and disappointments, of small victories and steady advance, gained at the cost of sacrifice and hard fighting. This proposed alliance with the great Eastern capitalist opened the door and invited him into the company of the real leaders of the financial world. As one of the powerful corporations that would literally hold the life of the future King's Basin in its hand, the multitudes of toilers who would come to reclaim the desert would be forced to toil not only for themselves, but for him. A part of every dollar of the millions that would be taken from that treasury by the labor of the people would go to enrich him. The financier's thoughts were interrupted by a sound. He turned to see his horse tugging at the bridle reins, snorting in fear. The man started quickly down the hill, but before he could cover half the distance that separated him from his mount, the frightened animal broke the reins and, wheeling about, disappeared down the trail on a wild run. At the same instant, a coyote trotted leisurely out from under the lee of the sand drift, and, with a side glance over his shoulder at the banker, slipped around the point of the next low ridge. The man knew that to catch his horse would be impossible. The animal would not stop until he reached his companions at the feed rack in camp. He knew also that to attempt to find his way to headquarters such a distance and on foot, with night so near at hand, would be worse than folly. He would only exhaust his strength and make it harder for his friends to find him before his water, which could not last another day, should give out. Someone, he knew, would take his trail in the morning. The only thing he could do was to wait, to wait alone in the heart of this silent, age-old, waiting land. Somewhere in those forgotten ages that went into the making of the King's Basin Desert, a company of free-born citizens of the land, moved by that master passion, good business, found their way to the banks of the Colorado. In time, good business led them to build their pueblos and to cultivate their fields by irrigation with water from the river and meet their rude altars to their now long-forgotten gods. Driven by the same passion that drove the Indians, the emigrant wagons moved toward the new gold country, and some financial genius saw good business as the river crossing near the site of the ancient city. At first it was no more than a ferry, 
but soon others with eyes for profit established a trading point where the overland voyagers could replenish their stock of supplies sure to be low after the hundreds of miles across the wide plains then also in obedience to good business pleasures heard the call saloons gambling houses and dance halls appeared and for profit the joys of civilization arrived in the savage land good business sent the prospectors who found the mines the capital that developed them and the laborers who dug the ore good business sent the cattle barons and their cowboys sent the speculators and the pioneer merchants good business sent also in the fullness of time jefferson worth of old New England Puritan stock, Worth had come through the hard life of a poor farm boy with two dominant elements in his character, an almost superhuman instinct for good business, inherited, no doubt, and an instinct, also inherited, for religion. The instinct for trade, from much cultivation, had waxed strong, and stronger with the years. The religion that he had from his forefathers was become little more than a superstition. It was his genius for business that led him, in his young manhood, to leave the farm, and it was inevitable that from making money he should come to making money, make more money. It was the other dominant element in his character that kept him scrupulously honest, scrupulously moral. Besides this, honesty and morality were also good business. Seeking always larger opportunities for the employment of his small, steadily increasing financial strength, Mr. Worth established the Pioneer Bank. Later, as he had foreseen, the same master passion brought the great railroad with still larger opportunities for his money to make more money. And now the same master passion that had driven the Indian, the immigrant, the miner, the cowman, the banker, and the railroad was driving the eastern capitalists to spend their moneyed strength in the reclamation of the King's Basin Desert. It was good business that led Greenfield and his friends to seek the cooperation of the western financier it was good business that called to Jefferson Worth now as he saw the immense possibilities of the land. As truly as the ages had made the barren desert with its hard, thirsty life, the ages had produced Jefferson Worth, a carefully perfected money-making machine, as silent, hard, and lonely as the desert itself. With apparently no vices, no passions, no mistakes, no failures, his only relation to his fellow men was a business relation. With his almost supernatural ability to foresee, to measure, to weigh and judge, with his cold, mask-like face and his manner of considering carefully every word and of placing a value upon every trivial incident, he was respected, feared, trusted, even admired, and that was all. No, not all. By those who were forced through circumstances, business circumstances, to contribute to his prosperity and financial success, he was hated. Such is the unreasonableness of humankind. Business to this man, as to many of his kind, was not the mean, sordid, grasping, and hoarding of money. It was his profession. But it was even more than a profession. It was the expression of his genius. Still more, it was, through him, the expression of the age in which he lived, the expression of the master passion that in all ages had wrought in the making of the race. He looked upon a successful deal as a good surgeon looks upon a successful operation. 
as an architect upon the completion of a building, or an artist upon his finished picture. But to a greater degree than to artist or surgeon, the success of his work was measured by the accumulation of dollars. Apart from his work, he valued the money received from his operations no more than the surgeon his fee, the artist his price. The work itself was his passion. Because dollars were the tools of his craft, he was careful with them. The more he succeeded, the more power he gained for greater success. But extremely simple in his tastes, lacking with his lack of education knowledge of the more costly luxuries of life, with the habits of an ascetic, Jefferson Worth could not evidence his success, and success hidden and unknown loses its power to reward. It is not enough for the engineer to run his locomotive. He must have trained loads of goods and passengers to carry to some objective point. It is not enough for the captain to have command of his ship. He must have a port. Self to Jefferson Worth meant little. His nature demanded so little. Nor could Mrs. Worth in this fill the need in her husband's life, for her nature was as simple as his own. But a child, whose life could be part of his life, filling out, supplementing, and complementing his own nature, a child who, dependent upon him, should have all the training that he lacked, who should share his success and for whom he could plan to succeed, a child, an heir, would fill the blank in his empty career. For a brief time he had looked forward to a child of his own blood. Then the death of the baby and the ill health of his wife had left him hopeless. He continued his work because he knew no life apart from his work. Then came the little girl, so strangely the gift of the desert. The banker's mind, trained to act quickly, had grasped the possibilities of the situation instantly as he ran with his companions to answer the call of that childish voice. From the moment when he knelt with outstretched hands and pleading words before little Barbara, he had never ceased trying to win her. Mrs. Worth, knowing that she could not be with him many years, had said, You need her, Jeff. And he did need her. But Jefferson Worth knew that Barbara was not his. She shrank from him as instinctively and unconsciously as she had drawn back that night of her mother's death when he knelt before her in the desert. As she had turned to the seer then, she turned from the banker now. And now, far more than then, his lonely heart hungered for her. For with the years his need of her had grown. Envied of foolish men, as men so foolishly envy his class, the banker knew himself to be destitute, an object of their pity. The poorest Mexican in his adobe hut, with his half-naked, laughing children, was more wealthy than he. Jefferson Worth, that afternoon on the very scene of the tragedy that had given Barbara to him, realized that in the land before him he faced the greatest opportunity of his business career. He realized also that he was as much alone in his life as he was alone in the silent, barren waste that surrounded him. Would La Palma de la Mano de Dios which had given him the child that was not his child, give him wealth that still never could be his. At last, from his place on the sand drift that held the secret of Barbara's life, he saw the sun as it appeared to rest for a moment on the western wall before plunging down into the world on the other side. Watching, he saw the purple of the hills deepen and deepen and the wondrous light on the wide sea of colors fades slowly out as the colors themselves paled and grew dim in the misty dusk of the coming night. Slowly the twilight sky grew dark, 
and into the velvet plain above came the heavenly flocks until their number was past counting, save by him who leadeth them in their fields. Against the lingering light in the west that marked where the day had gone, the mountains lifted their vast bulk in solemn grandeur, as if to bar forever the coming of another day. Closing about him on every hand, coming dreadfully nearer and nearer, the black walls of darkness shut him in. In the cool, mysterious breath of the desert, in the grotesque, fantastic nearby shapes and monstrous forms of the sand dunes, in the mysterious phantom voices that whispered in the dark, Jefferson Worth felt the close approach of the spirit of the land, the calling of the age-old waiting land, the silent menace, the voiceless threat, the whispered promise. And there alone, held close to the hollow of God's hand as the long hours of the night passed, the spirit of the man's Puritan fathers stirred within him. In the silent, naked heart of the desert that, knowing no hand but the hand of its creator, seemed to hold in its hushed mysteriousness the ages of a past eternity, he felt his life to be but a little thing. Beside the awful forces that made themselves felt in the spirit of Barbara's desert, the might of capital became small and trivial. Sensing the dreadful power that had wrought to make that land, he shrank within himself. He was afraid. He marveled that he had dared dream of forcing La Palma de la Mano de Dios to contribute to his gains. And so at last it was given him to know why Barbara instinctively shrank from him in fear. With the coming of the day, the banker went a little way back on the trail, where the vegetation was not entirely covered by the drifting sand, and there gathered materials for a fire. Later, when he judged his friends would be in sight, he fired the pile, and, watching the tall, thick column of smoke ascend, awaited the answer. In a little while it came, faint and far away, the report of Texas Joe's forty-five. Soon he heard the sound of voices calling loudly, and, following his answer, the swift hoofbeats of galloping horses, and Tex and Abe, leading another horse, appeared. But the Jefferson Worth, who rode back to camp with his friends, there to be greeted and congratulated by the party, was not the same Jefferson Worth who had left camp the morning before, though no one congratulated him because of that. It was three weeks later when a portly, well-fed gentleman entered the Pioneer Bank in Rubio City and asked of the teller, Is Mr. Worth in? The man on the other side of the counter looked through his grated window at the speaker with unusual interest, and in the teller's voice there was a shade of unusual deference as he replied, Yes, sir. Tell him that Mr. Greenfield is here. At the magic of that name, every man in the bank within sound of the speaker's voice lifted his head and turned toward the face at the window. Yes, sir. Come this way, sir. A door in the petition opened, and the visitor was admitted to the sacred precincts behind the gratings, the bars, and the plate glass. As he moved down the room past counters and desks, every eye followed him, and there was an electrical hush in the atmosphere, like the hush that marks the massing of the forces in nature before a conflict of the elements. Jefferson Worth looked up, as the imposing figure of the great financier appeared on the threshold of his room, and at the name of James Greenfield carefully pushed back the papers he had been considering and rose. The movement, slight as it was, was as though he cleared his desk for action. The clerk, withdrawing, carefully closed the door. The two men shook hands with much the air of two wrestlers, meeting for a bout. For a moment neither spoke. 
Each knew that in the silence he was being measured, estimated, searched for his weakness and his strength, and each gave to the other this opportunity as his right. No time was wasted in idle preliminaries. These men knew the value of time. No formal words expressing pleasure at the meeting were spoken. They tacitly accepted the fact that pleasure had not called them together. James Greenfield was a fair representative of his class. His full, well-colored face with carefully clipped gray mustache, bright blue eyes and gray hair, was the calmly alert, well-controlled, thoughtful face of power. Not the face of one who does things, but of one who causes things to be done. Not the face of one who is himself powerful, but of one who controls and directs power. Such a face as you may see leaning from the cab of a great locomotive that pulls the Overland Limited, or looking down at you from the bridge of the ocean liner. It was courageous, but with a courage not personal, a courage born of an exact knowledge of the strength and duty of every bolt, rivet, and lever of the machine under his hand. It was confident not in its own strength, but in the strength that it ruled and directed. Jefferson Worth motioned toward a chair at the end of his desk and seated himself. The man from the east found himself forced to make the opening. Mr. Worth, he said, we find it very difficult to understand your attitude toward our company. We do not see why you decline our proposition. Your own report gives every reason in the world why you should accept, and you suggest no reason at all for declining. Frankly, it looks a little strange to us, and I've come out to have a little talk with you over the matter and to see if we could not persuade you to reconsider your decision or at least to learn your reasons for refusing to go in with us. Your report and your answer to our proposition are so conflicting that we feel we have a right to some definite reason for your unexpected decision. As he spoke, the president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company tried in vain to see behind the mask-like face of the man in the revolving chair. His failure only excited his admiration and respect. Instinctively, he recognized the genius before him, and his desire to add this strength to his forces increased. My report was satisfactory. The words were absolutely colorless. Very. It was exactly what we wanted. With your opinion confirming our engineer's statements, we felt safe to go ahead with the organization of the company and have already set the wheels moving toward actual work. It is because you so unhesitatingly and so strongly commend the project as warranting our investment that we cannot understand your refusal to share the profits of our enterprise. He paused for an answer but was forced to continue. Let me explain more fully than I could outline in my letter just what we propose doing. The King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, Mr. Worth, will not confine its operations simply to furnishing water for the reclamation and development of these lands. That's no more than the beginning, the basis of our operations. With the settlement and improvement of the country will come many other openings for profitable investments. Town sites, transportation lines, telephones, electric power, banking, and all that, you understand. Our connections and resources make it possible for us to finance any industry or operation that promises attractive returns, while our position as the originators of the whole King's Basin movement and the owners of the irrigation system will give us tremendous advantage over any outside capital that may attempt to come in later and will make competition practically impossible. I figured that was the way you would do it, was the unemotional reply. More than ever, James Greenfield wanted this man. He considered carefully a few minutes, with no help from Jefferson Worth, then tried again. If you feel that our proposition to you is not liberal enough, Mr. Worth, 
I am prepared to double our offer. If the financier from New York thought to startle this little western banker with a proposal that was more than princely, he failed. His words seemed to have no effect. It was as though he talked to a marble figure of a man. I appreciate your proposition, but must decline it. May I ask your reason, sir? I must decline to give any. The other arose, the light of battle in his eyes, for to James Greenfield's mind there could be only one possible meaning in the answer. That is, of course, your privilege, Mr. Worth, he said coldly, and then with the weight of conscious power he added, But I'll tell you this, sir, if you think you can enter the King's Basin in opposition to our company, you're making the mistake of your life. We'll smash you with your limited resources so flat that you'll be glad for a chance to make the price of a meal. Good day, sir. Good day. Before the great capitalist was out of the building, Jefferson Worth was bending over the papers on his desk again as though declining to accept flattering offers from gigantic corporations was an hourly occurrence. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 10 Barbara's Love for the Seer. Jefferson Worth had not proceeded far with the work before him after James Greenfield left when he was again interrupted. This time it was the voice of Barbara in the other room. The banker lifted his head quickly. Again he pushed his papers from him, but now the movement seemed to indicate weariness and uncertainty rather than readiness for action. His head dropped forward, his thin fingers nervously tapped the arms of the chair. When the girl's step sounded at the door, he looked up the fraction of a second before she appeared. I don't want to disturb you, father, but they told me that that big, fine-looking man just going out was Mr. Greenfield. Is he... did he come all the way from New York to see you? He came in here to see me, said Jefferson Worth exactly. And the work? He says they've already started the wheels to moving. And you, Daddy? You? Jefferson Worth arose and carefully closed the door. Then, silently indicating the chair at the end of his desk, he resumed his seat. As Barbara looked into that mask-like face, the eager expectant light in her brown eyes died out, and a look of questioning doubt came. She seemed to shrink back from him, almost as she had turned away that first time in the desert. If Jefferson Worth felt that look, his face gave no sign. Only those thin, nervous fingers were lifted to caress his chin. Are you, are you going to help, Daddy? Will you join Mr. Greenfield's company? Still the man was silent, and the girl, watching, wondered what was going on behind the gray mask, what questions were being weighed and considered. At last he spoke one cold word. Why? Barbara flushed. Because, she answered carefully, because it is such a great work. You could do so much more than simply make money. That is, as you and the seer see it. But, Father, it is a great work, isn't it, to change the desert into a land of farms and homes for thousands and thousands of people? Do you think that Greenfield and his crowd are going under this scheme because it is a great thing for the people? But don't even capitalists sometimes undertake a great work just because it is great and because thousands upon thousands of people through years and years to come will be benefited even though the men themselves do not make so awfully much money? If Jefferson Worth felt her unconscious insinuation, his face gave no sign. Carefully, he listened with his manner of considering and weighing every word, 
while to Barbara his mind seemed to be reaching out on every side or running far into the future. When he answered, his words were carefully exact. Capitalist, as individuals might and do, spend millions in projects from which they personally expect no returns. But capital doesn't do such things. Anything that capital, as capital, goes into must be purely a business proposition. If anything like sentiment entered into it, that would be the end of the whole matter. Barbara moved uneasily. I don't think I quite understand why, she said. There was a shade of color now in the banker's voice as he explained by asking, How long do you think this bank could exist if we made loans to Tom, Dick, and Harry because they needed help? or put money into this and that scheme simply because it was a beneficial thing. How long would it be before we went to smash? But don't businessmen ever do anything except to make money? Doesn't capital, as you say, ever consider the people? This bank is a very substantial benefit to the people, but it can only benefit them by doing business on strictly business principles. As an individual... Any officer or stockholder can do what he pleases for whatever reasons move him. He can burn his money if he wants to. But as officers and directors of this corporation, we can't burn the capital of the institution. But Mr. Greenfield and these New York men, who also organize the company, are they not careful financiers? Very. It seems to me that they must believe in the seer and his work or they wouldn't furnish him with the money, would they? They believe in the seer and his work from their standpoint. Their capital is invested for just one purpose, dividends. Barbara sighed and moved impatiently. You always make it so hard to believe in men, Father. I can't think that all businessmen, all financiers, I mean, are so cold and heartless. Again, if Jefferson Worth felt the unconscious implication in her words, he gave no sign. The banker was not ignorant of the public sentiment toward himself and the men of his class in his profession. He had come to accept it with the indifference of his exact machine-like habit. Barbara continued, I feel sure that Mr. Greenfield and the men with him are going to furnish money for the seer to do this work for more than just what they would make out of it. I know that Mr. Holmes does, and I'd hoped that you, her voice broke, that you would... If only Jefferson Worth could have broken the habit of a lifetime. If he could have laid aside that gray mask and permitted the girl to look into his hidden life, perhaps... His colorless voice broke the silence coldly. Exact. What do you figure Willard Holmes is in this thing for? Barbara's face lighted up proudly. He's in the work for the same reason that the seer and Abe are, because it is such a great work and means so much to the world. I know because since he returned, he has talked to me so much about it. When he first came out, just at first, he didn't understand what the work really was. But now he understands it as the seer sees it. Did the seer send him out here? No, I believe Mr. Greenfield sent him. Why? I suppose they wanted an eastern man, whom they knew better than they knew the seer, to represent them. It would be very natural, wouldn't it? Very natural, agreed Jefferson Worth. Have you given the company your final answer, Father? Yes. And you... You won't have anything to do with the reclamation of my desert? I decline to join the company. Blindly, Barbara made her way out of the building. The place, with its air of business and suggestions of wealth, was unbearably hateful to her. At home, she ordered her horse and started for the open country. But she did not ride toward the desert. She felt she could not bear the sight of the king's basin that day. In her father's attitude toward the company, Barbara saw only his seeming desire for selfish gain. 
He had told her so often that only one thing could justify an investment of capital. Evidently, he did not think the King's Basin project would pay. She felt ashamed for him. He seemed so incapable of considering anything but profit. Nothing but profit, the sure promise of gain, could move him. He believed in the work. He had reported in favor of it to the company. He knew that the company was going ahead. He was willing enough that others should do the work, she thought bitterly. They might take the risk. It is even likely that he had some way planned by which, without risking anything himself, he would reap large returns through their efforts. She thought proudly of the seer who had given so many unpaid years to the reclamation work, of Abe and his loyalty to the seer, and of Willard Holmes, who was going to give himself to the work. Utterly sick at heart, the girl did not meet her father at their evening meal. She could not. Jefferson Worth ate alone, and alone spent the evening on the porch. On the way to his room, he paused a moment at her door. He knocked softly so as not to waken her if she was asleep. When there was no answer, he stole quietly away. But Barbara was not asleep. For three days, Mr. Greenfield remained in Rubio City, on the business of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, the paper said in a long article setting forth the greatness of the work that was to be undertaken in the desert through the magnificent enterprise of these mighty eastern capitalists. During that time, Barbara had not seen either the seer, Holmes, or Abe Lee. She understood that they were engaged with Mr. Greenfield. She read the glowing articles in the paper the afternoon of Mr. Greenfield's departure with a thrill of pride. At last it had come, the day for which the seer had hoped all these years, the dear old seer. She was a little disappointed that the papers did not give his name more prominence. It seemed to be all Greenfield and the company. But after all, that did not matter. It was the seer's work. The seer had brought it about. The front gate clicked, and Barbara looked up from the paper to see her old friend coming up the walk. She saw at a glance that something was wrong. She thought he was ill. The big form of the engineer drooped with weakness. His head dropped forward. His eyes were fixed on the ground, and he walked slowly dragging his feet as with great weariness. With a startled cry, she ran to meet him, and as he caught her hands in both his own, she saw his face drawn and haggard and his brown eyes filled with hopeless pain. He did not speak. Leading him to the shade of the porch, she brought forward his favorite chair. He sank into it as if overcome with exhaustion, but attempted to smile his thanks. What is it? Are you ill? Let me call a doctor. No, no, dear, I'm not sick. It's not that. I'm, I'm upset a bit, that's all. I'll be all right in a little while. Only it was rather unexpected. He turned his face away as though to hide something from her. What is it? Can't you tell me? What is the matter? Barbara had never seen the seer so hopeless. They've let me out. She did not understand. Let you out? He bowed his head slowly. Yes, the company, you know. They have appointed Mr. Holmes, chief engineer, in my place. She cried out in indignant dismay. But how could they? It is your work, all your work. You have given years to bring it before the world. They never would have known of the King's Basin at all, but for you, how dare they? They have no right. The engineer smiled. I was only an employee of Greenfield and the men who organized the company, you know. In their eyes, my relation to the work was the same as that of a Kokopo Indian laborer. Of course, it was understood in a general way that I was to have some stock in the company when it was organized, with the chief engineer's position at least, 
But there was nothing settled. Nothing could be settled until the actual completion of the survey, you know. I never dreamed of this. I can see now it was planned from the first, and that this is what Holmes came out here for. He's a great favorite of Greenfield's, and I suppose they wanted a man of their own kind to look after their interest. But it hurts, Barbara. It hurts. For an hour he stayed with her, and she helped him as such a woman always helps. But when she would have kept him for supper, he said, No, I must find Abe. I want to tell the boy and have it over. You can tell your father. When Jefferson Worth learned from his indignant daughter of the company's notion, he only said, in his precise way, I figured that would be their first move. There was no feeling in his voice or manner. It was the simple verification of conclusions already reached and considered. Father, cried Barbara, do you mean that you expected the company to put that man Holmes in the Sears place? What reason was there to expect anything else? But you never said anything all the time the seer was... She could not continue. It was maddening to think that while she had been dreaming and planning with the seer, her father had foreseen that their dreams would come to naught. If I had, you would not have believed me. The words were merely a calm, emotionless statement of fact. I told you that the company would act only from a business standpoint. Suddenly a new phase of the situation flashed upon Barbara. Controlling her emotions and searching her father's face, she asked, Daddy, tell me please, was it because you saw this that you refused to join the company? Jefferson Worth considered, then with marked caution answered, that was part of the reason. I think I begin to understand a little. I'm glad, glad that you would have nothing to do with those men. It would have killed me if you had had any part in this now. Presently the banker asked, Have you seen Abe Lee? No. Why? Do you think, have they discharged him too? He wouldn't stay anyway after their treatment of the seer. I wouldn't want him to. They won't let him out if they can keep him. Holmes will need him, said Worth. Then he added, You'd better tell Abe to stay. Barbara gasped. What do you mean? Tell him to stay, repeated Worth slowly. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 11 Abe Lee Resigns. In obedience to its master passion, good business, the race now began pouring its life into the barren wastes of the King's Basin Desert. In the city by the sea at the end of the southwestern and continental, there was a suite of offices with real gold letters on the ground glass door richly spelling the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company. Behind these doors there was real mahogany furniture, solid, substantial, and rich, a high safe, many attractive maps, and a gentleman who, never having traveled west of Buffalo before, could answer with authority every conceivable question relating to the reclamation of the arid lands of the Great West. When there were no more questions to ask, he could still tell you many things of the wonderland of wealth that was being opened to the public by the company, demonstrating thus beyond a possibility of a doubt how many times a dollar could be multiplied. From this office went forth to the advertising departments of the magazines and papers, skillfully prepared copy, which in turn was followed by pamphlets, circulars, and letters innumerable. In one room a company of clerks and bookkeepers and accountants poured over their task at desk and counters. 
In another, a squad of stenographers filled the air with the sound of their typewriters. Through the doors of the different rooms passed an endless procession, men from the front with the marks of the desert sun on their faces, engineers, superintendents, bosses, messengers, agents, servants of the company. Laborers of every sort and nationality came in answer to the cry, Men Wanted. Special salesmen from foundry, factory, and shop, drawn by prospective large sales of machinery, implements, and supplies. Land-hungry men from everywhere seeking information and opportunity for investment. At Deep Well, which is no well at all, on the rim of the basin, trainloads of supplies, implements, machinery, lumber and construction material, horses, mules, and men were daily sidetracked and unloaded on the desert sands. Overland travelers gazed in startled wonder at the scene of stirring activity that burst so suddenly upon them in the midst of the barren land through which they had ridden for hours without sight of a human habitation or sign of man. The great mountain of goods piled on the dun plain the bands of horses and mules, the campfires, the blankets spread on the bare ground, the men moving here and there in seemingly hopeless confusion, all looked so ridiculously out of place and so pitifully helpless. Every hour companies of men with teams and vehicles set out from the camp to be swallowed up in the silent distance. Night and day the huge mountain of goods was attacked by the freighters, who, with their big wagons drawn by six, eight, twelve, or more mules, appeared mysteriously out of the weird landscape as if they were spirits materialized by some mighty unknown genii of the desert. Their heavy wagons loaded, their water barrels filled, they turned again to the unseen realm from which they had been summoned. The sound of the loud voices of the drivers, the creaking of the wagons, the jiggle of harness, the shot-like reports of long whips died quickly away, while to the vision the outfits passed slowly, fading, dissolving in their great clouds of dust into the land of mystery. In Rubio City, Jefferson Worth continued on his machine-like way at the Pioneer Bank, apparently paying no heed to the movement that offered such opportunities for profitable investment. Barbara rarely spoke now of the work that had been so dear to her, nor did she ever ride to the foot of the hill on the mesa to look over the desert. The seer was in the northern railroad work again, but Abe Lee, with Tex and Pat and Pablo Garcia, had gone with the beginning of the stream of life that was pouring into the new country. True to the far-reaching plans of the company at the largest and most central of the supply camps, located in the very heart of the King's Basin, the town site of Kingston was laid out. And even in the days when every drop of water was hauled from three to ten miles, town lots were offered for sale and sold to eager speculators. A year from the beginning of the work at the intake at the river, water was turned into the canals. With the coming of the water, Kingston changed, almost between suns, from a rude supply camp to an established town with post office, stores, hotel, blacksmith shop, livery stables, all in buildings more or less substantial. Most substantial of all was the building owned and occupied by the offices of the company. With the coming of the water also, the stream of human life that flowed into the basin was swollen by hundreds of settlers, driven by the master passion, good business, to toil and traffic, to build the city, to subdue and cultivate the land, and thus to realize the seer's dream while the engineer himself was banished from the work to which he had given his life. Every sunrise saw new tent houses springing up on the claims of the settlers around the company town and new buildings beginning in the center of it all. 
Kingston. Every sunset saw miles of new ditches ready to receive the water from the canal and acres of new land cleared and graded for irrigation. Thus it was that afternoon when from his office window Mr. Burke, the general manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, watched a freighter with a twelve-mule load of goods stop his team directly across the street in front of the largest and most important general store in the basin. Dick Jordan, the merchant, came out, and the manager easily heard the driver's loud voice. Jim will be along in about another hour, I reckon. We aim to get the rest in two more trips. Six twelve-mule loads in that shipment, thought the company's manager, and that fellow set up business with a two-horse load of stuff. An empty wagon was driven up to the store, and the general manager recognized in the driver one of the company's men from a grading camp six miles away, while another wagon, the company wagon also, nearly filled with supplies, moved away toward the open desert. Deck's business was assuming quite respectable proportions, thought Mr. Burke, and Deck's business was mostly with employees of the company. Taking a cigar from a box on his desk, Mr. Burke scratched a match on the heel of his shoe and, leaning back in his office chair, continued thinking. The manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company was paid to think. The company hired Mr. Burke's peculiar talent even as they hired the physical strength of their laborers or the professional skill of their engineers. As he meditated, the manager still watched from the window the activities of the street. Soon from the open desert beyond the last new building down the street, he saw a horseman approaching. At an easy swinging lope, the rider came straight toward the company's headquarters, and as he drew near, the manager recognized the chief engineer. Greeting the man at the open window as he passed, Willard Holmes dismounted at the entrance of the building, and going first to the water tank, soon appeared in the doorway of the manager's room. The engineer's clothes from boots to Stetson were covered with dust, and his face was deeply bronzed by the months in the open air. Turning from the window, Mr. Burke held out the box of cigars. No thanks, said the chief with a smile. I'm hot as a lime kiln now. Wait until after supper. Throwing his hat and gloves on the floor, he dropped into a chair with a sigh of relief at the grateful coolness of the room after hours of riding in the dazzling light of the desert sun. The other, returning the box to its place, tipped back in his chair and elevated his well-dressed feet to his desk and, with his cigar in one corner of his mouth and his head cocked suggestively to one side, looked his companion over with a critical smile. "'I say, Holmes, how would you like to be in little old New York this evening?' At the question in the manner of the speaker, the engineer held up his hands with a motion of protest as he commanded, in tragic voice, "'Get thee behind me, Satan!' Then, at the manager's laugh, he added suddenly, "'New York is all right, Burke, but I guess I can manage to stick it out here a while longer.' Burke looked at the engineer with the same thoughtful expression that had marked his face when he watched the wagon load of supplies before the store across the street. "'I've noticed that you show symptoms of slowly developing an interest in your job,' he murmured. You were at the river yesterday. No, I was at number five heading. Abe Lee will be in from the intake this afternoon. I was there a day before yesterday. How is little old Colorado behaving herself? All right so far. Our work is all a guess, though. There's not a scrap of data to go on, you know. There was a hint of anxiety in the chief engineer's answer. I suppose you find the talkative Abe cheerfully optimistic about the future of our structures, as usual. 
Holmes did not smile at the jesting tone of the manager. Lee is certainly doing all he can to make things safe. He's a fiend for thoroughness, and between you and me, Burke, the company ought to spend more money on that intake, at least. A few more thousands would make it what it should be. The man who was paid to think held out a hand protestingly. My dear boy, how many times have we gone over that? The company will spend just what they must spend to get this scheme going, and not a cent more. Later, when the business justifies, they will improve the system. Don't get yourself sidetracked by the notion that this whole project is for the benefit of the dear people and that the company is made up of benevolent old gentlemen who have nothing to do with their wealth but promote philanthropic enterprises. You should know your Uncle Jim better. Dividends, my boy, dividends. That's what we're all here for, and you can't afford to forget it. By the way, did you have any dinner today? I struck Camp 7 on the Alamitos at noon. Uh-huh. Sour bread, sour belly, frijoles, or was it canned corn? I say, old man, do you remember some of the places where we used to dine at home? Flowers and music and table linen and real dishes and waiters with real food and women, God bless them, real women. What would you give tonight, Holmes, for something to eat that had never been preserved, embalmed, cured, dried, or tinned? It's not a dream of fairyland, my boy. There are such places in the world, and there are such things to eat. Come, what do you say? Where shall we dine tonight, and what will you have? You fiend, growled Holmes. You know I'd sell my soul this minute for one good red apple. Lowering his feet to the floor and rising, the manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company crossed the room stealthily and carefully closed the door. Then taking a bunch of keys from his pocket, with an air of great secrecy, he unlocked a drawer in his desk, pulled it open, and took out an apple. The company's chief engineer fell on the manager with an exclamation of amazement and delight. Really, said Burke, as he watched the fruit disappear. Your childlike pleasure almost justifies my crime. I even feel repaid for my self-denial. There were only three in the basket. How did you do it? asked Holmes between bites, gazing at the apple in his hand, as though to devour the treat with his eyes also, thereby doubling the pleasure. It was one of our dearly beloved prospective settlers, the thoughtful manager explained with an air of conscious merit. He came in from somewhere yesterday to spy out the land, and, being a prudent and thrifty farmer, he possesses, or is possessed by, a prudent and thrifty wife. Said wife fitted out said farmer for his journey into this far country with a market basket of provisions. Homemade provisions, Willard, my son. Homemade. A whole basketful. He had one feed left and was finishing it out there on the sidewalk when I returned from what we of this benighted land called dinner. How could I help looking? I watched him devour the leg of a chicken. I watched him eat real bread with jelly on it. Then I caught sight of three apples. Three Home such wealth as criminal. I considered. I became an anarchist. He was a big husky, and I dared not assault him, so I talked. Lord, forgive me. How I talked. I offered confidential advice. I conjured up visions of wealth untold. I laid him under a spell and gently led him and his basket into the office, even as he finished the pie. I showed him maps. I gave him a cigar. I urged him to leave his basket and satchel here in my private office for safekeeping while he looked around. Gladly he accepted my invitation. His confidence was pathetic. How could the poor trusting farmer know that I was ready, if necessary, to murder him for his fortune? When he had gone, I locked the door, and I, I, I only took two homes. I dared not take them all for he was big and rough, as I say. 
but I cannot believe that a man with such wealth could miss a part of it. But you said you ate, too, said the engineer severely, taking another long, lingering bite. I did, returned the manager, with awful solemnity. When that trusting but husky farmer returned later for his possession, he thanked me many times for my kindness, while I trembled with the consciousness of my guilt, assuring him that it was all no trouble at all. No trouble at all. And then, just as I felt sure that he was going and was beginning to breathe easier, he stopped and fumbled around in his basket. My heart stood still. Hannah put some fine apples in my dinner, he muttered. I thought maybe you might like some. Reckon I must have ate em after all. I thought there was... No, by jocks. Here she is. Holmes, as I live, he handed me that other apple. It was positively uncanny. I was speechless. Not until he was gone did I realize that it was prophetic. In like manner shall the settlers, the farmers, save this land and us from destruction. It's good business, returned Holmes. It exactly illustrates your methods of dealing with the confiding public. Ha! Huh, grumped the other. I observe that you do not hesitate to enjoy the fruits of my financiering. A knock at the door prevented the engineer's reply. Come in, called Burke. The door opened and Abe Lee stood on the threshold. The two men greeted the surveyor cordially, but with that subtle touch in their voices that hinted at consciousness of superior position and authority. Abe addressed himself directly to his chief, saying, We finished at the intake last night, sir, and moved to Dry River Heading this morning, as you directed. You left everything at the river in good shape, of course? The surveyor did not answer. The tobacco and paper that in his long fingers was assuming the form of a cigarette seemed to demand his undivided attention. Burke was thoughtfully watching the two men. At the critical moment, he handed Abe a match. From the cloud of smoke, Abe spoke again. The outfit will be ready to begin work at the heading tomorrow morning. Before Holmes could speak, the manager said, You evidently still think, Lee, that the work at the river is not satisfactory. Are you still predicting that our intake will go out with the next high water? I don't know whether the next high water will do it or not. The Rio Colorado alone won't hurt us, but when the Gilda and the Little Colorado go on the warpath and come down on top of a high Colorado flood, you'll catch hell. It may be this season, it may be next. It depends on the snowfall in the upper countries and the weather in the spring, but it has come, and it will come again. How do you know? There's been no records kept and no surveys. We have no data. There's data enough. The Colorado leaves her own record. I know the country. I know what the river has done, and I know what the Indians have told me. At the surveyor's words, his chief stirred impatiently, and the manager answered, But we can't spend twenty or thirty thousand dollars on a mere guess at what may happen, Lee. When the country is fairly well settled and business justifies, we will put in a new intake. In the meantime, those structures will have to do. The KBL and I is not in business for glory, you know. Abe spoke softly with a cloud of smoke. And are you explaining this situation to the people who are coming here by the hundreds to settle? Do they understand the chances they are taking when they buy water rights and go ahead to develop their ranches? Certainly not. If we talked risk, no one would come in. The company must protect its interest. Who protects the settler's interest? The manager stiffened. I don't recognize your right to criticize the company's policy, Lee. Mr. Holmes is our chief engineer, and he assures me that our structures are as good as can be made with the money at our disposal. We can only carry out the policies of the company, and we are responsible to them for the money we spend. 
You have no responsibility in the matter, whatever. Oh, hell, Burke, drawled Abe, though his eyes contradicted flatly his soft tone. There's no occasion for you to climb so high up that ladder. You've been a corporation mouthpiece so long, you have no more soul than the company. He turned to his chief. I left Andy in charge at camp. He understands that I will not be back. I dropped my resignation in your box in the office as I came in. Adios. Leaving the office, Abe walked slowly down the street through the heart of the country's little town. On every hand, he saw the work that was being wrought in the desert. There were business blocks and houses in every stage of building from the new laid foundation to the moving in of the tenants. The air rang with sound of hammer and saw. Teams and wagons from the ranches lined the street. The very faces of the people he met glowed with enthusiasm, while determination and purpose were expressed in their very movements as they hurried by. A mile west of town, the surveyor stopped on the bridge that spanned the main canal. He paused to look around. He saw the country already dotted with the white tent houses of the settlers, and even as he looked, three new wagons loaded with supplies and implements passed, bound for the claims of the owners. Under his feet, the water from the distant river ran strongly. To the west was a grading camp on the line of a company ditch. To the south was another. Far to the north and east, along the rim of the basin, he knew the railroad was bringing other pioneers by the hundreds. He drew a deep breath, and taking off his sombrero, drank in the scene. How he loved it all! It was the seer's dream, but the seer could have no part in it. It was Barbara's desert, but Barbara was shut out, exiled. It was his work, but he was powerless to do it. The seer had told him to stay for his work's sake. He smiled grimly, remembering the manager's words. Barbara had told him to stay, but the girl knew nothing of conditions. How could she know? Jefferson Worth had told him to stay. Why? Barbara, in her letters, never spoke of the work. The seer seldom wrote. Jefferson Worth never. Every month the situation had grown more unbearable. Burke might insist that he had no responsibility, and Holmes might argue that they could only do their best with what funds the company would supply. Abe was not of their school. Well, he was out of it now for good. He was not the kind of man the company wanted. Returning to town, he had supper at the little shack restaurant and, going to the tent house owned by himself and two brother surveyors that they might have a place to sleep when in town, he gathered his few possessions together in readiness for departure in the morning. When the brief task was finished and he had written a note to his two friends who were away, he went out again on the main street because there was nothing else to do. It was evening now, and the usual crowd was gathered in front of the post office to watch the arrival of the stage, the one event of never-failing interest to these hardy pioneers. In the throng there were teamsters, laborers, ranchers, mechanics, real estate agents, speculators, surveyors, gathered from camp and field and town. Some were expecting letters from the home folks in the world outside. A few were looking for friends among the passengers. Many were there, as was Abe, because it was the point of interest. All were roughly clad, marked by the semi-tropical desert wind and sun. It was among such men as these that Abe Lee's life had been spent. Such scenes as these were home scenes to him. In a peculiar way, through the seer and Barbara, the work that these men were doing was dear to him. He felt that he was being cast out of his own place. 
As he passed through the throng, Abe heard always the same topic of conversation. The work, the work, the work. News to these men meant more miles of canal finished, new ditches dug, more land leveled and graded, new settlers located. The surveyor thought of the future of these people given wholly into the hands of the company, of the men in the East who knew nothing of their hardships but who would force them to pay royal tribute out of the fruits of their toil, of how, even then, they were increasing the value of the company property. "'Here she comes!' cried someone, and all eyes were turned to see the stage swinging down the street. Abe drew back a little to the thin edge of the crowd. He was expecting neither letters nor friends. The six Broncos were brought to a stand in the midst of the crowd. The mail bag was tossed to the postmaster, and the passengers began climbing down from their seats. As the last man rose from his place, he stood for a moment in a stooped position, gripping with each hand one of the standards that supported the canvas top of the vehicle. Looking out thus over the crowd, he seemed to be gathering data for an estimate of the population before he felt cautiously with his foot for the step. Abe Lee started forward with an exclamation. It was Jefferson Worth. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: Signs of Conflict. Not a line of Jefferson Worth's countenance changed as the tall surveyor, pushing his way through the crowd about the new arrivals, greeted him. But Abe Lee felt the man from behind his gray mask reaching out to grasp his innermost thoughts and emotions. Where's the hotel? Abe explained that the rough board shelter that bore that name was full to the door. People were even sleeping on the floor. But there's a room in our tent, Mr. Worth, he finished and led the way out of the crowd. To the surveyor's eager questions, the banker answered that Barbara was visiting friends in the coast city. When they had reached the tent and Abe had found and lighted a lantern, Mr. Worth said, and his manner was as though he were continuing a conversation that had been interrupted only for a moment, "'Well, I see you stayed.' At his words, the surveyor, who was filling a tin wash basin with fresh water, that his guest might wash away the dust of his journey, felt the hot blood in his cheeks. Before answering, he pulled an old cracker box from under a cot in one corner of the canvas room, and, rummaging therein, brought to light a clean towel. When he had placed this evidence of civilization beside the basin on the box that did duty as a washstand, he answered, I quit the company this afternoon. Why? Because I won't do the kind of work the company wants. The surveyor spoke hotly now. The man busy with the basin of water made no comment, and Abe continued. Mr. Worth, they're putting in the cheapest possible kind of wooden structures all through the system, even at points where the safety of the whole project depends on the control of the water. The intake itself is nothing but the flimsiest sort of a makeshift. One good flood, such as we have every few years, and there wouldn't be a damn stick of it left in twelve hours. You remember what the grade is from the river at the point of the intake this way into the basin, and you know how water cuts this soil. If that gate goes out, the whole river will come through, and these settlers, who are tumbling over each other to put into this country every cent they have in the world, will lose everything. The company takes its chances with the settlers, doesn't it? The company takes mighty small chances compared to the risks the settlers are carrying. 
As a matter of fact, Mr. Worth, it is the people who are building this system, not the company at all. To prove up on these desert claims, the government compels them to have the water. They can't use the water without paying the company for the right. After they've bought the water rights, then they must pay for every acre foot they use. All Greenfield and his bunch did was to put up enough to start the thing going, and the people are doing the rest. The company knows the risk and stakes a comparatively small amount of capital. The settlers know nothing of the real conditions and stake everything they have in the world. If the company would tell the people the situation, it would be square. But you know what would happen if they did that. No one would come in. As it is, the company, by risking the smallest amount possible, leads the people to risk everything they have. And yet the Greenfield crowd stands to win big on the whole stake. Mr. Worth was drying his slim fingers with careful precision. I figured that was the way it would be done. That's the way all these big enterprises are launched. The first work is always done on a promoter's estimate. Later, when the business justifies, the system will be strengthened and improved. Which means, retorted the surveyor, that when the company has taken enough money from the settlers, whom they have induced to stake everything they have on the gamble by letting them think it is a sure thing, they will use a part of it to give the people what they think they're getting now. The banker laid the towel carefully aside and disposed of the water in the wash basin by the primitive method of throwing it from the tent door. Then he spoke again. The people themselves could never start a work like this, and if there wasn't a chance to make a big thing, capital wouldn't. It's the size of the profit compared with the amount invested that draws capital into this kind of a thing. If the company had to take all the chance in this project, they would simply stay out and the work would never be done. This feature of unequal risk is the very thing and the only thing that could attract the money to start this proposition going. And that's what people like you and the seer and Barbara can't see. Holmes and Burke can't help themselves. It's Greenfield and the company, and they're just as honest as other men. They're simply promoting this scheme in the only way possible to start it, and the people will share in the results. Holmes and Burke are all right, except that they're owned body and soul by the company, said Abe quickly. But Greenfield and the men who engineered this thing look to me like a bunch of green goods men who live on the confidence of the people. The people will gain their farms just the same, returned the financier. They wouldn't have anything without the company. The surveyor shrugged his shoulders. Well, you may be right, Mr. Worth, but I've had all I can stand of it. Again, Jefferson Worth looked full into the younger man's eyes, and Abe felt that something behind the mask, reaching out to seize the thoughts and motives that lay back of his words. What are you going to do? I don't know. Punch steers or get a job in a mine somewhere, I reckon. I'm going somewhere out of this. I've had enough of promoters' estimates. Suppose you stay and work for me. Abe Lee sprang to his feet. Work for you? Here? I thought you had refused to go into this deal. I declined to join Greenfield's company, said the banker exactly. You mean, Mr. Worth, that you're going to operate in the basin independently, knowing the company's strength and the whole situation as you do? I have decided to take a chance with the rest, was the unemotional answer. I sold out of the bank and cleaned up everything in Rubio City last week. But what are you going into here? I can use you if you want to stay, came the cautious answer. Stay? Of course I'll stay. It was characteristic of these men that nothing was said of salary on either side. Extinguishing the lantern, Abe led the way out into the night. 
The darkness was intense and unrelieved, save by the thin broken line of twinkling lights from the windows of the buildings, which gave them the direction of the main street, and the few dull glowing tent houses whose tenants were at home. Overhead the desert stars shone with a brilliance that put to shame the feeble efforts of the earthmen, while about the little pioneer town the desert night drew close with its circling wall of mystery. Did Jefferson Worth think, as he stumbled along by the surveyor's side, of that other night in the hollow of God's hand, when he had faced alone the spirit of the land? This town needs an electric lighting system, he said in his colorless voice. When Jefferson Worth had finished supper in the shack restaurant, he proposed cautiously that they look around a little. The street was lined with teams and saddle horses, their forms shadowy and indistinct in the dark places of vacant lots or where buildings were under construction, but standing forth with startling clearness where the light from a store streamed forth. The sidewalk was filled with men from the ranches and grading camps who had come to town after sunset for their mail or supplies that no hour of the day should be lost to the work that had called them into the desert. And these ever-shifting figures passed to and fro through the bands of light and darkness, gathered in groups in front of the stores and dissolved again to form other groups or to lose themselves in the general throng. Every moment a wagon load of men, a party of horsemen, or a single rider would appear suddenly and mysteriously out of the night, while others, leaving the throng to depart in like manner, would be swallowed up as mysteriously by the blackness. In the center of the picture, and the very heart of the activity was the general store opposite the office of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company. Deck Jordan had opened his store in the days when Kingston was still a supply camp. No one knew much about Deck or how he had guessed that the camp would become the chief town in the new country. He was a pleasing, capable, but closed-mouthed man who knew what to buy paid his bills promptly, and, with one exception, conducted his business on a cash basis. The exception to the cash rule was in favor of the company's employees. It was on Deck's initiative that an arrangement was made with Mr. Burke by which the company men received a credit at the store, the amount of their bills being deducted from their wages each month by the company paymaster. It was this plan that, by giving Deck practically all of the trade from the hundreds of company employees, had increased his business so rapidly. To the thoughtful manager also, the plan seemed good. He foresaw how, with the company thus controlling the bulk of the merchant's business, he could, when the proper time came, persuade Deck to enter into a still closer arrangement, thus carrying out the good business policy of the company. That very afternoon, Mr. Burke had decided the time had come, and he had so written Mr. Greenfield. Leisurely, Jefferson Worth and his companion worked their way through the crowd and into the store, where Deck and his helpers were toiling to supply the various needs of a small army of customers. From the open doors and from the big implement shed in the rear of the building, a steady stream of provisions, clothing, dry goods, hardware, blankets, harness, and tools flowed forth. In the midst of the confusion, Deck himself was holding an animated conversation with a would-be purchaser. I'd be mighty glad to accommodate you, Sam, if I could. But you know we're running this store on a cash basis, and I can't break my rules. 
If I begin with you, I'll have to do it for everybody. And I can't. You don't make these company men pay cash. Anybody, engines, greasers, or anything else, gets what he wants, and no questions asked if he works for the company. But that's different, you see, explained Dick. We have an arrangement with the company by which they hold out from each man's pay the amount of my bills against him. I understand that, but you'll find that it's the rancher's trade that'll keep you going. We'll be here long after these ditchers and mule skinners have left the country, and we'll have money to spend. You'll find, too, that when things do begin to come our way, we'll stand by the store that'll stand by us now when we got everything going out and nothing coming in. Deck, over the shoulder of the rancher, saw Jefferson Worth and the surveyor, who, with several others, had drawn near, attracted by the loud tones of the farmer. Abe thought that he caught a look of recognition as Deck's eyes fell on his companion, but the banker gave no sign. The merchant, answering his customer, said, "'I know you're right about that part of it, Sam, and I'd like to back every rancher in this basin if I could. But I can't. Why not? Ain't you running this store?' Before Deck could reply, to Abe's astonishment, the quiet voice of Jefferson Worth broke in. You are improving a ranch of your own near here? The settler turned sharply. You bet I am, mister. Leastwise, I'm trying to, and if working from sun up till dark and living on nothing till I can make a crop will pull me through, I'll make it. I suppose the heaviest expense is all in getting started? asked Mr. Worth, as if seeking to verify an observation. It sure is, replied the pioneer. There's the outfit you've got to have, work stock and tools. you got to build your ditches and grade your land, and you got to buy water rights and pay for your water, and you got to make your payments to the government. Then there's feed for your work stock and yourself, and there ain't nothing to bring in a cent till you make a crop. The farmers that are coming into this country ain't got a great big pile of ready money stacked away, mister, and they're mighty apt to run a little short the first year. When our home merchants, who expect to make their money off from us, won't even trust us with a few dollars worth of provisions till we can get a start, I'm damn if it ain't tough. But everyone is a stranger in this new country, said Mr. Worth. How can a merchant know whether a man will pay or not? I suppose there are ranchers coming in here who would beat a bill if they could. The merchants have to pay for their goods or close up. I reckon that's all so, returned the other. And of course everybody knows that there never was such a thing as dishonest storekeepers. Merchants don't never beat anybody with short weight and all that. This raised a laugh in which Deck joined as heartily as anyone. Even the banker smiled coldly as he asked, What did you say your name was? Didn't say, but it's Sam Warren. Where's your ranch? Six miles north on the number one main. Well, Mr. Warren, I've been considering this proposition, and I've got it figured out like this. We all want to make what we can in this new country. That's what we came in for. This store can't get along without the rancher's support, and you ranchers can't get along without the store. We've all got to pull together and help each other. I don't believe that many of the men who come into this desert to actually settle on and improve the land are the kind of men who beat their bills. I figured to run on a cash basis only until things got started and sort of settle down, you see. I know that you people need credit until you get on your feet. From now on, you come here for whatever you actually need, you understand, and we'll carry you for any reasonable amount until you get something coming in. All we ask in return is that you ranchers do as you say and stand by us when you do get on top. At Jefferson Worth's simple and quietly spoken words, a hush fell over the group of men. Abe Lee looked at his companion in amazement. Sam Warren turned from the stranger to the storekeeper 
and back to the stranger. The man behind the counter was smiling broadly, as if enjoying the situation. When no one could find a word with which to break the silence, Deck Jordan said, "'Gentlemen, this is Mr. Jefferson Worth, the owner of this store. "'George,' he called to a passing clerk, "'give Sam whatever he wants as soon as you can get around to it and charge it.' At this, such a yell went up from the bystanders that a crowd from the outside rushed in, and as the word passed and others voiced their approval as loudly, the manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company in his rooms across the street thought that another fight was on. The manager was not far wrong in his conclusion. End of Chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen Barbara's Call to Her Friends. That night, long after Kingston was still and the manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company was fast asleep. Jefferson Worth and Abe Lee talked in the little tent that from the lantern within glowed in the darkness, seemingly the one spot of light under the desert stars. The next morning the surveyor left town on the stage, but not as he had planned. Abe knew now where he was going and what he was going to do. He was bound for the city by the sea, and he carried in his pocket several letters of introduction written by his employer and addressed to different firms engaged in manufacturing and selling things electrical. And more than this, Abe would see Barbara. Jefferson Worth did not breakfast with Abe that morning, nor did he see him off on the stage, but a few minutes after the survey had left town, his employer passed down the street in the direction of the store. As Mr. Worth drew near his place of business, he saw, paused just without the door, one whom the most casual of observing strangers would have supposed instantly to be the proprietor of the store, the owner of the building, if not indeed the proprietor and owner of all Kingston and many miles of country round about. The portly figure, clad in a business suit of gray, with a vast, full-rounded expanse of white vest, expressed in every curve opulent wealth and lordly generosity. The clean-shaven face, fat and florid, beamed upon the world from above the clerical severity of a black tie with truly paternal benevolence. While the massive head was not in reality crowned, but was covered by a hat such as commanding generals always wear, in pictures. The pose of the figure, the lift of the countenance, the kingly mane of eye and brow, made it impossible to mistake his majesty. In comparison with this august personage, the figure and air of Jefferson Worth were pitifully inadequate. The great one welcomed the financier at the latter's own door with an air of royal hospitality. Extending his hand as he stepped down only one step from his throne, and speaking in a tone that was meant to confer marked distinction upon the humble recipient of his favor, he said, Mr. Worth, I am delighted, more delighted than I can express, to welcome you to our city. It is a great day for this country, a great day. He wrung the financier's timid hand with 250 pounds of emotional energy. Mr. Greenfield and I, with our friends and associates in the East, and Mr. Burke and Holmes here in the field, are doing what we can for these people. But there is a great work here yet for men like you, men of some means and financial ability, who will get behind the smaller business interest and build them up on a solid foundation. My heart rejoiced for the country, sir, when I heard this morning that you had purchased this establishment. 
Deck is a good, honest fellow, you know, but... An expansive smile of confidential understanding finished this sentence, and the words, My name is Blanton, Mr. Worth, Horace P. Blanton, seemed to settle at once any doubt as to the position and authority of the speaker. Jefferson Worth did not explain that he had owned the store from the beginning and that Deck Jordan was no more than his very capable agent. Indeed, Mr. Worth said nothing at all. He even appeared to shrink with becoming modesty, though there was the faintest hint of a twinkle in the corners of his eyes, a hint so faint that Horace P. Blanton, from his great height, overlooked it. The big man, in a lower tone of confidential familiarity, asked, Have you heard from Greenfield lately? No, I wrote Jim some time ago that he would have to come out here himself. There are some conditions developing here that should have his personal attention, and I'll be blessed if I'll stand seeing him neglect them. I'm a Western man myself, Worth, and you know we do things in this country. You're interested in the King's Basin Company? The answer was given in a tone of tolerant surprise, that anyone should think he would toy with a thing of such trifling importance. Me? Oh, no. That is not directly, you understand. But I'm deeply interested in the development of the country. Let me show you a little of what we're doing here. It's amazing how the world outside fails utterly to grasp the magnitude of the enterprise. Even the newspapers are criminally negligent. Quite recently, I had an occasion to tell my good friend, the editor of the Times, that if he didn't give us something like a fair showing, I would see to it personally that the bulk of our business went to San Felipe. It's a burning shame the way they persistently ignored us. Mr. Worth made an ineffectual attempt to escape, but the white vest blocked his move. Pointing to a half-finished building on the nearest corner, the great one explained in the tone of a personal conductor. That's our new hotel, one of the finest buildings in the Southwest. The young man who will run it for us is personally superintending the construction. Bright boy, too. You must let me introduce you to him. Jefferson Worth, gazing at the modest building under construction, murmured, You are interested, you say? Oh, no. That is, only in a way, you understand. I have a hand in most of these enterprises. This town needs a good hotel, said Mr. Worth mildly. That building farther down there, the one where the foundation is just completed, is our opera house. It is being erected by one of the big coast syndicates and will be a magnificent hall of amusement and entertainment as well as a place for public gatherings of all kinds. I've been in close personal touch with the men in charge of the enterprise, and they understand that we will tolerate nothing that is not first class. The people need such a building, was the quiet comment. In the block opposite, our bank will be located. They'll be working on the vault in another two weeks. While the building is well underway, as you see, the organization of the institution is not yet made public. Only a few of us on the inside, you understand, know who is back of the enterprise. I see, said Jefferson Worth. A bank is a good thing for the country. Pointing up the street, the great one in the white vest continued. There you see the office of our paper, the King's Basin Messenger. The machinery is being installed now. I'm mighty proud of the young man who's starting that work. He will be a credit to us, I promise you. Directly opposite is the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company building, with the offices of the company. You must let me introduce you to the manager, Mr. Burke, and to Holmes, the engineer. Come, we'll go over there now. He started forward with perspiring energy, but Jefferson Worth, seizing the opportunity, gained the doorway of the store and vanished. For two weeks, Mr. Worth seemed to devote his time wholly to his store. Though Deck Jordan would continue the active management 
it was generally understood that Mr. Worth, having but recently purchased the establishment, retained deck until, as it was generally expressed, he got the run of the business. At an old desk in a cubbyhole of an office, roughly partitioned off in one corner of the room, the financier spent nearly every hour of the day apparently poring over his accounts. Here the manager from across the street found him when he called to explain to Mr. Worth the advantage of an alliance between the store and the company. Mr. Burke did not stay long, but upon his return to his office wrote a long confidential letter to his superiors. The thoughtful manager's letters to his superiors were always confidential. Willard Holmes also called to pay his respects, to inquire whether Miss Worth was well, and, as Holmes put it to himself when he was again safely outside the building, to turn himself inside out for the critical inspection of the man who hid behind that gray mask. So far as the manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company observed, Jefferson Worth, beside buying the store, made only one small investment. He purchased from the company a small tract of land just inside the limits of the town site. Then, almost before Mr. Burke knew that it was before them, the town council passed an ordinance granting permission to the Worth Electric Company to place their poles and stretch wires on the streets of the town, and the first issue of the King's Basin Messenger announced with a great flourish of trumpets that Kingston was to have lights. The article explained that Mr. Abe Lee, the well-known engineer, formerly with the KBL and I Company, would have charge of the construction work and would push it with his usual energy. For some time, Mr. Lee had been in the city arranging for material which would be shipped immediately. Mr. Worth had stated to the messenger that Mr. Lee would return to Kingston in a day or two and would break ground for the power plant at once. The messenger also gave an interesting history of Jefferson Worth's successful career from farm boy to financier with an appreciation of his character and congratulated the citizens that a man of such financial strength and genius had come to invest the fruit of his toil in the new country. Mr. Burke read the messenger's article thoughtfully. Then Mr. Burke wrote another confidential letter to his superiors. Over this enterprise of Jefferson Worth, as set forth in the messenger, the citizens were enthusiastic. Horace P. Blanton was more than enthusiastic. Meeting with Mr. Burke as the latter was returning to his office after dinner, he blocked the manager's way with his white vest and, wiping the sweat of honest endeavor from his brow, delivered himself. Well, sir, we landed it. Biggest thing that ever happened to Kingston. Double our population in three months. I told my friend Mr. Worth that they would have to come through with that franchise whether they wanted to or not. And by George, we landed it. There was nothing else to do. The manager thoughtfully flicked the ashes from his cigar. And what is this that you've landed? What, haven't you heard? Have you seen the messenger? He drew a paper from his pocket and placed a finger on the headlines. Electric lights for Kingston. The manager shifted his cigar to the corner of his mouth and, casting his head in the opposite direction, surveyed the excited Horace P. as an artist might view an interesting picture. So you're interested in the Worth Electric Company? Oh, no. That is not exactly, you know. My name will not appear in the company, but Jeff and I are very warm friends, you understand, and for the sake of Kingston, I'm bound to take an interest in his enterprise. At this, the thoughtful Mr. Burke became suddenly confidential, tapping his companion impressively on the arm and speaking in a low tone of vast import, he said, Blanton, be careful, be careful. Don't get into worse schemes too deeply. 
A man of your standing and influence, you know, can't afford to play into the hands of a four-flusher. Then the manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company slipped easily away before the other could reply. Three minutes later, the man in the big white vest overtook the company's chief engineer in the doorway of the restaurant. Good morning, Holmes. Good morning. The simple greeting seemed to come from a great heart that was fairly staggering under a burden of other people's woes. As the boy placed their dinners before them, Horace P. Blanton, shaking his massive head, murmured sadly, it's a burning shame, Holmes, a burning shame. The coffee, you mean? queried the engineer, digging up a spoonful of sediment from the bottom of his heavy cup and inspecting it critically. It looks shameful, all right, and it may have been overheated sometime in the past ages, but the temperature doesn't appear to be above normal today. The big man did not smile. His burden was too heavy. I mean, he explained, the way these four-flushers come in here and attempt to work their graph right under our eyes. Did you hear about this man Worth getting that franchise out of the council? I did my level best, but what's the use? It's all as plain as day, but you can't hammer an idea into the boneheads that run this town. I had a little talk with Burke over the matter this morning. He agrees with me perfectly. We've got to take hold of this thing, Mr. Holmes, or the town will go to the dogs. I wish Greenfield would come on. The engineer agreed heartily that it might be well to take hold of something. But what? That was the rub. What? He gently intimidated that if Horace P. Blanton could not find a way to avert the awful calamity that threatened the public, the public was in a bad way. Clearly, it was up to Horace P. to save Kingston. The dinner over, the men separated quickly, the man in the white vest to carry the burden of Kingston's future on his fat shoulders, and the engineer to inspect the work at Dry River Heading. The evening of the third day after Abe Lee's return to Kingston, the surveyor and his employer were in Mr. Worth's office. The work of excavation of the foundation of the power plant would begin in the morning, and Mr. Worth had planned to leave town the following morning for a week's business trip to the city. The two men were interrupted in their conversation by a loud, familiar voice on the store side of the board partition. Busy be they. Well, for what the devil should they be but busy? Do you suppose I thought there was a play in dominoes? Abe grinned at his employer. They both listened. Deck Jordan's voice said, But you better not go in now, boys. They will be through in a little while. Go in? Who the hell's talking of going in? Do you think, you dang counterhopper, that we've no manners at all? For supper weather, I'd go over to you with me two hands and another softer voice drawled. Run along, Deck. Me and my partner promises not to turn violent or break into the sanctuary. We'll just camp here peaceful till the meeting's over. Abe chuckled. I knew they would be along as soon as they heard the news. He lifted his voice. Come in, boys. Instantly, Barbara's uncles appeared. We ask your pardon, sir, for not coming before to pay our respects, but we only heard yesterday that ye was in the country. You see, after we finished at the river, we was transferred over on number three at the tail end of nowhere, and knew nothing at all till someone brought into camp the paper that told about your doings. And how's our little girl? Very well, said Mr. Worth. She told me to be sure and remember her to you. I saw the other day, said Abe. She sent you both her love. Well, now, what do you think of that? Tex, you dang old sand rat. It's proud of yourself you should be to be the uncle of such a darling. Then tell us now, sir, for what this I hear about your building a power plant for electric lights or streetcars or something. 
We thought the lad here left the dang country for good and serves them dang yellow legs that boss the company right for not knowing a man when they see one. We begin in the morning. Abe is in charge. Hurrah! exclaimed the delighted Irishman. And it's men you be wantin', of course. One to handle the greasers, which is cake to me, and one to boss the mule skinners, which is pie for tex. I'm thinking the company will be short-handed at number three in the morning. I've been holding these places open for you, Abe laughed. If I could get hold of Pablo now, I would be all right. Barbara said to be sure and get him, too. He's still at Dry River heading, I hear. As the two were leaving, Texas Joe said to Abe, Are you plumb certain Pablo is at the heading? That's what one of the crew told me today. Well, then I reckon he'll be along pronto. The next morning, when Abe went to the site of the work, the first man he saw was Barbara's friend, Pablo. The Mexican greeted the surveyor with a show of white teeth. Did you come to work? asked Abe. Si, senor. Senor Texas, he come last night with two horses. He say, Senor Abe, won't you quick, Pablo? La senorita say you come, so I come pronto, like he say. Texas Joe went for you last night, repeated Abe. Si, senor. If you want me come, if la senorita want me come, Senor Tex, he go tell me come. I come. It is no much ride for vaqueros like Senor Tex and me. But you have your job with the company? The Mexican shrugged his shoulders and his teeth showed. Senor Worth and Senors Lee and Tex and Pat good company for Pablo. Beside, is it not la senorita? She was good to me when I was sick with no one to help. Do not we all, Senoras Lee and Tex and Pat and Senor Worth and me, do we not all work for La Senorita and La Palma de la Mano do Dios? Is it not so? Beside, I think sometime La Senorita come. Then I will be near. In the company, there is no Senorita. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 14 Much Confusion and Happy Excitement. As the trying months of the semi tropical summer approached, the great desert, so awful in its fierce desolation, so pregnant with the life it was still so reluctant to yield, gathered all its dreadful forces to withstand the inflowing streams of human energy. In the fierce winds that rushed through the mountain passes and swept across the hot plains like a torrid furnace blast, in the blinding, stinging, choking, smothering dust that moved in golden clouds from rim to rim of the basin, in the blazing, scorching strength of the sun, in the hard, hot sky without shred or raveling of cloud, in the creeping, silent, poison life of insect and reptile, in the maddening dryness of the thirsty vegetation, in the weird, beautiful falseness of the ever-changing mirage, the spirit of the desert issued its silent challenge. It was not the majestic challenge of the mountains with their unsealed heights of peak and dome and impassable barriers of rugged crag and sheer cliff. It was not the glad challenge of the untamed wilderness with its myriad-formed life of tree and plant and glen and stream. It was not the noble challenge of the wide-sweeping, pathless plains, nor the wild challenge of the restless, storm-driven sea. It was the silent, sinister, menacing threat of a desolation that had conquered by cruel waiting and that lay in wait still to conquer. With grim determination, nervous energy, enduring strength, and a dogged tenacity of purpose, the invading flood of humanity, irresistibly driven by that master passion, 
good business, matched its strength against that of the desert in the season of its greatest power. Steadily mile by mile, acre by acre, and at times almost foot by foot, the pioneers wrested their future farms and homes from the dreadful forces that had held them for ages. Steadily, with the inflowing stream of life from the world beyond the basin's rim, the area of improved lands about Kingston extended, and the work of the company's town went on. By midsummer, many acres of alfalfa, with Egyptian corn and other grains, showed broad fields of living green cut into the dull, dun plain of the desert, and laced with silver threads of water shining in the sun. Save for occasional brief business trips to the city, Jefferson Worth did not leave Kingston. In the most trying of those grilling days of heat and dust, when a man's skin felt like cracking parchment and his eyes burned in their sockets and it seemed as though every particle of moisture in his body was sucked up by the dry, scorching air, Barbara's father gave no sign of discomfort. He accepted the most nerve-wracking situation with the even-tempered calmness of one who had foreseen it and to whom it was but a trivial incident inevitable to his far-reaching plans. When others, their tempers tried to the breaking point, cursed with dry, high-pitched, querulous curses, the heat, the land, the sun, the dust, the company, and their fellow sufferers, Jefferson Worth's cool, even tones and unruffled spirit helped them to a needed self-control and gave them a new and stronger grip on things. And many a baffled, discouraged, and well-nigh beaten settler, ready to give up, found in the man whose gray, mask-like face seemed so incapable of expression, fresh inspiration and new courage. While the store continued its policy, of helping the worthy, hard-pressed ranchers with necessary material assistance. And so it was that while James Greenfield and his fellow capitalists of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company were taking their much-needed vacations and seeking relaxation and rest from business cares at their seaside and mountain retreats, the desert pioneers were coming more and more to Jefferson Worth for advice and counsel, for strength and courage, and to help to go on with the work. By fall, the financier's position in the life of the new country seemed to be securely won. Perhaps only Jefferson Worth himself, alone behind his gray mask, knew the real value of his apparent victory. The company's thoughtful manager went out as the pioneers had come to say to those who left the basin, for over a month, and for the rest of the summer spent only a part of his time in Kingston. But the company's chief engineer refused to leave even for a week. To a pressing invitation from Greenfield to join him on his vacation, Holmes answered that he could not get away. All through the June rise of the river, while the settlers, ignorant of the danger that threatened them through the good business policy of the company, were risking everything that capital might gain its greater profits, the engineer lived in his camp at the intake. Day and night, as he watched the swelling yellow torrent that threw its weight against his work, he remembered the words of the desert-bred surveyor. When the Gila and the Little Colorado go on the warpath, and come down on top of the high Colorado flood, you'll catch hell. It had come in the past, Abe had declared, and it would come again. But the flood waters of the Gila and the Little Colorado did not come down on top of the larger river that year, and the promoter's estimate work stood. When the danger was past and the engineer was free again to make Kingston his headquarters, his acquaintance with Jefferson Worth grew into something like friendship. 
It became, indeed, an established custom for Mr. Worth, Abe Lee, and the chief engineer of the company, to sit at the same table in the shack restaurant, and during their meals of canned stuff, to talk over the work that held them from the comforts and pleasures of civilization. But little work toward extending the company system could be undertaken during the hot summer months. It was difficult for Holmes to hold even enough men to maintain that which was already in operation. But Jefferson Worth did not fare so badly. Abe Lee was steadfast, of course, while Texas, Pat, and Pablo would, as the Irishman said, have fried themselves on the coal of hell before they would quit their job. Were there not letters every week from Barbara with messages to the surveyor and his three helpers? Pablo said truly that there was no senorita in the company. So through Abe's leadership, Texas Joe's diplomacy, Pat's wisdom, and Pablo's influence with his countrymen, the Worth Enterprises did not suffer for lack of laborers, but went steadily ahead. In Kingston, the different buildings for the power plant and lighting system were nearly completed, and several cottages were under construction on lots owned by Jefferson Worth, while men and teams were busy excavating and hauling materials for a large ice plant. In Frontera, a little town that just happened to grow from a supply camp in the southern end of the basin, a hotel and a bank building were being erected, while between the two communities, poles for a telephone system were being placed. Thus far, very few women had come into the desert. When the torrid summer was past, the first crops on the new ranches harvested and more comfortable homes prepared, they would come with the children to join the men folk. Until then, the new country would continue a man's country, the poorest possible kind of a country, the men themselves declared. Therefore, when, late in September, the King's Basin messenger, with an extraordinary blare of trumpets, announced the birth of a child and that the firstborn of the new country was a boy, the news was received with the greatest excitement. In Kingston, in Frontera, at grading camps and ranches, as the word was spread, there were wild and joyous celebrations. Such a crowd of male visitors closed in on the humble tent home to beg for a look at the little pink stranger that the matter-of-fact pioneer parents were heard to express the wish that they themselves had never been born. Had the baby been forced to carry through life all the names that were suggested, he would undoubtedly have echoed the parents' wish at an early age. Then came the terrible word to Kingston, brought by Texas Joe, that the baby was ill. Tex, returning to town from a trip to Frontera, had turned a mile aside to bring the latest news of the baby. It was early evening, and the light yet lingered in the sky back of no man's mountains, when the citizens relaxing after the heat of the day and the evening meal, looked up to see him coming, riding like a madman, his horse white with foam. Jefferson Worth, with Abe and Holmes coming from the restaurant, had paused a moment in front of the store before separating when Texas leaped from his staggering mount. One thought flashed into the mind of each. The intake, the river, Holmes went white under his tan. Abe's jaws came together with a click. Jefferson Worth's slim fingers caressed his chin. As the word passed quickly through the town, the crowd that followed Mr. Worth and Texas Joe into the store grew until it overflowed the building and filled the street. Over all there was a solemn hush save for low-spoken words of inquiry or explanation and of advice. What to do was the question. What could they do? There was no doctor nearer than Rubio City, 
and men who pioneered in a desert land are not men experienced with sickness. On a high shelf in one back corner of the store, there was a small, dust-covered stock of assorted patent medicines. Desperately, they pulled the bottles down and studied the labels and directions, but only to their further confusion and doubt. At last, his pockets laden with everything that seemed to promise a possible relief, Texas Joe set out on a fresh horse, the first one handy, to be followed later by a spring wagon drawn by four fast broncos and carrying four women. The entire female population of Kingston had been mustered by Abe Lee, whom the ladies declared then and there to be the only man of sense in all the King's Basin. For the first evening since his arrival, Jefferson Worth left his office in the store to mingle with the restless crowds on the street that in ever-changing knots and groups discussed in fearful voice this public calamity. No one dreamed of retiring. No one had thoughts of sleep, nor indeed for anything save the little sufferer in the tent house ten miles out on the desert. They smoked and talked and swore softly in hushed tones and waited the return of Texas Joe. It was after midnight when he came again. Before he could dismount, the crowd of silent men hemmed him in. From the saddle, the old plainsman looked down into their eager, solemn faces, and that slow smile broke over his sun-blackened features. Boys, he drawled, I'm sure proud to bring you all the unanimous verdict of the female relief expedition sent out by our illustrious fellow citizen, Abe Lee. The kid's better, and is headed straight for good health and six or eight square meals a day. When the joyous course of yells that would have startled a Cody two miles away subsided, Tex dismounted and approached Jefferson Worth. Mr. Worth, them women commanded me also to return to you with their compliments and gratitude, the various and sundry bottles with which same my clothes is full. One of them angels of mercy, it seems, went to the scene of action loaded with a flask of castor oil. Just before retiring that night, Mr. Worth said to his superintendent, Abe, I'm going out in the morning. You'd better push the work on that largest cottage as fast as possible. I'll chip in an outfit of furniture and things as soon as I get to the city. Let me know when the house is finished and the goods arrive. You can stack the furniture up on the porches or anywhere until I get back. The hot weather's about over, and the hotel will open up next week. All right, sir, the surveyor answered quietly, and made no comment on this unexpected move of his employer, though his nerves tingled at the evident purpose of his instructions. Abe Lee could not know how the events of the evening had awakened in Jefferson Worth memories of another baby in the desert, memories that stirred the child-hungry heart of the lonely man and drove him to his daughter without an hour's delay. Did Abe Lee push the work on the house? Did he? Every man in Jefferson Worth's employee who could find a place to lay his hand on the building was put on the job. By the time the house was finished, the furniture had arrived. It was quitting time, and Pablo, who with four Mexican laborers had been at work grading the yard, and removing the rubbish that had accumulated incident to building, dismissed his helpers. The surveyor was gloomily contemplating the pile of boxes, bales, and crates on the front porch. Evidently, there was something not to the surveyor's liking. Senor Lee? The surveyor turned sharply to face the Mexican, whose dark features were glowing with pleasure. Well... Pardon, but Senor Lee seems not pleased. Is not the work well done? The work is all right, Pablo. You've done well. It's not that. I was wishing I had nerve enough to tackle another job. 
The Mexican smiled. Oh, senor, you make fun. What cannot El Senor do? He can do everything. There's a job here, all right. I don't sabe, Pablo. Abe turned again to the pile of household goods. See, si, senor, me sabe. It is that la senorita come pronto, and senor Lee would have the house what you call ready. Abe started at the tone of quiet conviction. How the devil do you know that la senorita is coming? he asked sharply. The answer came with a flash of white teeth. For what else does El Senor hurry so the house? For what else does he all time cry, Pronto, pronto, and go not much to the other work, but stay all time here? And is there not all this? He waved his hand gracefully to indicate the household goods. For who should it be that Senor Lee is hurry so? When Texas Joe comes, say, Senor Worth is here. I think quick sometime la senorita come. I work for senor worth as la senorita send word that I may be near. All time I work, I say, it is for la senorita. Pretty quick now she come, and with senor Lee will be happy to live in the house he make. A deeper red than the desert color stained the surveyor's thin cheeks as he said, You're a good hombre, Pablo, but you're away off on part of what you say. I reckon you're right enough that Miss Worth is coming, but she will live here with her father just as they did in Rubio City. And listen, Pablo, you must never say to anyone what you've said to me. You sabe, Pablo? I am with La Senorita as you are, and Tex and Pat. Sabe? Si, senor, forgive me. I am sorry. But some time it will be if El Senor is patient. The surveyor, annoyed at the Mexican's talk, but unwilling because of the spirit that prompted the words to speak sharply, sought to dismiss the matter by changing the subject. He explained to Pablo how he was wishing that he could unpack the furniture and have the house all ready when Mr. Worth and Barbara arrived. Why not? asked the Mexican. Abe shook his head. It's out of my line. I don't sabe the job, Pablo. Maybe so, Tex and Pat. They would sabe. By George, I believe Pat would. Texas wouldn't be any better than I, but Pat ought to know something about such things. You go tell them I want them at the office tonight. Pat was at the powerhouse today, and Texas will be coming in from the line early. Si, senor. And senor Lee, la senorita will want a horse. Hell, I forgot that. Pablo smiled. I know where is Goodwin, a beautiful horse, senor. Long time I watch him and think some day he be for la senorita when she come. The man will sell for enough. Shall I go tomorrow? Yes, get him. Tell the man it's for me, and then I will pay. No, he corrected himself. Tell him it's for senior worth, and that he will pay. Sabi, you must not speak of me. Si, senor, it shall be as you say. Tomorrow night I return. That evening at the office in the rear of the store, Abe laid the situation before Pat and Texas Joe. Could the three undertake to have the furniture unpacked and the house properly settled? The hotel had been open to receive guests, of course, but... Texas Joe shook his head solemnly. I pass, Abe. There ain't no use in my affirming that I knows anything about such undertakings. Household furnishing, such as is proper in a case like this, is a long way off my range. But the Irishman waxed indignant. Such ignorance as you two be showing is heathenish he declared. I suppose now you would be for putting the cook stove in the parlor and setting up the piney in the young lady's boudoir. The strange word caught the attention of Texas instantly. And what might that be, pard? he drawled. What's a boudoir? Pat snorted. Boudoir, you ignorant old limb, is polite for the girl's bedroom. 
which in civilization is not discussed by them as has manners. Such overwhelming evidence of the Irishman's familiarity with the best social customs was not to be rejected. The morning stage carried a telegram to be sent from Deep Well to Jefferson Worth, and all that day the three toiled under command of Pat. When the evening stage brought a message from Mr. Worth saying that he and Barbara would arrive the following evening, they decided that a night shift was necessary and worked until nearly morning, redoubling their efforts the following day. When the dusty old stage with its four half-broken horses pulled into Kingston that night, three tired and anxious but joyful desert men occupied the front rank of the waiting crowd before the new hotel. With all the grace of generous curves and ponderous dignity, Horace P. Blanton was first to alight. When he turned his broad back to the common herd and, with an indescribable air of proprietorship, assisted Mrs. Worth to the ground, Three darkened faces scowled with disapproval, and three smothered oaths expressed deep disgust. The excited citizens behind the three crowded closer. Even Inez, climbing down from the stage, was received with another cheer by the delighted men. The irrepressible Horace P., quick to recognize the spirit of the company, and ever ready to do more than his part, burst into an eloquent address of welcome in behalf of the entire population of the King's Basin. But the ceremony was interrupted, and the imposing personage in the white vest was thrust roughly aside while Barbara, with glad eyes and hands outstretched, greeted the rude disturbers of the great man's dignity. "'Texas! Pat! Mr. Lee! Oh, I'm glad! I've been hoping all day that you would be here to meet me. It seemed to me that I would never get here. It has been the longest day of my life.' Which, considering that the impressive attentions of Horace P. Blanton had been continuous since the moment when he had forced an introduction from Mr. Worth on the train that morning, was rather hard on His Majesty.' But much experience in similar situations had made Horace P. Blanton immune to such thrusts. Even while Barbara was speaking, he regained his place at her side. With his voice and manner of a personal conductor, before either of the three could speak, he followed her words with, "'Ah, Miss Worth, I see you already know some of our men. Texas, Pat, and Abe here are three of the best fellows we have. They... Again, he was interrupted. The young woman turned easily aside to Abe, and Horace P. found himself very close to and facing the tall plainsman and the heavy-shouldered Irish boss. Excuse me, Colonel, drawled Texas in tones so soft that no one in the noisy crowd could hear but the welfare of the citizens of this here community, as well as the safety of the country, demands your immediate presence up the street. Without hesitation, the lordly one exclaimed, Ah, thank you, Tex. Miss Worth will excuse me, I'm sure. Please explain my absence to her. Then before their startled eyes, he faded away. If the vanishing of such a bulk can be so described... A few minutes after the passing of Horace P. Blanton, Tex and Pat also disappeared, for it was part of the carefully arranged plot that Barbara's uncles were to see to the disposal of the girl's trunks while she was at supper at the hotel with her father and Abe. At the table, Barbara was all eagerness in her desire to know everything about the work, and the surveyor, in answering her questions, found himself drawn out of the dumbness that usually beset him in such situations. "'And our house?' asked the girl. "'When can I begin settling? You see, I brought Inez with me. Can we begin in the morning, Abe? And would you spare Pat and Tex to help me?' 
Abe glanced at his employer. If you would like to see the house, we can look at it this evening after supper. Can we? Can we go, Daddy? Jefferson Worth met Abe's look with a twinkle in the corner of his eye, but he only answered his eager daughter with a calm, If you like. They found the house with every window brilliantly lighted, and on the front porch, on opposite sides of the wide-open door, Texas and Pat standing to welcome them. From one room to another, Barbara ran in laughing delight, followed by the three who were perspiring in an agony of suspense while Jefferson Worth looked on. The cook stove was not in the parlor, nor was the piano out of place. In the proper room, Barbara even found her trunks. There was a supply of provisions in the pantry and kindlings even ready by the kitchen stove for the morning fire. If there were little irregularities here and there, Barbara, with graceful tact, did not see them, but to the delight of the three men, declared again and again that no woman could have done it better. The climax came when she said that unless her father insisted, she would not even return to the hotel that evening. Could not someone go for the hand luggage and Inez? Breathless, the three waited, and when Mr. Worth said he saw no reason why they should leave their own home for a hotel, Tex and Pat could hold themselves no longer, but made a wild run for the door. When Barbara's uncles had returned with the Indian woman and the grips, Pat stood in the center of the living room and looking curiously about, an expression of wonder upon his battle-scarred Irish countenance. Now don't you hate the devil? Tell me, he faced the girl with mock severity, for what's this you've been doing already? Doing? exclaimed Barbara. I haven't been doing anything, Uncle Pat. Ah, oh, go on, don't be telling me that. Even Uncle Tex here can see that you changed every blessed thing in the place. Tis not the same at all. And after us are working our fingers to the bone to fix it up. Tis queer. I know now that Tex hung that curtain there. You could have heard him swearing a mile away. But it's not the same curtain at all. At all. Tis mighty queer. For an hour or more, Barbara at the piano sang for them the simple songs they loved, while many a tired horseman riding past on his way to his lonely desert shack or to some rough camp on the works paused to listen to the sweet voice and to dream perhaps of the time that was to come when such sounds would no longer seem strange on the desert. When the hour came for Texas and Pat and Abe to go, and Barbara with shining eyes tried again to express her gratitude while insisting that they must always come to her home as to their own, the three felt that indeed they had their reward. And when later the girl kissed her father good night, Jefferson Worth also knew in his lonely heart that he had done well. End of chapter 14。Chapter 15 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 15 Barbara comes into her own. Jefferson Worth and his daughter had just finished their first breakfast in the new home when their Indian servant woman entered the room. What is it, Inez? asked Barbara, seeing that the woman wished to speak. Inez's black eyes were shining and her voice was eager as she answered. There is someone without waiting for La Senorita. Someone waiting outside for me, Inez? Who is it? asked Mr. Worth. It is Pablo Garcia, senor, and he say please ask la senorita to come. 
if la senorita will go only to the door she can see with an expression of excited interest barbara followed by her father went out on the porch in front of the house stood pablo holding a beautiful saddle horse fully equipped and ready for a rider the mexican's dark face shone with the pride and triumph of the moment toward which he had looked forward for months the horse too as if sensing the importance of the occasion pawed the earth with his dainty hoofs arched his neck and tossed his head proudly impatient uttering low exclamations and little cries of delight the girl left the porch and ran forward greeting pablo and moving about the horse admiring the animal from every point of view what a beauty he is perfect pablo perfect where did you find him is he yours what's his name her questions came tumbling from her lips in such eager bursts that pablo answered only the last he is your senorita his name is el capitan mine barbara turned to her father who explained abe having told him the night before of the purchase when her father finished the delighted girl announced that she simply couldn't wait but must go for a ride immediately running into the house she returned a few minutes later in her riding dress and mounting with i'll be back for dinner daddy and adios pablo rode away toward the open country while the mexican and the banker watched her out of sight by the time they had passed the last of the tent houses in the town barbara and el capitan were friends there is no doubt whatever that a worthy horse appreciates a worthy rider and the girl accustomed to riding since childhood certainly appreciated her mount oh you beauty she cried leaning forward in the saddle to pat the shining neck oh you beauty as though to return the compliment and express his pleasure at finding such an agreeable companion el capitan turned his delicate pointed ears forward arched his neck and stepping as on a velvet carpet sprang lightly to the other side of the road in sheer overflow of good spirits and confidence in his rider while the girl at his play laughed aloud but barbara had eyes and thoughts for more than her horse that morning it was her first day in her desert and there was much for her to see through her father she had kept in close touch with every phase of the work of reclaiming the king's basin and had often begged him to take her with him into the new country now at last her wish was realized she was where she could see with her own eyes the seer's dream the seer's and her own coming true on either hand as she rode stretching away until all fixed lines and objects were lost in the shifting mirage and many-colored lights of the desert the dun plain with its thin growth of thirsty vegetation was broken by the green cultivated fields newly leveled acres buildings and stacks of the ranches with canals ditches and ponds filled with water that reflected the colors of the morning everywhere in what had been a land of death life was stirring in one field beside the road a herd of soft-eyed cattle knee-deep in rich alfalfa lifted their heads to greet her in another a band of horses and colts scammered along with her as far as their fence would permit as if good-naturedly seeking her further acquaintance everywhere men were their teams were at work in the fields newly won from the desert at one house a woman was hanging her weekly wash on the line while a group of children played in the yard as the girl passed the woman waved her hand and the children shouted a greeting and a little farther on a meadow lark perched on a fence post filled the world with liquid music the wine-like atmosphere the glorious light 
the odor of the fields and the strength and beauty of the life newborn in the desert, with the spirit and freedom of the animals she rode, all appealed with almost painful intensity to the girl who was herself so richly alive. She felt her close kinship with it all, and answered to it all out of the fullness of her own young woman's strength. She wanted to cry aloud with the joy and gladness of the victory over barrenness and desolation. It was her desert that was yielding itself to the strong ones. For them it had waited, waited through the ages, and at last they had come. Busy with her thoughts, Barbara rode on until she had passed out of the settled district of which Kingston was the center and found herself in the desert. Save for the lightly marked trail she was following and the thin line of her father's telephone poles that led southward to Frontera, she saw no sign of a human being. Checking her horse and turning, she looked back. A tiny spot of thin color, the red of brick, the yellow of new lumber, and the white of tents marked Kingston. The ranches about the desert town were scattered spots of green, scarcely seen at that distance. All the rest, from the distant snow-capped sentinels of the pass in the north of Lone Mountain in the south, and from the purple mountain wall on the west to the skyline of the mesa on the east, was the same dun plain as she had always known it. Barbara caught her breath. Seen near at hand, the work accomplished had seemed so great, so brave. Seen from even so short a distance as she had come, it looked so pitifully small, so helpless. The desert was so huge, so masterful, so dominating in its silent grandeur, in its awful loneliness. All her life, Barbara had seen the desert from her home in Rubio City. Many, many times she had ridden into it and back a day's ride. But never had she felt the dreadful spirit of the land as she felt it now, alone in the still lonely heart of it. She was afraid with an unreasoning fear. El Capitan, too, seemed to share her uneasiness. Tossing his head, tugging at the bridle reins and pawing the ground and starting nervously, he turned this way and that, signifying his desire to be away. But just as Barbara, on the point of yielding to his impatience and her own feeling of fear, lifted the reins to turn toward Kingston again, he threw up his head with a loud neigh, and with ears pointed, looked away toward the south, standing rigid and motionless as a horse of stone. A cloud of dust rising from the trail told her that someone was approaching. Instantly the girl's feeling of fear vanished. She laughed aloud. "'Company is coming, Capitan,' she said. "'Shall we wait until we see who it is? We can easily run away if we don't like his looks.' As she finished speaking, the light wind that was just strong enough to carry the dust with the evening coming rider shifted for a moment and revealed the horseman clearly. Barbara, not wishing to appear as though waiting, started ahead toward Kingston, while the stranger, evidently catching sight of a horse and rider on the road ahead and desiring company, quickened his pace. Barbara glanced over her shoulder. Shall we run, Capitan? No, we'll not run yet, buddy, but be ready. Again she glanced quickly back. It's no one we know, Capitan. Be ready. Nearer and nearer came the stranger. When she heard the sound of his horse's feet on the sand, Barbara turned again, this time openly. Then she laughed. I don't think we'll run this time, Capitan. A moment later, the horseman had overtaken her. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. How do you do? Miss Worth. Had the engineer checked his horse so suddenly a few months before, he would undoubtedly have gone over the animal's head. El Capitan also stopped while the man and the girl sat looking at each other, Barbara smiling at the man's surprise. Is it really you? 
asked Holmes at last. Or is it some new trick of this confounded desert? He rubbed his eyes. I never saw a mirage like this before, and I don't think the heat has affected my brain. He moved his horse closer. Could you shake hands? Barbara held out her hand. I assure you that I am very substantial, she laughed, and I'm here to stay, too. That's great. By George, it's good to see you, cried Holmes so heartily that the girl turned away her face and caused her horse to move ahead. The engineer's horse, with a word from his rider, kept his place by El Capitan's side. It's very nice of you to say that, but I didn't see you anywhere around last night when the stage arrived. Abe and Pat and Texas were there, and this morning even Pablo came the first thing after breakfast. Willard Holmes could not altogether hide his pleasure at her hinted rebuke. So she had thought of him, had looked for him, had missed him. Indeed, you must forgive me. I did not know you were coming he said and explained how his work took him away from kingston much of the time of course under those circumstances i must forgive you agreed barbara then added seriously i think i could forgive anyone who belonged to this desert work anything except one and that he was watching her face what is it you could not forgive she returned his look steadily don't you know he drew a little back, and she wondered at something in his voice and manner as he answered. Yes, I know. You could never forgive me for being untrue to his work, for putting anything before the work itself. Yes, she returned. That is it. I could never forgive one who did that. But how would you know? How could you judge? he asked almost roughly. Perhaps the very one whom you would call fault to the work would, in reality, be doing the best thing for the work. I've noticed that, after all, those who have the loftiest ideals and the highest visions of man's duty to man and all that are seldom the ones who accomplish much of the actual work of the world. Look here, honestly now. How many of the people who are reclaiming this desert, I mean all of us, laborers, businessmen, ranchers, Everybody who's coming here to do this work, how many of them do you think see a single thing beyond the dollars they've hoped to make on the venture? Whether it's the high wage paid by the company, the big profits of the businessman, or the heavier crop of the rancher, it amounts to the same. And yet you would insist that they must not be governed by this desire for gain. So far as I can see, it is the same desire for gain that has driven men into doing every really great thing that's ever been done. Look carefully into every great enterprise that is of value to the world, and you'll find at the beginning of it someone reaching for a dollar or its equivalent. Your father, for instance. Barbara threw out her hand, protesting. Please don't, Mr. Holmes. I know that what you say is every bit true. Father and I have gone over it so many times. And yet I know, I know that what I feel is true also. Oh dear, what a muddle it is, isn't it? It seems so wrong to spend one's life working for nothing but money. And yet all the really good work in the world is done by those who don't work to do good at all, but for what they can get out of it. I suppose now that you stayed in the desert all this past summer and worked so hard without any vacation at all, just for your salary? How did you know I took no vacation? Father told me. You seem to have made quite an impression on my father. He's told me a great deal about you. But I want to know, did you stay in the desert for money? Holmes wondered if she knew the danger that threatened the settlers because of the unsubstantial character of the company's structures. Perhaps, he said, it was to save my professional reputation. That would amount to the same thing, wouldn't it? Barbara laughed. I don't think that your taking a vacation would have lost you your reputation. That won't do, Mr. Chief Engineer. For some reason, Barbara seemed highly pleased at the turn the conversation had taken. 
The man thought of those anxious days and nights at the intake, when the safety of the success of the whole King's Basin project hung on the whim of an uncertain river. But he did not explain it to Barbara, nor did he tell her that a vacation would have made no difference in his salary. "'I'll tell you why you stayed with the work in the desert this summer, Mr. Holmes,' she said, and in her voice was a note of pleased triumph. "'Why?' he asked. "'Because you're learning the language of the country.' For an instant he was puzzled. Then he remembered the evening he had said good-bye. "'See, si, senorita, I suppose one could not help learning a little in La Palma de la Mano de Dios, could he?' "'Not if he had ancestors,' came the answer. Holmes flushed. "'What a snob I must have seemed to you that day,' he said in deep disgust at the recollection of his first attempt to impress the western girl with the importance of his place in life. "'I don't think snob is just the word,' she answered. "'I didn't mind that ancestor business and all that one bit. "'In fact, I think I rather enjoyed it. "'You were such a tenderfoot, "'but there was something else I did mind. "'Did you know that there was a time "'when I hated you with my whole heart? "'Miss Worth, it's so. "'I even promised myself "'that I would never speak to you again. "'Never. "'Then I came after a while "'to understand how foolish it was "'of me to blame you.' and father told me so much of your work here this summer that I became heartily ashamed of myself. I'm telling you now because, you see, I've come here to stay and to be, in a way, a tiny little part of this great work you're doing, and I feel that I ought to tell you so that we can start square again. But, Miss Worth, what in the world are you talking about? I know it was foolish of me, for you were not at all to blame. But I couldn't help it. It is all over, though, and we're square now, and will be when you have said that you forgive me. But I don't know what you mean. What on earth did I do? She looked straight at him. Can't you even guess? I haven't the ghost of an idea. Well, I'm glad you haven't, she declared, even if it does make me appear so foolish. It was because the seer was discharged and you were put in his place. But I... Oh, I know all about it, she interrupted. You didn't do it. You were not to blame. The company did it because it was good business. I told you it was all over now. But please, I don't think we'd better talk about it, only just for you to say that you forgive me. I had to tell you for that, you see... Then the once carefully proper Willard Holmes did a thing that would have astonished his most intimate Eastern friends beyond expression. Reining his horse close to El Capitan, he held out his hand to Barbara. Shake, pard. You're the squarest girl I ever knew. It was no flimsy two-fingered ceremony, but a whole-hearted, whole-handed grip that made the man's blood move more quickly. Unconsciously, as he felt the warm strength in the touch of the girl's hand, he leaned toward her with quick eagerness. And Barbara, who was looking straight into his face with the open frankness of one man to another, started and drew back a little, turning her head aside. For some distance they rode in silence. Then she began questioning him about his life in the desert, and all the rest of the way home made him talk of the work so dear to her heart. As he talked and the girl watched his strong bronzed face and listened to his words, she found something in his voice and manner that was not there that day when she introduced him to her desert. There was a self-reliance, an enthusiasm, a purpose that was good to hear. At the door of her new home, when he, pleading his work, would not stay for lunch but promised to call in the evening, she bade him adios in the soft tongue of the Southland, and when he had wheeled his horse and was riding away, Barbara turned on the porch to look after him. Watching the khaki-clad figure that was so easily at home in the saddle, and that, with the loping horse, seemed so much a part of the country, 
the girl wondered at the change that was being wrought by the wild land upon this man from the eastern city indeed she thought he is learning the language of the desert and she too was glad when Holmes arrived at the company headquarters, the general manager shifted his cigar to the corner of his mouth and cocked his head to one side, looking him over critically. "'Buenos dias, senor,' cried the engineer gaily, throwing his sombrero, quirt and gloves on the floor and helping himself from the box of cigars on the desk. Holmes was still thinking in the language of barbarous land. Humph grunted the slender man at the desk i said hello to you when you passed the office also i bowed my best new york bow but you were too engaged to see were you practicing your greaser lingo on her i suppose she talks it like a native she talks a language you would not understand my friend said holmes coolly lighting a cigar probably not agreed the other who am I that I should understand the words of a being of such exalted rank? The whole fool town is crazy over her already. I've heard nothing but Miss Worth, Miss Worth, all morning. You would think the hotel was a ladies' sewing circle. Every man on the street is wearing his Sunday clothes and walks with his head twisted over his shoulder for fear he will miss a glimpse of her. Horace P. Blanton is the man of the hour. He came in with her last night and is arranging a public reception, talking like the business manager of a Greek goddess. And now here you go, riding down the street with her, so interested you can't even see me. Permit me to congratulate you. You certainly have lost no time. Holmes scowled. That fellow Blanton is an officious ass, he growled. And you, he checked himself. Go on, go on cried the delighted Burke. Don't spare me. In the name of the goddess, might. The engineer laughed in spite of himself, though he spoke sharply. Cut it out, Burke. I met Miss Worth in Rubio City when I landed afresh from New York. She's a mighty charming girl, whom you'll be as glad as anybody to know. She was riding over in the West District this morning, and I overtook her on my way in. Of course, we came on together. Have you heard from Uncle Jim? The manager dropped his bantering tone instantly and, taking an open letter from his desk, scanned it thoughtfully as he answered. He'll be here Saturday. He's not at all pleased home with my report on the Worth operations. Our friend Jeff's getting altogether too strong a grip on things. It beats all the way he hops into a game and draws all the high cards before you know he's on the other side of the table. The thoughtful manager of the King's Basin and Irrigation Company was evidently worried. Holmes made no reply. With his eyes still on the letter in his hand, Burke asked, How are you getting on with the survey of the South Central District? Black finished yesterday. I brought in the data. What do you think of it? It's no good, Burke. The land is a rough jumble of small hummocks covered with a heavy growth of greasewood and mesquite, and practically all of it lies so high that we could never get the water on it at all. Burke considered. Do you know whether Abe Lee ever went over that district? Holmes stiffened. No, he never worked in that part of the basin at all. But what the deuce has Lee to do with it? Black is a graduate engineer and as good a man as ever looked over a transit. If you can't trust the men I send out, why... Wow, wow, cried Burke. Keep your shirt on, old man. I'm not making insinuations against your pet surveyor. I merely ask for information. Now, if you please, turn your South Central data over to your office force and tell them to get it in shape by Saturday without fail. It's an order, my son. Sila. End of chapter 15